Uh, we're going to call to order the regular meeting of the Fairfax Town Council at 6.30. We just had a special meeting to conduct some interviews. Um, so we're going to do a roll call vote once again, Michelle. Um, yes, Mayor. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Present. Council Member Blash. Here. Uh, Council Member Hellman. I'm here. And for the record, Council Member Hellman is appearing on Zoom under the, uh, if the town attorney could help me explain that. The just cause exemption um, under the new Brown Act rules for illness. Thank you. And Mayor Cutrano. Present. Thank you. Okay, all present. Uh, now we will go to the Pledge of Allegiance, if everyone can rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next is approval of the agenda. Um, and I, I would like to request that we continue a couple items. I'd like to request that we continue, um, I think it's item 12 and item 14. Item 12 is the um, discussion of the offer of a land donation. Item 14 is the ordinance regarding SB9. I'll, I'll make a motion to continue item 12, the land donation and item 14, the ordinance for SB9 to the April meeting. Excellent. Um, and to approve the the rest of the agenda. And yeah. to approve the rest of the agenda. I, I I had something I wanted to recommend. Okay. I wanted I wanted to review um, number three and number nine together. So bump number three. Oh, I see. From from consent, we can we can get to that when we get to the consent calendar. If you want, we want to pull that from consent and. Put that. Before. Sorry, is that not the appropriate time to be asking for that? Um, no, not not really. But okay, sorry. But it's all good because now we know. So that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we have a motion. Second. Um, a second. Okay. Motion Kohler, second Blash to approve the agenda and continue items 12 and 14 to the April regular meeting. Fifth. Yeah. April 5th, yes. April 5th, regular Thank meeting. You. Okay, and can I get a roll call vote on that? Yes, Council Member Ackerman. Uh, oh. Sorry, yeah, yes. that was an I. Uh, Council Member, uh, Vice Mayor Kohler. Aye. Council Member Blash. Aye. Council Member Hellman. Yes. Mayor Cutrano. Yes. Eyes all motion passes. Excellent, Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item number one here, which is a presentation of a proclamation to David Waltering, uh, our outgoing interim planning and building services director. Oh, sorry. I missed a whole section of the land acknowledgement and all the other stuff. Um, apologies. So, um, Councilmember Ackerman, can you read the land acknowledgement for us this evening? Yes, I will. Um, Fairfax Town Council acknowledges that we're located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors past, present and emerging. Thank you. And I will read the meeting protocol. The mayor shall maintain order at the meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff or members of the public and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. Please turn off all cellular devices or place them into silent mode. Uh, the town council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any meeting not started by 11.30 will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless council votes to suspend that rule. And now we will um, head into the presentations here. Um, so item number one, the proclamation. Heather, do you wanna say anything before we? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, so David Waltering has been our interim and um, done a fantastic job as the interim director of planning and building services. And his last day was yesterday. Um, he is a retiree. And so um, uh, we have very strict um, limits on the amount of time we can have a retiree here. So we really appreciate and thank him for his service. and. Um, Appreciate you taking the time to do this proclamation. Absolutely. Um, and I have the proclamation here, and I believe we have David with us. David, good evening. Um, good so evening, just... Mr. Mayor and Council. It's nice to be here. Yes, and hopefully you can you can join us for future meetings at your convenience for your own enjoyment and entertainment uh, now that you'll be leaving us as a staff member. Um, I would love to do that. That would be quite enjoyable. I'm sure I'll do that. Excellent. We'll take you up on that. Uh, okay, so we, we have a proclamation for you, uh, Mr. Woltering. Uh, this is the Town of Fairfax Proclamation for David Woltering, Interim Planning and Building Services Director. Whereas David Woltring has ably served as the Interim Planning and Building Services Director for the Town of Fairfax since June 2022, and whereas David has more than 35 years of professional planning experience, including serving as Interim Planning Director in the Town of Ross and Director of Planning and Community Development in Windsor, Clayton, and San Bruno, where he formally ret retired in 2018, and whereas David has a master's degree in public administration from California State University, San Francisco, and has completed postgraduate work in city and regional planning. And whereas upon his arrival in Fairfax, he began working on long-term planning projects, such as a housing element, parklets, short-term rentals, rent stabilization, and just cause eviction. And whereas David managed the daily operations of the planning department to complete current planning projects with Applum, and whereas David employed his thoughtful and calm manner in organizing community and staff meetings alike, often considering the comfort of others by bringing treats and decorations, and whereas in his short tenure in Fairfax, David made significant progress on each of the projects he worked on, and whereas David dedicated much more time to Fairfax projects than he initially anticipated, in addition to his personal goal of writing and presenting at least one academic paper on planning each year at an international conference, and whereas despite his short tenure, David demonstrated his commitment to and support for the Town of Fairfax Department of Planning and Building Services and its projects. Now, therefore, be it hereby proclaimed, that an acknowledgement of his many contributions during his short tenure in Fairfax, the town of Fairfax wishes David Woltering success in all of his future endeavors, and be it further proclaimed that the Department of Planning and Building Services is better due to David's dedication and hard work, ergo the town council of the town of Fairfax is grateful and indebted to Mr. David Woltering and sincerely thanks him for his service to our lovely town. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. And if you were here, we would happily hand this to you, but we'll <laughs> surely mail you a, a prettier version of this printout. So thank you again for joining us and for all of your incredible contributions to our town in this, this serious moment of need um, for so many long-term planning projects. Uh, it's so greatly appreciated from all of us. Uh, you're very welcome, and uh, it was my pleasure, really, to to serve you and and the community, to serve the council and the community. And I would say that I was fortunate. I was fortunate in that as I came to to Fairfax, I received a, a really really strong welcome and support from your town manager and your staff. And you've got an incredibly dedicated, committed capable staff. And as I worked with them, um, they really um, helped me help them. And so um, as I worked there for the seven or eight months I was there, um, I, I found that I, I made some very good friends in the community and among staff members. And, and for me, it was a bit like an extended family uh, there with the staff. So 
I want to say thank you uh, to the council and the town manager for the opportunity to serve Fairfax and, and get to know the staff and, and make some good friends. And also to, to learn a little bit about Fairfax, um, a spirited community, a community that has a beautiful setting, a sense of place, a sense of community, and a wonderful scale. So uh, it was a very fortunate experience for me as well. And thank you. I appreciate it very much. Would any of my colleagues on the dais want to make any comments? Yes. I just want to personally thank you, David. You really brought a lot of calm to what was a, a pretty hectic place. And I think I learned a lot from you in your short tenure, and we really appreciate your service. The other thing I want to remind you as a CalPERS retiree myself, that that 960 hour starts again in July. <laughs> so we would love to have you back if we aren't able to fill that position by then. But I feel you've really become a member of our family here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other council remarks? Well, I would, I would second that and just thank you very much. Your, um, your calm and your organized approach to a large to large daunting projects has really helped us to helped us all uh, to to uh, focus and get uh, moved down the road on them. So thank you very much. That's very valuable. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and you will be missed. And thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Councilmember Hellman. Thank you very much. And if there are no other comments from council, we can open it up to public comment on this item. Michael McIntosh. I've had the pleasure of meeting with David two times, spoke to him a few times. And as his discussion tonight, He's always been an extremely gracious individual, one who's been willing to look at things. I think calm that I heard on the council is a very accurate word for calming things down, especially during this hectic and deficient time. I think that behind the scenes, there's also many discussions, and I hope the council can really think about some of those comments he's, I'm certain, shared with all of you to help this town get past the housing element and other issues that stand before it. I think he sets a great example of not just giving you a plan and a plan that should be executed, but he also sets an example of how we can all treat other people and be a better person. And so I, for one, would like to attest to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or anyone on Zoom? Uh, there are no raised hands on Zoom. Okay, uh, we'll take it back to council. Um, thank you, David, again, and uh, we'll we'll see you later. Thank you. And we'll move uh, right along here. Um, and I would ask uh, Mr. Yura if you could touch the turn off the mic there, or Mr. McIntosh. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move along to. Item number two, which is a presentation from PG&E regarding smart meter implementation. I believe we have Mark Van Gorder, uh, who's the PG&E government affairs uh, individual from the North Bay on Zoom. Can you raise your hand on Zoom, Mark? And then we can make you a panelist so you can formally present. Okay, I see video and can you let me know if you have audio? We have audio and video. Yeah. Thank you for joining, us, you for Mark. joining us, Mark. Absolutely, thank you for having us. Uh, so as you mentioned, my name is, is Mark Van Gorder. I wanna thank you, Mayor, uh, uh, Council Members, Vice Mayor Kohler, Manager Abrams for uh, allowing us an opportunity <clears throat> to talk tonight about the smart meters. I'm joined tonight by Austin Sharp, um, 
And uh, Austin, do you want to introduce yourself in your role? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Austin Sharp. I am the senior manager for PG&E's customer care organization uh, that works in the North Bay and Sonoma areas. So that incorporates Fairfax. So tonight we are going to be talking primarily about um, uh, some letters that Fairfax residents will be receiving and so the main point of our, of our uh, presentation tonight is to make sure people are aware uh, in, the, in the coming weeks ahead, there will be a couple of letters that are sent out. And I'll go through this. I have a presentation. I'm going to start screen sharing in a second. Um, it'll give the timeline of when these communications will come out. But more importantly, uh, we really are hoping that um, uh, residents will take an opportunity to read those letters. Sometimes it, you, know, you get a letter, it says pg e or something. And and you may think it's just junk mail, but uh, we hope people will take the time to look at these letters and specifically about the opt out options. Um, and we can get more into that in just a second. And then of course, we're gonna allow, uh, uh, we're, we're gonna move through this pretty quickly because I know the council wants to allow uh, time for, for some questions or comments. So I'm gonna start sharing the screen. I'm hoping this works. I've had some challenges with this before on Zoom, but. If you can let me know, uh, you can see this screen okay? We can see it okay. Okay, I'm trying to move it into slideshow presentation so that it, it fits, but uh, it doesn't look like it's cooperating. We, this may be, this, all right, how's that looking? A little better? Now it, now it looks like it's in presentation mode. Okay, well, let's, let's and you can still hear me all right. Yes. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned, th this is with regard to ins the installation of smart meters, talking about the timelines of the installation, but more importantly, and the reason that Austin and I are both here tonight is to talk about customer communications, the timeline of those, answer some frequently asked questions, and um, uh, uh, main point is that 30 days prior to the work, uh, customers should be receiving their first uh, notification. <clears throat> there will be a follow-up um, letter 15 days uh, prior to the work. So two letters should arrive in the mail. Uh, 48 hours before the meters are installed, customers will receive a phone call, um, a voice message. And then the installation is scheduled to, to begin approximately April 3rd and completed uh, April 21st. The communications that customers will receive will look a little bit like this. I know this is hard to see. Uh, I tried to fit a copy of the whole letter uh, here, but at the end of the day, it was probably too much language to read anyway. So the, the gist of it is we talk again about um, the dates and the times that we're expecting to install the smart meters, um, some of the benefits of the smart meters, and, and again, more importantly, and what we're here to stress is the opt out option, knowing that there are some customers who do not want uh, to have a smart meter and that there is a path to, uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. And there's a way to do that by phone number, uh, which, is, which is here in this presentation. Uh, the presentation is also uh, posted on the city's website along with the staff report. Um, and this information will be shared in the letters as well. Um, so some of the some of the frequently asked questions, folks. What I just covered the the installations will begin April third through approximately uh, the twenty second. The work will be Monday through Saturday uh, weekly. Um, customers can opt out. Uh, you know, here, here there's a link and there's a a phone number here. <clears throat> I don't know if the city has or will post the this information on the website, but again, I mentioned that this is. This is in the staff report. Um, and then some of the questions that were asked is, you know, how, how do we, um, you know, how do we know that somebody coming to the door really is with pg &E? They will have badges, they will have cards, they will have information. Um, they, you know, if, if customers make a phone call to our, to the care center, they are uh, in state, they're local. It's, it's not another state or another country. Um, so, you know, customers should be able to quickly get information they need. I dialed the phone number just as a test. 
got very quickly through to somebody who who was able to to help out um, you know with questions that I asked about the installation and the opt out options. So with that, I'm just gonna go straight into let's just stop sharing. Um, you know, questions, comments the council may have, and uh, you know, we're here to we're here to help answer those questions. Excellent. Thank you both for being here. Um, I see some questions, so I'll just go quickly over to Vice Mayor Kohler. Um, hello, Mark. Hello, Austin. Um, what is the cost for the opt out? Um, I don't believe you covered that. Yeah, I can take that. Sure. Mark. So there's a oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a couple different tiers for this. So um, the base level, just regular uh, customer, it's seventy five dollars for an initial setup fee, then it's ten dollars a month for thirty six months. Uh, the costs are put in place so that we can have two different, essentially, billing and metering systems. Uh, one legacy where we have a meter tech come out and read the meter. It has a legacy billing system and then one that is a smart meter billing system. Um, if you're on CARE or FARA, which are our low income programs, that knocks down the cost substantially. It'd be a $10 setup and then a $5 a month charge for 36 months. Uh, and that would complete the smart meter opt out process. Just one follow up question. Um... So Austin, your mic is a little strange, so it's a little hard to understand. Oh, okay. um, did you, so the $10 a month for 36 months after that, no, they don't have to pay anymore, correct? That's, that's correct. So $10 a month, um, and I'll speak a little slower if my microphone's cutting out, $75 initial setup, $10 a month for 36 months. If you're on our care programs or FARA, which are low income, it's $10 a month, uh, sorry, $10 to set up and then $5 a month for 36 months. Thank you very much. All right, so that's um, like, I don't know, $435 total to opt out at the regular level and about 190 for low income over like three years and then it stops, right? Correct. Okay. Do we have any other questions from council members? Um, Councilmember Blash, no. Um, yeah, I just noticed that I was looking at the letters, and I know that you know we have uh, different constituencies in town who have some concerns about this. Um, it says that there are penalties for not complying, and I'm just curious if you could explain what the penalties are to the town for not complying. I'm, I'll take a shot at that. If I if I recall, that is a comment that came from the California Public Utilities Commission. That's not a. Um, that's not a. Um, PG penalty. Yeah, we we don't have any penalties associated with not complying. There's really two options, and the, you know the PUC um, put together the opt out for the concerns that individuals like the residents in Fairfax, Sebastopol, other places had about the meter. Really, for whatever reason, whether it was billing, whether it was you know the um, the communication device privacy. That's what the opt out is for. It's really kind of those two options. So if you would like to have the meter and the benefits of the meter, um, you know, being able to chart your energy usage, especially as we're electrifying more, um, outage history, all that sort of stuff. Great, You're, you can have the meter. If you have any of these concerns, then that is where the opt out was put together by the PUC uh, back several years ago. And I want to add that we invited CP or our, our town manager invited CPUC uh, representative to participate, and they declined the offer. And and I just have, do you have any questions, Councilmember Ackerman? Um, the if if I'm not mistaken, or ju it just if you can confirm, in order to have any time of day rate plan through PG&E or MCE. Uh, the you do need to have a digital meter. Is that that's correct? Well, yeah, you're kind of uh, talking about two different things. A smart meter is a digital meter. That is the uh, communication device that's within it. Um, that doesn't necessarily apply to a purely digital meter. So a time of use meter does not have to be a smart meter. A smart meter does not have to be a time of use meter. Really, the smart meter is the communication device that uses the mesh network to talk to PG&E remotely. You can have a TOU meter, and we have for years, that have digital components in it, but have no communication device. So if a customer wants to opt out, but still have a time of use rate, there are different options. Um, some of them do require a landline. Some of them do require some other sort of 
non-radio frequency communication device. So there might be some limited options, but it does not have to be a smart meter. Okay, thank you. And um, my question is more in line of like the timeline of things. So there's the first two letters and then there's a phone call to folks. Say folks can't get access to the meter for some reason or something like that. Like what, if there's no contact that's made or if there's no um, access to the meter, what what is the next like line in the decision tree? Is there another call at another point in time? Is there another letter that comes to folks saying, hey, we're going to come back out? Or do you guys just circle back around to those households at a, a later point in time? So what we're doing right now is we're obviously sending the two letters, then we're sending the IVR. And what we want is for people to contact us to either affirmatively opt out, which we will then remove you from the rollout. So we'll take you aside. We'll put you into the opt out. You'll go through the billing process for that. And you will not get a truck rollout to your house. Everyone else, you would receive a truck rollout to your house. If we cannot access the meter um, for whatever reason, someone comes out and says, hey, you know, please don't do that. There's a sign up. There's you know um, a locked gate. We are making an assumption at that point with our communications that um, you would like to opt out. And so we will opt that customer out. And as Mark mentioned in the presentation, the opt out can go either way. If even if you get a meter installed, you can call and have the opt out done and we will come out and you know disable or remove the meter, put you on the opt out. If you get opted out and you're like, hey, I want the meter, you just contact us, we will come out. It's a very simple process through the website. There's a QR code on the letter as well to get to the website, or you can call <laughs> the 800 number uh, that we mentioned on there as well and have someone come out and basically um, give you the service that you would have wanted. So. We're doing one truck roll. We're making the assumption that these communications will get to folks who either want the meter or don't want it. And then uh, we will kind of work with that on the back end. And folks, if they are opted out, we'll receive a postcard that says you, you opted out a smart meter. And that's kind of the other opportunity for someone to go, oh, hey, wait, no, I, I didn't want that necessarily. So in other scenarios, we've had you know people call and say, hey, I'm gonna be on vacation. I really want the meter, but I'm locking everything up. Can you come two weeks from now? Yeah, we can accommodate that. Great. So, so at any point in time, whether someone opts out now, they could get a, a, a digital meter, smart meter in the future or vice versa. You could Correct. get it. And then at a later point you can opt out. Okay. That's good to know. And then, um, this is sort of a, a very like localized question for Marin, but since y'all are the North Bay folks, you might know this. I know, um, our water utility, Marin Water, had recently done a rollout for smart meters for water meters as well. Is this like a similar technology or are these are these things similar they're just ways to remotely read this the consumption or the usage is that right I, you know i don't know what marin uh, water district used yeah. exactly i know there's a couple different technologies for water meters so some the, the most famous ones i've heard of is you have like a, a meter tech a water meter tech drive down the street and it it pings the meters um ours works on a mesh network so what we have are collection points on various poles kind of spread out throughout communities uh, and the meters themselves will actually talk to that data point or they will use other meters as that mesh network to find the quickest route to that collection point that then collates the data and sends it to pg e So typically it's a little different, but I have to say, I don't know exactly what Marin utilized for their technology. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Council member Hellman, if you're, um, on Zoom, do you have any questions before we open public comment on this? No questions, thank you. Okay, great, yeah, and we'll take it to the public here. Um, everyone, feel free to line up um, if you'd like to speak on this item, uh, be two minutes on this item, and then we'll go to Zoom as well. So first speaker. Th thank you, Mayor uh, and council members. Frank Ager, Meta Way. It was just 12 years ago that we went through this with PG&E. And for those who may not have been around in those days, 12 years ago, uh, Fairfax challenged state agencies. We challenged them both in Sacramento and actually in court too. Fairfax has always marched to its own drummer. 12 years ago, a number of us, when we challenged smart meters, we kept pg d out of Fairfax. We had to opt out. We paid our fees. We paid our monthly fees. Uh, 
We had no, we had signs in front of our properties, no smart meters here. It was a huge battle. Fairfax prevailed. Now the pg and is back. Um, well, I don't, I'm not sure what's changed between 2010 and 2023, but uh, obviously there's there's no you know uh, historical knowledge here what what goes on in Fairfax. Um, if in fact PG&E thinks they want to have smart meters in Fairfax, then they ought to have a smart a smart meter opt in program for Fairfax, not a opt out program. If, if you know if if there's 20, 30, 40, 50 people who want to who want a smart meter, let them opt in and get a smart meter. Many of us still do not want smart meters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. It, it was already on, so you could just turn it back. Red, Thank you. Red light. Yeah. Hi, um, Diana Purdue, Fairfax. Um, I'm wondering why the moratorium on smart meters is ending and who decided that it should. It's known that radio frequency radiation is a carcinogen and smart meters give off RF radiation. There's been no data that shows RF radiation is safe. It is possible that smart meters could increase a cancer risk, and why should we take this risk? Adding to this significant health concern, there's the cost associated with rolling out this smart meter project. Worldwide, smart meters have failed to deliver the benefits promised. These include cost, energy savings, better service, and data. Some have to re be replaced every five years, some have been returned to being dumb meters due to the nature that this project is totally unnecessary and potentially harmful. There should be an opt out that doesn't fine or charge the analog customer. <clears throat> I would hope that you would reinstate the moratorium. Fairfax would be better served by using this money or PG&E using the money for Fairfax that they've slated for these smart meters into putting the PG and E lines underground. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Todd Greenberg, resident of Fairfax, representing the common sense faction here in Fairfax. I have a couple of questions and then I'm gonna ask you for time because I'm representing a number of people. And this is sort of a surprise thing that I don't think many of us got notice about. But this is for uh, the pg e representatives. How is it that you prepared documents for us and didn't notify us of the costs involved? How is it that you would give us a mailing with 30 days notice when I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the mail is pretty lousy here in Fairfax. We probably won't get it until there's 20 days and we might be gone. How is it that you have seemingly decided to go against the ordinances that exist that people fought for here in Fairfax? This seems like a travesty of justice. This seems like our town council should uphold the longstanding ordinances that people of Fairfax fought for. I agree with our former seven time mayor, Frank Ager, and the prior speaker, that this should be an opt in if it's allowed at all. Thank you. And now I'm going to read this letter. And I ask that this be forwarded to the town's attorney. Dear Fairfax Town Council members, town manager, and town clerk, please forward this to the town's attorney. At tonight's 3-1-2023 Fairfax Town Council meeting, pg &E's representative Mark Van Gorder is giving what looks to be a fait accompli type presentation of pg &E's plan to install smart meters in Fairfax. That's item number two that we're on right now. Is this truly a fait accompli? Has this already been decided before those affected hear about it, leaving them with no option but to accept it? The agenda packet contains years old 2010 and 2017 letters from the CPUC. 
Are there no recent letters from the town or the town's attorney stating the town's opposition to the installation of smart meters? If not, why not? If there are, why haven't they been included in the public agenda package? There is well-documented public objection to PG&E's planned smart meters installation in Fairfax and existing local ordinances prohibiting the installation of smart meters in Fairfax. This is a reasonable request that PG&E's planned smart meter installation in Fairfax be made a future town council agenda item. And until there is clear public consensus approving of the planned PG&E smart meters installations, I'd like to ask for time for more people, please. No, we're we're not doing. We sent this to the council already, so um, we're not doing time for more people. But if you could um, please conclude, thank you. There are more people that we need to get to. Certainly. Uh, have you all read it? Yeah, you sent it this afternoon. Would you make it publicly available? Is it publicly available out front? It, it's publicly available. In... Yes, it is in the public communications packet on the in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Thank you, Michael McIntosh. Um, sadly, I'm not that prepared to speak on one part of what I'd like to say this evening. And the one part is, I don't believe that pg &E actually has the authority to implement this if the town wants to stand up to them. And I cite um, West Virginia versus EPA. And in that ruling, I believe, and again, I didn't look at this right before I came here, so it's been, what, six months or something, but I believe what it said, was those bodies that we put in place that are not elected, do not have the authority if challenged to implement their rules, laws, penalties, and fines, such as the EPA. So the C, let's see, CPUC, I also do not think they really have the legal authority to overturn a voter's initiative. So as long as we have that in place, the only thing that would overturn that voter's initiative is a state law not an appointed unelected body. That is one subject. The subject that I did come to speak to tonight is I would certainly like pg &E's input on the UUT, the user's utility tax that Fairfax last year budgeted $375,000 for, collected $385,000 for, passed a law or excuse me, a rule regulation that if a stakeholder is unaware of being overcharged and do not ask within 15 days of the closing fiscal year, that they lose that opportunity. State law is very clear that there's a cap of $360 per UUT on an account. When I've reached out to PG&E, PG e has been very clear that Fairfax demands that they are paid on a monthly basis and where some communities will cap that $360 Fairfax has not. So over five years where I should have been charged myself $1,800, I was charged over $10,000. And when I keep coming down here and explaining when you especially take my check in advance and cash it to offset that $360 cap, that is a penal code violation because it's theft. So I would like to have pg &E address that, if they would, on what those caps are so the town of Fairfax could be better informed how to implement and put forth the law as opposed to robbing their citizens of additional user's utility tax. And that's why we had a collection of last year in your budget of $385,000. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mark Bell, Fairfax. Former council member, Mayor Larry Bragman, when PGE came up here and, and tried to get this through the last time, stated that he had major concerns about uh, privacy issues from smart meters. Have those been addressed? I haven't heard of any breakthroughs in security of smart meters and what they do with their information. My objection at the time is that PG&E could send a truck down the street and just send out a little blip. And the next thing you know, there's an extra five or $10 on your electrical bill. As a famous person once said, if you wanna steal $50 million, steal $5 from 10 million people. What's to prevent that from happening? I had to call PGE 
uh, yesterday to find out what my usage was last year because it says zero on my bill. Why is that? I thought you guys are like supposed to be communicating. What kind of communication is that? Where I have to call and go through a queue and then I have to call the CPUC and then they have to contact PGE to have a manager or a supervisor call me back and then I have to call her back you know, to get simple information that should be there. Is this to hide the fact that your rates are jacked up while our usage kind of stays the same? And as Diana said, how much is it going to cost to put smart meters in Fairfax? Along with your commercials that you're running, that's millions of tens of millions of dollars that you could be using to underground utilities instead of hiring butcher tree companies to whack trees that have nothing to do with what's going on with the power lines or leaving the ones that are really entangled alone because it takes them too much time. So this community fought against smart meters. There are a lot of people here who have uh, electromagnetic or radio frequency uh, caused illnesses. They're not here because they didn't know about this. They didn't see it. They didn't hear about it. There's no change. So if you want to put in, so you if you opt out and you pay your whatever, well, if five of your neighbors have it, you're still being bathed in the same radio frequency. You still have the same negative health impacts as if it was on your own house. So I don't see how that at all is a solution. The people in this town very vociferously spoke several times over the years against smart meters. And I'm really surprised that the town council doesn't even know that. Thank you. Um, if there are any other speakers on Zoom, could you raise your hand at this time? Hi, there are some raised hands on Zoom. The first one is a phone number ending in 902 followed by Richard Applebaum. And the caller is unmuted now. Good evening, um, my name is Nina Beatty. I've investigated and educated on smart meters since 2009 and filed comments at the CPUC. My website smartmeterharm.org has my reports to public officials and reports of other experts, including testimony by the industry itself on smart meter problems, which are many. Do not allow your ordinance to lapse. You have police powers under state law to protect the public and the environment for, from adverse impacts of utility operations, impacts to their health, convenience, and safety. You are prohibited, and the California Supreme Court says you are forbidden from surrendering those police powers in T-Mobile versus San Francisco, they said. That authority includes Public Utilities Code 2902 to 2906, Section 7613D and the California Constitution Article 12, which limits CPUC authority. You protected this community from life-threatening health impacts like health problems and seizures, which were widely experienced by people. You protected disabled people, those disabled by electromagnetic sensitivity and other EMF-sensitive health conditions under ADA and the Fair Housing Act so they could stay in their homes and had access to this community. You protected the environment. You protected people from the overbilling and the interference with electronics like security systems. You protected this town from the fire and electrical hazards of, heart, of smart meters. This is a high fire danger zone. Smart meters aren't grounded and have inadequate surge protection. They mal malfunction when over voltage or surge surges hit from lightning, trees falling on lines, or people hitting utility lines. They can allow surges and over voltage to flow into buildings which can burn wiring, destroy appliances and electronics. They can interfere with arc and ground fault circuit interrupters and meters have exploded and caused fires. They likely contributed to the severity of other fires including Northern California fires. And some of these fires have resulted in the deaths of people and their pets. You stood up to the bullying by the CPUC when it wanted to unlawfully take your authority which would have exposed you to lawsuits SB 17, which was the smart grid bill, stipulated that they could not roll out the smart grid if it interfered, if it compromised customer safety. You know what PG&E does, how it has destroyed people's lives over and over again. 
the ABC 10 Sacramento series, Firepower Money is investigating more. And it has done this with smart meters, driving people out of their homes and mocking them as crazy. An opt-out doesn't protect people. And the meters are everywhere. Please maintain your ordinance. This is your power under the CPC, um, uh, under the laws grounded by, by state law. And an ordinary person such as myself can easily see this. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. The next speaker is Richard Applebaum, followed by Deborah Benson. Richard, you're unmuted now. Thank you. <laughs> um, Richard Applebaum, 61 Woodland Road. Um, I share uh, the concerns of pretty much all my neighbors and prior speakers, um, um, particularly around <laughs> privacy and health concerns for sure. And I find it um, not surprising knowing PG&E's history, but um, absolutely outrageous that we would have to pay any amount of money um, for not adding a service and not adding equipment. Essentially, what they're saying is if you're going to inconvenience us, um, um, citizen, then you know, you're going to pay a penalty and a tax to us so that um, we can discourage you from opting out. And if it's part of PG&E's agenda to hire less workers so they don't have to have the folks come out and do that, and they want to have us kind of offset the cost of continuing to have people that have been coming out for decades already, that's also outrageous. So that's that's my take on PG&E. But what I have to say to the council is um, I, I'm not as well informed. I wasn't here 13 years ago, and um, the prior speakers seem to know a lot about the laws and, and, and various things that have happened. Frank spoke about uh, initiatives and such. If there is anything within your authority as the council that can stop this, um, resist this, um, extend something that's already in place that has been protecting us, then I implore you with um, you know uh, all my uh, uh, intensity to please uh, continue things as they are or protect, fight back or protect us in any way that you can. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by um, a caller ending in 632. Uh, oh, no, sorry, followed by Liz Froneberger, then the caller. Deborah, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, new microphone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, oh, so I was I was involved those many years ago when Fairfax came up against PG&E and um, avoided smart meters and our ordinance was written. Sebastopol was a, another town. We were successful. The people don't want smart meters. If a person does want a smart meter, let them call. You know, I just tried to call tonight the number that uh, was on Mark Van Gorder's presentation to opt out again of a smart meter. And eerily, um, I was asked to give my numbers of my street address and the person who answered the phone knew not only my street address, my phone number, my business phone number, and that I had opted out. So a lot of information there, speaking of privacy, as we, you know, as it is now. Um, uh, the, the person told me I was already opted out. No need to opt out again. That was it. I was opted out. I paid my dues. And um, so uh, pg &E needs to get their act together here on what they're doing. Um, we need to stop pg &E from coming in and strong arming us in, in, in this uh, instance where we didn't when they came in and cut 900 trees, pretty much massacred our, our forest. Um, without paying attention to nests or nearby, you know, uh, owls or whatever. So, so I need you and to, to step up to the plate here and make sure our ordinance is followed. Our tree ordinance wasn't, but this one really needs to be followed and um, not enough people know about this. I would say if this is going to happen, it needs to be an opt in instead of an opt out because we have our ordinance ordinance behind us. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say, but stand strong and, and don't let this happen. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Liz Froneberger, uh, followed by telephone caller ending in 632. Liz, you're unmuted now. Hi, um, thank you. Um, so I just, I wanna reiterate what the, what the prior callers have uh, mentioned. 
and add to that that pg e has done a pretty piss poor job of um, creating any kind of trust or communication uh, with this community. I, I, I myself personally stopped a tree company a few months ago from chopping down one of my friends, one of my neighbors, beautiful trees in the front yard that was actually nowhere near, <laughs> near a, a, a cable that needed to, you know, needed to have that kind of protection. So that's number one. Number two, I, I also was living here when we went through all of this smart meter protest uh, more than a dozen years ago, I think actually, but, and I see no reason to give in to them now. Uh, again, pg e has not proven themselves to us. And in fact, every time I turn around, there is just one more reason for me to not trust pg e So gentlemen, you might be fine, but you are working for a pretty bad organization. Um, I had never heard of smartmeterharm.com, um, but I really appreciated her comments. Um, it's concerning to hear that there might be uh, meters exploding, et cetera. So I'm hoping that the town council can think about all of this, not, not approve this for our town. I'm not quite sure you know, what the issue is here. Furthermore, I don't, I'm not gonna pay $75 and then $10 a month to opt out of a program because you're now going to PG me, you are now going to save money from people walking around reading my meter. I mean, what kind of thing is that? That's that's ludicrous on the face of it. Anyway, that's all I need to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is. Um, oh, their hand went down. Okay, the next speaker is Kathy Flores. You are unmuted now. Okay, now do you hear me? Yes. Great. So I just, as like everyone is speaking, like to reiterate what everyone has said, and I agree with everything that they have said. And said. Um, when it happened 13 years ago, we opted out for the smart meter. Um, and I don't know how many years went by, you know, three, four. I mean, I went out there and I checked and there was a smart meter there. Don't know when PG&E ever did that. At that time, I then I had a call at PG&E. We had to pay $75 and we are paying $10 a month. And that wasn't our fault. PG&E came through and put one in without our permission because I told them not to. So we are paying the $10 and we did pay the $75. So, you know, now we have a, a, the meter that we want and I'd like to keep it that way. This is, and like to the town council, I just hope that you could hear what everyone's saying and um, fight against this, I guess. All right, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. I see no further hands raised. Okay, then we will close public comment and take it back to council. Um, are there any further questions from anyone? I just had one one question for folks. Um, and thanks again for joining us this evening and hearing from the community. Um, one of the prior um, public comments was related to um, the fact that they, a number of them, people had already opted out previously. And it sounds like there must be a system that's already in place that acknowledges that certain residents already do want to opt out. And maybe there had already been prior attempts to even put smart meters in or something like that. It's unclear from, from the comment, but um, do we already have smart meters that have been installed in our community? And um, do... Uh, the folks that have previously opt out, opted out, th they don't have to call in again or just trying to understand what, yeah. how that system works on the back end. <clears throat> yeah, and, and so obviously there was a lot of stuff there on the historicals um, of Smart Meter over time. And, and I'll just say, I was also here with pg e 13 years ago um, at the council meetings, talking to customers, uh, you know, and at the time when Smart Meter was originally rolled out um, through pg e and the Public Utilities Commission, uh, there was no opt out. It, which is not unusual of a, a change in technology for a utility. When you change a meter technology or some other service, um, it goes through those rules and tariffs of the PUC. So the community was listened to with several other communities by the PUC and putting together the opt-out. And over the last, so I wanna say it was within a year and a half of uh, 2010. So let, let's say around 2011 or 12, the opt-out was put in place. 
people could at that point start affirmatively opting out. Um, there were obviously communities uh, like Fairfax, Sebastopol, other places that attempted to continue to uh, work with the PUC and PG&E and, and say as an overarching statement, you know, we, we don't want smart meter within this community and we want to work with them as, as much as possible. Um, really, the option, again, is that opt out. So kind of having that background as it applies to customers now. There are a couple hundred within Fairfax. There was a couple hundred within Sebastopol that had gone through the opt-out process. Um, most have declined to do that up to this point. Uh, many of the comments uh, noted here around, you know, questions on rates and, and why would the opt-out be applicable? Why wouldn't there be an opt-in? Um, a lot of those things are things we've been trying to work through with customers and communities over the past several years uh, and making sure people are clear on how, you know, utility operates, how the tariffs are written by the PUC and how they have to be enforced. And so we are working through those with other communities. Fairfax is, is the one we're working with now. And, and to have it be understood that it is an opt-out process. If you've already opted out, you do not need to opt out again. If you've already paid the fees, you will not be charged again. If you get a letter, if you have any questions, you can obviously call in and confirm that. But really, if you've already opted out, you should not even be on the roll to get a letter and you should not be communicated with, you would already be, already be counted as a customer who has made that choice of either having the meter or doing the opt-out. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, oh, Councilmember Hellman, please. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, do you have a, an idea of how many smart meters have been installed per the request of residents in our community? Yeah, we have we have approximately uh, just a little over 1,100 in the town of Fairfax. And those were proactive requests made? But That I don't know, Council Member Hellman. We could try and find out though, it that may dip into, you know, customer privacy, whether they, you know, requested them or didn't request is likely something we cannot share. Well, I guess if they didn't request them, I mean, PG&E is not installing them without communicating or authorization though, right? So, so not I ask that people in the audience go outside if you want to talk because we need to hear what's being I'm said. not asking for uh, personal information on who. I'm, what I'm asking is how might it have been installed if it wasn't by a resident asking sure. And so I just making a distinction there, it's not necessarily authorization, um, kind of what I alluded to before, um, you know, the utility is responsible for the everything from the meter out, the resident is responsible for everything from the panel in. So pg and &E is responsible for the metering and the metering technology. So you would have a mix, and this has happened over the years of people who maybe they didn't call in and say they wanted a smart meter. You would also have, as we go through, um, you know, we look at our metering some of them have been in place since 1971. We go and we see, hey, they're not operating like they should anymore due to wear and tear. We would switch that out with a smart meter. We would let the person know, but we would switch it out with a smart meter. Again, if they chose to opt out, we would come back, remove the meter, you know, go through the opt out. So it's always kind of a mix. The other part is, um, and, and I think this is something, you know, we didn't make clear up front, um, business customers do not have an opt out. It is only for residential customers. So if you had a business that, had a meter that needed to be replaced, there is no choice of whether or not to opt out. It would have to be replaced with a smart meter. So you typically get a mix of those things, which is why you'll see kind of, you know, overall Fairfax, you have around 5,800, 6,000 meters. You'll have a couple hundred to a thousand, maybe over the last 10 years that have uh, been transitioned to smart meter for various reasons. Okay. So the 1,100 includes um, commercial. Yeah, it may include some commercial, some ones that we had to switch out when a meter was had reached the end of its lifespan, you know, things like that. The other thing um, I would note too, as people have talked about this as well, you know, is again, th th these meters aren't any different than the meters that would currently be installed as quote unquote, an analog meter. It's just the communication device. So we have a couple hundred to a thousand meters that have been transitioned to smart meter. You might see other digital meters around that doesn't necessarily mean that the smart meter. So um, various ways that we go and we do our meter upgrades and checks over the course of, of years kind of yield those changes in numbers. Okay, thank you. And just wanted to um, refer back to uh, Vice Mayor Kohler 
referenced that um, the CPUC was invited and declined the opportunity. And I wanted to ask our uh, city attorney, Janet, um, could you just, I'm looking at the staff report. It says the letter states that the CPUC, not the town, has regulatory authority over PG, PG&E. Um, and then we already talked about the penalties, but could you just confirm that the town of Fairfax does not have the authority to uh, stop this, if you will? Um, you know, this issue is one that, um, because of the potential for litigation, is one that should be discussed in a closed session, not in an open session. And so I would respectfully decline to comment on that tonight. Okay, thank you, um, Janet. And uh, does that conclude your questioning? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Hellman. Okay, um, well, this is just an informational item uh, this evening. And so uh, that concludes this item this evening. Thank you um, both for joining us and uh, appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for allowing us to share this with you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, uh, we will move on here to um, brief announcements. Um, just a call to join a town committee. We had some interviews earlier this evening at a special meeting for various town committees, but we still have vacancies on the Planning Commission, the Affordable Housing Committee, the Volunteer Board, the Climate Action Committee, Parks and Rec Commission. And now we have officially, um, we have no openings on the Open Space Committee any, anymore. That's clearly popular. Uh, and the town is also seeking a representative to the Marin Commission on Aging. So you can see the town website for details on that. Um, and now we'll move on to open time for public expression. That's a 30 minute window here before we get to our regular items. And this is a time to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. All comments are limited to three minutes. Uh, and note that there's no extra time for groups. Uh, the council is not permitted to take action uh, and state law strictly limits the right of the council to discuss any unagendized item. Um, and if there are still raised hands after 30 minutes, we can continue open time at the end of the agenda. Uh, but for now, we'll open, uh, open time for public expression. For folks interested, you can line up um, behind this gentleman here and uh, you're welcome to begin, sir. Um, I represent 450 plus people that have signed up with their email at fairfaxresidence.org. The workshop you have proposed has many significant unanswered questions and nowhere, Mr. Mayor, in your letter to rescue Fairfax housing, do you reference rent stabilization? You mentioned just cause numerous times, but again, no mention of rent stabilization. Did you omit that because you don't plan to have an open discussion about it? The most important question regarding the workshop is, what's your purpose for holding the workshop? That's not been answered. Can you please tell us what your goal is? The council is not smarter than the citizens. We've read the ordinances and we understand them as well as you do. If the workshop is geared toward council explaining, clarifying or amending, as you mentioned in your letter, then it's a waste of everybody's time. I support the workshop model, but this should have been done before you passed the ordinances. Doing it now is ass backwards and doomed to fail. Unfortunately, former Mayor Hellman and the previous council didn't take this simple step, and now you're asking citizens to accept the ordinances as they stand. It seems from where I'm standing, like your goal is to stall, dodge responsibility, and hope that minor ch changes will suffice. The problem is there's no appetite for any of that. FairfaxResidents.org conducted a survey asking folks a number of questions regarding rent control. 
we got 308 answers in less, excuse me, responses in less than five days when we close the survey. Our survey may not be perfect, but it's better than what you have because you never did a survey. So you had no data to support your decision to pass the ordinances. Instead, it appears you relied heavily on the DSA in lieu of doing the necessary work to understand what the citizens wanted and would accept. This is not your kingdom. You're supposed to listen and represent all of Fairfax. Many of us in the community rely on rental income to live our lives. None of you up there are affected by the ordinances, except Mayor Catrano, who can stay in his place till he dies if he chooses that. Each one of you on the dais tonight has the power to add rent control to the agenda. There's absolutely nothing pre preventing that. There is no shame in a reboot. And there is no good reason why you should deny the citizens the, the right to vote this up or down. I urge you to change course, show leadership, and allow the people to vote. We do not need a workshop. We need leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Please, if you all can refrain from clapping, we've received comments that it can be um, creating an intimidating space if people are reacting to public comment. We want everybody to feel welcome here. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, good evening, Town Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'll make this brief. I am a working senior renter here in Fairfax. I am a member of UFCW Local 5, of the California Alliance of Retired Americans, of the DSA, and the North Bay Labor Council, who all, including myself, have supported both rent stabilization and just cause eviction protection ordinances. I want to thank you for scheduling the March 25th workshop. My hope is we, the Fairfax community, will have a respectful meeting of the minds on that day. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Erica Milligan. I'm also a resident of Fairfax. Um, I just also want to say thank you. I think you did the right thing by passing Just Cause and rent stabilization ordinances for the community of Fairfax. Um, I personally have been kind of scared away in the last couple of months because of the aggression of some of the, the discussions. Um, and so I really do urge when, when we have this workshop that it be a safe place for everyone to come and share. Um, I know you did listen to a lot of people for eight months, a lot of residents of Fairfax sharing what was important to them. And so thank you for that. And thank you for um, creating an environment where we can all speak. Um, I also just wanna encourage people to check out the, the Town of Fairfax website. Um, there's some great information there about the ordinances, some really good FAQs. Um, you know, you can still evict someone if they don't pay your rent. Um, I'm hearing a lot of confusion, a lot of concern from, from people in the community. Um, and so check out the Town of Fairfax, Fairfax website um, and, and learn more and thank you. Thank you. Please refrain from speaking in the audience. Um, thank you. Next speaker. Hello, Town Council, Michael McIntosh. I would like to not really pick on something that's on the agenda this evening, but to point out priorities. I think it's 13 talking about foodware. And although that's a very important subject at some place and some time, to imagine to give that priority over a failed housing element where you failed for eight years to implement it, to give that priority over not addressing the rent control and just cause where you have torn up the community, to give that priority over a sunset clause where we will have no fire marshal from the county of Marin, no fire chief, and different financial suggestions have been made to you that you haven't allocated the time to publicly discuss so we can have a town but we're gonna discuss different items that don't have the priority to be there tonight. I think if the town council really did their job and illustrated leadership, they'd say, hey, clean the deck. We've got to take care of that housing element. Hey, clean the deck. 
we better have a fire department and some sort of understanding how that's going to run. Hey, clean the deck. We have torn our community apart. We have not done a good job. We did not reach out to people. We need to resolve this just cause and rent control. The workshop that you guys are putting forward, that's exactly what it is. It's another narrative you're putting this forward. You didn't give anybody an opportunity to say, hey, we would like it. So it's orientated. So everybody gets to speak and everybody's opinion is heard. You're just saying this is what we're doing. And that's how the whole ordinance failed in the first place. As of Monday, you've been served an initiative that we're petitioning the town clerk to review and make sure it's not deficient so we can actually put that to the vote. How much money will that be spent when that comes to the voters as it properly should have been? So again, as I said at the last meeting, I really see failure. I see, I'm sorry, incompetence of making proper decisions that I think you're all capable of if you're not worried about what somebody else thinks of your actions. I really think that even if that is your intent, if you look at the community around you that voted you in place, they're your constituents, and I wish you would listen to them, not from people outside from Berkeley, but from your citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mark Bell, Fairfax. On the same line, you know, some of the things that people should consider is you're having people from the Berkeley Rent Board who are not an impartial board. You can go and see their zealots in favor of renters. Why would you do that instead of having a committee of Fairfax residents with common sense? Most of these issues are simply common sense. I mean, what you're allowing is that if someone is a convicted pedophile and they and you have them move off your property and then you find out they're a pedophile and you put your property back on the market within five years, you have to rent a, that pedophile again. They could be a murderer. They could be part of the Aryan Brotherhood. They could have spent four and a half years in Pelican Bay in solitary confinement. And because you've had to hire a private detective so that you don't get fined triple damages, you have to see if you can find this person again. I mean, like I said before, is something, does something need to be done? Yeah, but a small fraction of what you've passed. And if you're just gonna have a workshop that you think you're gonna convince people that you're right and they're wrong, it's not gonna happen. You really need to go back to the drawing board, invite the landlords, invite the DSA for, for an opposing view, and then come out with something that's equitable and fair for everyone. We all know people who've been, uh, who've been, you know, rent gouged so that they move out, but it's a very small uh, percentage. It's like one or two percent of what's out there. And if you're not going to take that into account at this meeting on what is it, the twenty fifth, twenty fourth? I don't even know. I was like, how how is this getting publicized? By the way, um, what's it really going to solve? It's not going to solve anything. And that's the issue. You didn't reach out to the community. And that's your job. That's why you're there. You're not to represent 10% of the people. You're supposed to be representing 100% and trying to come up with a solution that everyone can live with. They may not like it all, but at least they can go along with it. And that's not happening. I don't see it. And I don't see you doing it. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, good evening, council and staff. Uh, Rick Hamer, Fairfax downtown. Uh, it came to my attention that the Ross Valley Sanitary District has plans to enlarge several sewer remains, including those near Spruce and Spruce Road this year. This will mean disruptive excavations along the route. This disruption may even occur twice as the district is reviewing the possibility of adding San Geronimo Valley to its network. On the purview of the council is a solution for the residents of Spruce Road and Fairfax Lumber. 
The residents would like a wooden fence, but the fence would have to be directly underneath a high voltage power distribution line. So the fire department prefers fireproof material. This year would be an ideal time to extend underground utilities beyond Park School along Spruce. We know that there is a need to incrementally update our power distribution utility grid and, and infrastructure, and the streets are going to be dug up for other reasons. So why not take care of the Spruce Road residents' aesthetic and environmental concerns at the same time? And by the way, uh, I support modifying the rental pr protection ordinances, and I strongly disagree with repealing them to be even considered at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, everyone. And thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Candace, and I live here in Fairfax, and I grew up here. Uh, since this began, or at least fell under my knowledge of what was happening in November, I had a lot of people coming to ask me questions, questions that I don't always have the answer to, questions that I've been trying to find the answers to, questions that we've sent to our council to ask the answers to. Sometimes we get a response, and some of it's data-driven, and sometimes it's lip service and not real answers, and I understand the legalities. But something that's been happening a lot more recently for me, our local Fairfaxians coming up to me in their mid forties. And these are people that grew up in this town, whether they own or rent, either way, they are not happy with what's going on here. And I would describe the outcry and upset at these ordinances as the champagne cork going off at a really bad party. And what I mean by that is by not involving all of your constituents, your property taxpayers, everyone to the table with regards to this in a more inclusive way. People feel deceived and they feel lied to by the people they should trust the most as their town council representing them, voted by them in their positions. And you guys have to understand that I care about this town a lot and I know you do too but we have to find a better way to come together with this. Now these ordinances, like I said, champagne cork. Now everybody's looking at every single thing you guys are doing or have not done. That includes money mismanagement and a lot of expenditures. That includes our infrastructure at serious lows. And let's throw town morale at some of the lowest and divisive qualities that it's ever been. So I'm imploring all of you, I will support you in this workshop and I will come with my heart open, my head open, but please recognize you're scheduling a workshop for March 25th, if I understand. The DSA is holding their own workshop here in Fairfax on the 23rd from what I understand. So perhaps we'll have a Fairfax citizens workshop the 21st, just to make sure we're all equally understanding what's going on here. And that information is flowing freely with all groups. I would invite the DSA. We've not been invited to theirs. And again, thank you, all of you for doing what you're doing. Our new town works guy, like, listen, you're walking into a lot of fun and we appreciate you, okay? And you're gonna, you're gonna earn it. And we do appreciate you. To our new town managers, official positions, thank you. Anyway, guys, I just ask you really consider this and prepare well, all of you, because the people that really care about this town are here and they're listening on Zoom here, walking around town, talking to people about this every day. So just please. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, town council, everyone. Um, I'm Lynette Shaw. And uh, since I ran for town council, I've been hearing a lot of feedback from everybody continually. And also as a landlord that's been here for a very long time, I've owned my house for a very long time. I'm extremely surprised and very put off but that no landlords were consulted before you passed an ordinance that gravely impacts all of us, impacts the value of my property, impacts my decision whether I should rent out any rooms or not, because I have two rooms that I could rent out, but I cannot now because of the 
onerous and overreaching ordinances that you have thrown at us, basically, when there's perfectly good state laws that protect rental control. You know, and there's there's perfectly good state laws that have an eviction process that is more fair than what you have agreed to without talking to anybody who actually is affected like myself. I have a very old house and um, I'm a single woman. And um, I think that I really would like to have some rental income now, you know, <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid that as many other landlords are now afraid to rent. And that is not the purpose of this exercise. You were supposed to be helping us figure this out and not just shoving a bunch of rules on top of us and saying, you have to obey this because you don't have any rights as a landlord and someone who's invested every penny into your property for years and years and years. And now I don't have control over if someone wants to rent, I want to rent to someone and they want to sublet to someone else that can come in. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Where is my, where is my, are my rights? Where are my rights? I have put years and a lot of money to this funky old house that's big and has plenty of room, but it's not available for any renters now. And that's not what I know you intended to do, but that's what happened. And you've also have riled up the citizens. And um, I actually have to thank you for doing this because now everybody's politically engaged. Everybody's upset, everybody's organizing, and you've taken the complacency out of, complacency out of the town of Fairfax and placed it on front and center. So you, there's gonna be a lot of action going on. And I hope that you can wisely navigate through this. And I believe the first thing to do would be to rescind the ordinances and start all over because it's really made a lot of people very unhappy, including myself. Thank you. Thank you. And next speaker. Hi there, Todd Greenberg, resident of Fairfax. I wanna hold up my paper collection for you here. Weighs a little bit. It's about a third to a half of what was on the agenda tonight. I felt the folder outside and it, these are double printed, double side printed pages. The folder wasn't full. It, fold, folder is about the same size. So I'm not sure that everything's there as is required. I just ask you if it is, but now I'll continue on. I want to second, uh, well, first off, I want to ask that consent item number six on the agenda, which is a resolution on the, uh, sorry, on the consent calendar be pulled and made available at a future date at a town council meeting as an agendaized item, because it says that it affects the town finances significantly. So this should be talked about. It should not be on the consent calendar as a sneak in item. Please pull item number six. I'll be brief on the rest of this. I'm going to second the earlier speaker asking you to prioritize what gets done in this town. There are public safety items that are not getting taken care of, but you seem to be willing to spend meager town funds on all kinds of other pursuits. I wanna protest the continuing lack of transparency in these packed agendas where people don't have enough time to become knowledgeable about what you're actually doing and council members don't even seemingly by their statements understand what they've done or voted on. I wanna protest the lack of proper notice that seems to continually happen here. I wanna to object to all ordinances that have not been given first readings and time for people to understand whether it be council members or the public. There's at least two items on tonight's agenda where you're trying to waive the first reading and just put them into effect. And guess what? One of them compounds these poorly considered rent ordinances that have so divided the town. No waving of the first reading. Tell us what you're doing and involve us. Let us help you, please. I want you to stop. I want you to stop, think, observe, and plan. And we would appreciate 
if when we write to you, you, you write back. Most of the town council members, many of people have said that they don't write back. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Lucy. I'm living in Fairfax four years ago. I'm working in good health. Thank you for patient right control. Thank you. This is for thank you for patient right control. It helped me and my family a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Good evening, Council. My name is Joe McGarry. I'm a renter here in Fairfax. I'm also a member of the Marine DSA. Um, good evening. I want to thank you for standing with the low income working class of Fairfax and providing them with real housing stability by adopting the renters protections and ordinances. I ask that you stay the course and continue the process of implementation. If we can stop assuming the worst of each other and move forward, seeing everyone's capacity to be good, I think the ordinances as are will create a stable, secure, and fair rental market where both groups have the ability to reasonably thrive. The ordinances are simply addressing an undeniable trajectory with rental prices in Fairfax that have been displacing the working class for a decade and also bring some balance to a power dynamic that should never exist with something so critical as someone's basic human right of housing. If any parts of the ordinances create significant hardships for either group, there are mechanisms in the ordinances for those hardships to be considered and addressed if valid. Please stand by the ordinances as are and look towards implementation. Let's all trust that anecdotal bumps will be smoothed out as they arise down the road. Thank you. Thank you. There's another speaker, please. Thank you. Uh, Frank Ager again, Metal Way. Um, I never received my bill for my business license tax in Fairfax for 2023. Uh, is Fairfax sending the bills out this year or do, does anybody know? Yeah, yes, bills have been sent out. Well, we're in March. I haven't had a bill yet. Yeah, we'll check with Susan and find out what the status of your bill is. Is it just me or have we not no, said? We, we've received, we received 130 some odd payments in, in January and then an equal number in uh, February. So okay. well, I, I know, to, I know I a lot of people one. did receive it. So yeah. I'm not sure. I've had it for a number of years. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. We'll have staff look into it and a little bit of that's covered in a, a later item on the agenda. Um, when, okay. Yeah, please. Hey there, Town Council, Brad Biebenroth, Fairfax resident. Um, I, this may be item number 10 on your regular agenda. I, I'm, I apologize, I can't stick around. Uh, I'd ask that you guys would consider repaving Lower Scenic. It's in a serious state of disrepair. It's pretty darn beat up for a main <laughs> artery that feeds the hill. Thank you, yeah. Well, yeah. unfortunately, we do have to take, we'll take that item later. Um, and we would wanna save this for items not on the agenda, but point heard and thank Appreciate you for it. joining us this evening thank you yeah um can we check on zoom quick yes i see four hands raised on zoom okay um that's liz broneberger philip Pfeffer, deborah benson michael sexton and jody Timms. so liz you're first you're unmuted now hi thank you very much a um, couple of things uh, that I want to say, and then I'd like to respond just to a couple of things I heard earlier. Uh, one thing that I don't hear often mentioned, this is about the rent control and, and just cause eviction, is I'm very concerned about elders, and yes, I'm one, who are renting out JDUs, rooms, or ADUs. Uh, I am very concerned about how difficult it might be for someone to get someone out who is not a cool person <laughs> and in a timely fashion. I do not want to get stuck with someone who is not a good fit or who is making life incredibly difficult for me or to my family members within the four walls of my home. 
And I never hear a response to this. And the more I read these ordinances, the more concerned I get rather than less. Someone mentioned that there are mechanisms for getting someone out who doesn't pay rent. Honestly, that's the least of my concerns. I have, I, I'm a former emergency department nurse. My husband used to, my late husband did pro bono work for uh, elderly fiduciary abuse. I see all kinds of problems here for people who are older and who are having to rent out their rooms, et cetera, to someone who may not be a good fit or who may be a bad actor. To that point, the gentleman who just recently said about let's all assume the best in each other, I would love to do that. But my life and my professional life has seldom um, seldom shown that people act well. Now, I might be uh, I might be a little jaded, but I don't think we can just assume that everybody is going to act act well. But landlords too, um, you know, it's there. There are bad actors on both sides. So um, my housing, as a, as an elder at this point, is not terribly threatened. I can still get another job to make the you know to take the place of what I was hoping I could do to rent out my gorgeous little ADU that I just built. Um, but there are other people who are older than me and who can't work who are really going to be quite threatened at this and they don't want to rent to someone they don't know well or they can't get out well or, or quickly or someone who can sue them for treble damages because they've got a tenant lawyer, not they, but a tenant lawyer has gone out fishing, kind of like ambulance chasing and seeing how they can nail landlords. Tenants get free or low cost representation. Me, on the other hand, I get to pay $400 an hour for anything. My ADU downstairs, the, that person will be living with the access to my water heater, my HVAC, and a lot of other things. What they consider an emergency and what I consider an emergency, am I going to have to give them 24 hours notice? And can they sue me if I don't? If I think something is really critical and I need to scamper down there and get the problem fixed, there's just all kinds of problems with these with these ordinances that just weren't thought through. And I agree with many other statements that have been made before me about- Thank you, Liz. That's the your time. The possible futility of the workshop, but I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Philip Pfeffer, followed by Deborah Benson. And Philip, you're unmuted now. Hello, and thank you. This is uh, Philip Pfeffer speaking solely on my own behalf. Uh, given we're still hearing concerns about the ordinances, I wanted to highlight what the California Apartment Association, uh, one of the most prominent and active landlord organizations that's pouring resources to fight tenant protections across the state, is saying directly. Within the last month alone, the California Apartment Association has published one, a news item noting the rejection of uh, the association's request for an immediate appeal of an earlier ruling against the association in its challenge to Alameda's tenant protection uh, laws. Uh, they also published a different news item noting the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals has rejected the association supported challenge to New York's tenant protection laws, specifically finding such laws to be constitutional. Uh, notably, the lawyer for the California Apartment Association who has been uh, filing and losing these challenges in the suit against Alameda is the same lawyer who spoke for the first hour of the January 9th rent control info event. I know people are uh, rightfully and understandably concerned about lawsuits. And if anyone wants to learn more about speculated potential legal challenges to these ordinances, the court, uh, the California uh, District Court for the Northern District of California's November 22nd, 2022 ruling against that same uh, California Apartment Association lawyer who spoke um, that ruling addresses the issues point by point over 40 pages and includes great detail on how it's well established and settled that such ordinances are legal. The association also published an article titled Why Rental Property Owners in California Need Landlord Insurance, which I'd encourage all of the town's landlords to read to help them protect their investments. From the article, I quote, let's clear up a common misconception. Many rental property owners believe that homeowners insurance will cover their apartments and rental homes. That can be a costly and inaccurate assumption. Homeowners insurance, by definition, is designed to cover only owner-occupied residences, not homes or units occupied by a tenant, end quote. 
One of the most important coverages for rental property owners is coverage for wrongful eviction. This provides protection for you in the event a tenant named you in a lawsuit alleging improper eviction procedures were followed. Additionally, landlord insurance can provide protection against damage from and related to tenants, end quote. Um, that's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by Michael Sexton. And Deborah, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Deborah Benson, I live here in Fairfax. Um, these ordinances that everyone is talking about, especially the just cause, um, are an assault on uh, homeowners, uh, landlords, and on um, private property rights. And I do not think they would hold up in court. Um, this council has spent more time and uh, staff time and attorney's time dealing with creating these divisive ordinances than tending to the business they were elected to attend to of maintaining our town sidewalks, uh, upholding our ordinances. I'm wondering why so many of our town ordinances are being broken and uh, not not being tended to. Uh, the 17096.140 formula business ordinance needs some work. It's been known for a long time. That got thrown to the wayside. Uh, wondering why our ordinance 17.100.030 regarding alterations in uh, on commercial uh, buildings downtown, uh, is not being adhered to. Uh, wondering why uh, the uh, ordinance uh, uh, regarding uh, 1236020 uh, nighttime use of our parks, a misdemeanor, isn't being dealt with. And uh, 828.030, placing debris in creeks, is unlawful. It's a public nuisance. So uh, it seems to me that this council. Oh, and also shame on you, uh, council members who did not read that that uh, those rent ordinances and voted on them anyway. Shame on you. Um, why why our our basic needs, our sidewalks are at the worst state of any in Marin County. Why our basic town needs are not being tended to? It seems like you guys are doing your own little um, uh, ego driven. Um, projects, uh, trying to, with I'm sure good intent, trying to save the world uh, when you should be representing us and dealing with the basic needs and business of the town. So thank you for what you do, but I would say maybe change course here while you still have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Michael Sexton, followed by Jody Timms. Michael, you're unmuted now. Great, thank you very much. I'm Michael Sexton, one of the organizers of FairfaxResidents.org. I join with Philip uh, and a number of others in representing hundreds of Fairfax residents. We started the site FairfaxResidents.org to help communicate to the people not just the factual elements of the ordinances, but the negative consequences that will affect the town for decades. There, are, Yes, there are FAQs on the town's official website, but that site is so thin on the potential negative consequences for homeowners, for housing providers, and for renters. Your official site does a disservice to the people who will end up paying for the results of these ordinances, whether upfront through fees and penalties, or in later years being charged by their tenant a ransom for moving out. It also does not address the consequences of the increased initial rent that new or transitioning renters will face when they come into the area. This is a penalty on renters that is never addressed. In the upcoming months, I look forward to communicating to the public that California already has rent control passed in 2019 and that any excessive rent control imposed by this town is overreaching, unneeded, and quite destructive. I also look forward to helping the opposition bring a ballot initiative to the people of Fairfax to overturn these ordinances so that they get a vote, a vote that the town council did not allow. I look forward to working for the residents of Fairfax to help this town become more fair and more affordable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. The next speaker is Jody Timms, followed by Milan Moshet. Jody, you're unmuted now. All right. Good evening, Council and Community. Jody Timms, Cascade Drive, and I'm speaking as chair of the Climate Action Committee. We have been the, the committee has been trying to table at Good Earth. Uh, we have a number of really informative flyers on heat pumps, induction stoves, rebates, our climate action plans, switching your landscape equipment from gas to electric models, and the rebate program associated. However, we've been rained out. We weren't, weren't able to table in January or February, and now this Sunday, it doesn't look like we're going to be there either. So the good news is the rain, the bad news is we're not there. But I do want to encourage folks to go to the town's website to the climate and environment button where our climate action coordinator, Sean Ura, has been very busy updating the information there. There's a good bit of material on green buildings. So this is an important topic if you're a homeowner in Fairfax, and it's also of interest to renters. We are planning a, a number of events in the next few months. In mid-April, we're hoping to have a weekend event here at the Women's Club called Saving Money by Going Electric Part One. We're going to focus on heat pump water heaters and talk about the free assessment that you can get to swap out your gas with a electric um, heat pump water heater, which is the town's current pilot program. And we'll also be talking about induction stoves. In case you didn't know, there is one in the kitchen in the women's club if you haven't seen it. Part two of the event will focus uh, in May on heat pumps for space, water heat, space heating and cooling. So we also hope to be in the parade this year. And today, members of the Fairfax Climate Action Committee and the San Anselmo Climate Action Commission, we had a meeting with the nonprofit Ride and Drive Clean. We are hoping to put together an EV car and EV and e-bike show this summer, hopefully at Archie Williams High School. So stay tuned on that. And um, as was mentioned, we still have openings on our committee. If you're interested in climate action, please come to our next meeting on March 21st here in the Women's Club and uh, check out what we're up to. One fun fact I just wanted to mention in case you missed a recent article in the IJ, the Tiburon Angel Island Ferry will be converting from diesel to electric and will become the first short run electric ferry in the state of California. So this has been in the works for the last two years, and there is a state mandate that all new and existing ferries uh, switch to zero emissions by the end of 2025, or as soon as they can possibly thereafter. So anyway, I'm really looking forward to riding the electric ferry, and uh, I hope folks in the community come out and learn about what we're doing and how to make the transition to address the climate crisis by going electric. So thanks very much. Good evening. Thank you. The next speaker is Milan Mouchette, and you're unmuted now. You might have to unmute yourself. Oops. Thank you, Council, for allowing us all to speak tonight. Um, I'm having a difficult time figuring out why um, big organizations were bought, brought in to the committee to uh, to consider rent control and just cause. We're a little town, friendly little town, or at least we were. Um, and I don't quite know why people from out of the area were invited to help make this decision that should have applied to the town people, not people from large areas. Um, I encourage landlords to determine the percent of cost increases they had last year. And if they exceed 3%, I think they should consider immediately letting the council know that. Um, the, I, I, if, if the DSA is indeed having a private meeting, it would seem that should not be on any public property. And if it is, then everyone in the town should be invited as a public meeting. So I hope that's not the case. Um, and, um, there's a lot of negative effects from the rent control for the renters. And I know that people had spoken to the committee about that prior to the passage of the new ordinances, and it was not taken in too much consideration, though I think at the meeting, a lot of people talked about the cost of upkeep of properties, and that would not be able to be kept in the condition they've been in. In addition, I think it's extremely harmful to the city for the number of um, ADUs and junior ADUs that are now being withdrawn from the market. 
I hope this will all be considered at the workshop and you will um, scratch the entire thing and let the voters make that decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I see no further speakers, Mayor. Okay, we will close uh, open time for public expression and um, move on here. And I just wanted to clarify that there, is, there isn't a firm date. It, can you clarify that, um, Tom Andre Abrams, regarding the workshop? Yes, Mr. Mayor. So um, we are working, I'm working on locating a, new, a fair neutral um, facilitator who could help run that meeting and set up the um, framework that that would be. Um, and so I don't, I don't have that person yet on board. And so um, that date was floated, but I don't, I can't promise that yet because I don't, I don't have that person. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. Is it too late to ask about the order of the agenda? Just because I'm wondering if there's a lot of people here who wanted to speak on the pavement condition. And um, it seems like I've seen some people I thought maybe were waiting for that, but I, that might be too late to ask. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, it's not on consent, um, which is our next item, um, but it'll come shortly after that. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the consent calendar now. Um, consent calendar may uh, be approved uh, in its entirety with one action. Uh, in the alternative, items on the consent calendar may be removed by any council member or staff member for separate discussion and vote. Uh, the opportunity for public comment on consent items will occur prior to council's vote on the consent calendar. And we'll um, ask, I'll ask right now, I guess, I think, uh, Council Member Hellman, you wanted to pull one item from consent um, and sort of take that right after consent. Is that right? Yeah, I think that would be best. That's item three? Yeah, or we can just, um, I can just ask clarifying questions now, either way. Whatever you think is more expeditious given the, the time. I think it might be better to ask questions on consent now, um, in my opinion. Okay. But. Um, and and Michael, you saw my email and thank you for your responses. Um and Vice Mayor, you might be able to help with this. So that the line item on the revenue statement, the MW um, PA tax, do you know how many transfers, like what the schedule is? This is page one of five on the revenue statement. Do you know how many transfers are scheduled per year? Because we're already running over 115%. And I'm just curious what's driving that. Um, so um, I didn't quite understand you because I think you're a little sick. But did you <laughs> say how many transfers per year? Yeah. So they, they've already transferred the money that I understand. And the money's coming in higher. So I think it was, a. if I'm correct... And I recall this from the last meeting. It's it's a one time transfer, and um, as you know, property taxes have been running higher, and that's what it comes from. So it's a little. That's higher all my question one. was. Okay, so it's a one. It's one. It's once per fiscal year. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think the first year they did it separately because they weren't sure it was. You know, it was a little late. Yeah. But, but now we're kind of rolling. Right. Does that help? It does. Thank you. And I'm sorry I'm so um, stuffed up here. Um, moving on, same page, and this is relevant to Mr. Egger's statement. So I, I noticed that the business license revenue is significantly down. And um, Michael, I know you said that payments came in on January and February. Um, but it still looks like we might want to dig into that a little bit, given Mr. Egger's comment. Uh, business licenses uh, are for calendar year. For, so uh, people should have received bills. Um, we will check and see which ones uh, we haven't sent out and make sure that that's happening. But we received... Uh, uh, a big chunk in in January, and we also have received a big chunk in February. So, you know, January, February, March are typical times when the revenues are the highest. So, um, 
And this report doesn't reflect February, right? So no, this is only through January 31st. Right. Okay. So I'm just trying to, again, wonder why we're not closer to like the 58%, but. Um... I can just respond to one thing. Council member Hellman, I run a business. And so as soon as I get my bill, I pay immediately. Most people like that day. Um, and I did get my bill this year. Um, I, I think most people wait and pay their bills on a more, um, not an as need basis, which is what I do. They pay them all at once or they wait a couple weeks. So I don't think you would necessarily expect to see 58%, but maybe um, Michael can respond to that. Is that typical that we see more in February? Uh, last year, yes, uh, we saw our biggest revenues uh, the prior year in March. So people send in the revenues. We may, you know, Susan makes doesn't make a deposit every day. Uh, you know, so sometimes there's going to be a delay in, in the from the time that we receive the revenue to the time that it's actually deposited. Um, mail is no notoriously slow, as somebody happened to mention. So, you know, somebody could mail something on the January 31st, and it may take a little while uh, to get to the town. So uh, I'm not overly concerned about the fact that we're not at a certain point at this time. Uh, you know, business licenses is one of those revenues that you know you know a, a pretty well how many businesses are out there, and it's likely to be pretty much the same revenue. We haven't changed the rate at all. So. Uh, there are some businesses that have that have closed downtown. Uh, you know that that is of a minor concern to me. Uh, yeah. Although at the same time, some businesses that closed paid business license, and the new business coming in also paid a business license. So, you know, we see it go in both directions when that happens. Thank you. And um, moving on to page two, um, similar question. I don't know if anyone had opportunity to ask uh, Mr. Lockerbie about the housing inspection fee, but that seems um, to be trending pretty low given our point in time and just wonder if we have any insight there. Building and planning revenues are very difficult to project. Uh, you never know one year whether people are going to do a lot of remodels. You know, sometimes property values going up inspires people to sell their house. So they're going to do a lot more revamping and, and things that require permits. Uh, housing inspections relies on somebody coming up to the counter and, and saying, I want one. You know, right. I, I speculated that last year we may have had people who went in and got their housing inspections then in, in anticipation of, of higher prices to be able to put their properties on the market. And they're not doing it right now because we don't require it to happen every year. So it's really customer driven. Uh, our estimates at the beginning are, are uh, you know, uh, based on historical figures that we've gotten and uh, they don't necessarily dictate that we're gonna receive that same revenue the following year. Okay, thank you. Um, the only other comment I have is related to the sidewalk program, it doesn't seem like folks are really using it. So it might be a communication opportunity in the newsletter. Yeah, point point taken. Um, any other questions from other council members on this item or other items on consent? No, I just had one. Um, if you could briefly share, Michael, um, I think for folks that are interested in sort of looking through all the financials, I think one of the things that, you know, a general member of the public might ask questions about or wonder how it works with the transfer ins and transfer outs, you, you start to see some like large percentages moving from one fund to another fund. Um, and I think that's always a, a fascinating question for understanding how municipal budgets work, but could you share a little bit um, and explain how one might see or how we might see, you know, hundreds of percent change from one fund transfer in to transfer out or how that works? Transfers in and transfers out are something that we use as a sort of a budget thing to make sure that there's enough cash in a particular fund where expenses happen. 
Uh, it's not unusual that we collect money in, say, the gas tax fund, but spend it out of the general fund and or capital projects funds. So uh, rather than, you know, I, I've, I've used many different systems for doing these kind of transfers. Uh, what I found is the most effective is to wait until we know that the revenues have actually been received in particular funds before we go ahead and transfer them. Otherwise, sometimes you end up with a fund where you said we were going to transfer 100000 over to the general fund, and then that fund didn't get the revenues that it would expected, and then we have to transfer money back. So as a general rule, letting people know in advance that I'm going to do the transfers at the end of the year, end of the fiscal year, uh, that, that way I know that uh, the funds that have, uh, you know, that we decided that we were going to transfer monies to, actually we can do that. Um, there are other uh, transfers that uh, are reliant on, as an example, we have... Uh, 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 park money. Uh, Tam wants us to keep that park money in the uh, park, uh, Tam Park Fund until we spend it out of the Capital Projects Fund. So we know that we're going to be transferring it if that work gets done in the Capital Projects Fund. Uh, but in the meantime, we don't transfer the money over until the works actually uh, we match it over with the work so that that keeps certain other agencies like TAM happy uh, that that, uh, you know, that money just hasn't been transferred over to the capital projects and is sitting there unspent. So. Great. Thank you. And for folks, if they could be quieter in the audience um, when we're trying to get comments from staff and the public, that'd be appreciated. Um, I have no um, further comments, um, so we can, or questions, I should say, so we could take it to uh, opening public comment on this item. This is the consent calendar. Guess hi, everyone. Um, I'm not surprised that to hear about building inspections being down since if you want to do a small remodel that's 201 square feet or above, you're looking at an additional fifty to $80,000 in cost uh, to do that. And I'm sure that there are people who decided against building ADUs and JADUs uh, with these uh, rent and uh, just cause ordinances. Um, but the real reason I'm up here is uh, I think uh, number six needs to be pulled. And uh, like uh, Todd had said earlier for public discussion, uh, government accountability. I think a lot of people in this town would be really interested to hear about accountability. I mean, we paid so far, what, 1.2, over $1.2 million for consultants for the housing element. Is that like the most ever? How about like, you know, with a population of 80,000 people? I mean, we must be like, you know, pretty much the equivalent of like 150,000 or 200,000 person small town. Uh, fees, hiring Berkeley Rent Control Board, what? How many tens of thousands for that? How many tens of thousands for the absurd, illegal, striping, restriping, unstriping of Cascade? $85,000 from what I could tell, from what I received from public records. I mean, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars going to consultants. You had you had a consultant for the Cascade Striving Project admit that it was totally illegal and you did nothing about it. The whole entire project was illegal. Never should have happened. I don't know, $85,000 later, it's back to how it was. How many years? Two, two and a half years? I mean, we need accountability because I ain't seen it. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm just looking at this like uh, you know, hundred twenty, hundred forty thousand dollars for this employee because we have it budgeted. 
Oh, we went over $278,000 on our legal fee. Oh, well, you know, da, da, da. I mean, come on. This is our money. This is a town's money. This is homeowners' money. You don't seem to have much regard for the people who live here. And yet you sit up here on a town council supposedly representing 100% of the people. I don't see it. Really? Wow, my three minutes is up? Three minutes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Next speaker, please. Hello, Council. Michael McIntosh. I must say, I'm really disappointed in the town, again, for item number six, and to our town manager to write a letter in opposition and cite how we're going to lose a lot of money because it'll make the town more accountable. That is very disappointing. But I also read that. And it was very interesting to say that any sort of fees and taxes that you guys have passed since the beginning of 2022 must, unless they're very compliant, must be rescinded in any of our ordinances. So I wonder if it's about your even your rent control just cause will need to be re-decided and re-implemented. So absolutely, I think that should be pulled. And I think there should be an open conversation, especially when we hear from Michael Bervret that there, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Michael, you've only been polite to me, especially when he's very tactfully saying, hey, we don't have the funds to transfer this account. We haven't quite got them in. And for me holding up my chance, please. I also have not gotten a request for a business license fee. So I'm a third person that's spoken to that. These are really important things. And if we don't have the funds to transfer and fund other things, maybe we should look at our priorities. But back, I certainly hope the town is going to be more transparent and look at any and all fees, taxes that have been passed since 1122 and possibly have to re-implement them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, Todd Greenberg, one more time, asking you to pull item number six, which by the town manager's submitted resolution has a significant financial impact on Fairfax. I'd also like to comment uh, my own personal insights on what um, our finance director has written in the report that, yes, revenues are up. Well, guess what? Inflation is up. Real estate is appreciated. Wouldn't it be nice to know if revenues were up because we were doing something positive here and we were actually growing the number of businesses rather than losing businesses and having people move away and increasing costs? By acting without proper notice to the people of Fairfax, and acting contrary to their well-being, issuing this resolution without community buy-in, you are doing a disservice to all of Fairfax, and it needs to stop. Please stop. Thank you. Um, are there any folks on Zoom, Michelle, for consent? This is for consent. Yes, Mayor. I see one raised hand, and that is Philip Pfeffer. You're unmuted now for uh, comments on consent. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Phil Pfeffer again speaking on my own behalf right now, also for consent calendar item number six. Um, you know, I appreciate uh, public comment. We all get to uh, to say how we feel and make our thoughts known. Um, not all the time uh, is everything, uh, you know, uh, completely fact checked or well understood. So I just wanted to, to before I get into my main comment, just highlight that number six, um, the significant financial impact would be the negative effect of the um, law that this resolution is speaking out against. This is a resolution opposing um, a ballot initiative, uh, which is titled, I believe, the. Um, Tax, sorry. Uh, tax Government Accountability Act. Um, but we're not spending anything, just saying that we don't like it. Uh, um, and uh, 
the the re the ballot initiative actually goes against uh, local control. It would increase the uh, threshold for uh, the people of the fa town of Fairfax to enact their own ordinances and and control our revenues. It would uh, impose a, a much higher super uh, majority requirement. Uh, but anyway, for my main comment, um, I applaud and support the town's resolution joining the numerous other cities and counties, SEIU California, the California Teachers Association, California Professional Firefighters, California Federation of Teachers, California School Employees Association, California Faculty Association, California Labor Federation, among others, in opposing this ballot, ballot initiative that would amend the California Constitution with provisions that limit voters' authority and input and adopts new and stricter rules for raising taxes and fees and may make it more difficult to impose fines and penalties for violation of state and local laws. The League of California Cities highlights the strong opposition to the deceptive ballot measure sponsored by the California Business Roundtable, who, as the press and other accountability organizations across the state have noted, is a lobbying arm of the largest and wealthiest corporations in California. I agree that we should speak out against deceptive and cynical initiatives like these that, quote, undermine the abilities of locally elected officials to provide critical services, end quote. Unfortunately, these deep-pocketed special interests are active in other areas. The major funders of this in initiative also fund, for example, the California Apartment Association and its related lobbying entities, which we know have been involved in our town backing similar efforts in opposition to tenant protections. Again, thank you for the inclusion of this resolution and I look forward to your vote in its favor. Thank you. Any other speakers on Zoom? No further no? speakers. Okay, we'll close public comment on the consent calendar and take it back to the dais. Any further comment? Yes, Vice Mayor Kohler. Yeah, I would just like to say that I think others asked for this, but I specifically asked for item six to be on the agenda. And I wanna thank uh, Philip Pfeffer for bringing out some of the really important reasons. This is funded by the Cal Roundtable. This is not about giving you more control. In fact, it's taking away control. And I wanna talk about how fees are assessed and it has nothing to do with the renter protections that are happening right now or, or on hold for now. What, what this is about is in 2019, Michael Vivret, myself as mayor, Renee Goddard as vice mayor and our then town manager, Matt, and we had a fee study done. The only way that fees can be assessed in a town is to only recover your costs, no more. We went through page by page, a book of fees and an analysis of every fee in this town, every page. And on many of those, we decided not to increase the fees to recover our full costs because we felt it would be too much of a jump. We also on some of them changed them over time so they would increase over time. I worked on every single page of that with Michael Vivret, Garrett Toy and Renee Goddard and Janet Garvin, who's our town treasurer. I also, with the help of Larry Bragman and Holly Bragman, earlier ran a tax measure at that time was called Measure J. I that then took on Measure F, which was a property tax measure, which renewed it at that time with Barbara Petty, who was our town treasurer. I also ran Measure C, which is a sales tax initiative. These things go to the voters, the fees do not. But I wanna say, after we worked on that fee study, it came to the council, the entire book. The entire book from November, 2019 is on the website. So I take umbrage at people saying that somehow uh, this is gonna change what we're doing here. This is a real serious business that we need to be able to run our town. And I feel very strongly that we need to fight the California Business Roundtable who is trying to take away local control from cities and towns and counties and enable us to try to do what we're trying to do. In fact, tonight we're gonna to hear from Lauren Umbertus and our, our, our consultant on our pavement management index and moving forward to get the work done on more of our infrastructure. So thank you. Thank you very much.
Vice Mayor Kohler. Um, if there are no other comments from council members, I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar. I'd like to move the consent calendar. I'll second. Okay, motion Kohler, second Ackerman. Can have a roll call vote, please. Uh, yes. Council member Blash. Yes. Council member Hellman. Yes. Council member Ackerman. Yes. Vice mayor Kohler. Yes. And mayor Catrano. Yes. Eyes all motion passes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on here to our regular agenda and we are on item nine, receive the 2022, 23 mid-year budget review report from Michael Vivret and Heather Abrams. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Every year in June or July, the town adopts an annual budget, which is our plan for revenues and expenditures for the next fiscal year. Uh, and then uh, after about January, which is about seven months into the year, we, we revisit uh, the assumptions that we made as far as what the uh, revenues uh, and expenses are, look at it, actual revenues and expenses, and we fine tune our plan to reflect the updated information uh, in, in a mid-year uh, budget report. So we have a PowerPoint presentation. There we go. So first slide, if you don't mind, or I guess number two. So in summary, our general fund revenues are projected to exceed the budget by about 475,000 in, in revenues. And we anticipate that we're going to be able to transfer another 100,000 from our building and planning uh, account, adding 100,000. So there's total revenues and transfers in that will exceed what we originally planned by about 575,000. That's about 4.9%. So our general fund expenses are projected to be under budget by about 265,000. That's about a 2% savings, 1.9%. Uh, our current budget includes council approved adjustments for the uh, police MOU that was done last August and also for planning adjustments for the housing element and interim planner contract, uh, which uh, recently uh, was uh, made. Uh, when, when I look at those kind of contracts, I uh, consulted with uh, David and we estimated the amount that was actually going to be spent this fiscal year. So even though the contract was higher uh, than what I've got it added to the budget, it's, a base, it's based on uh, what, what we projected we were going to be spending this fiscal year. So uh, in total, the adopted budget that we did this last uh, July was originally projected uh, to have a general fund drawdown from reserves of about 1.39 million. And the savings that I'm projecting here from revenues and from uh, expenses uh, will likely reduce this to a uh, drawdown of 549,000. And that'll bring our reserves from 30%, which we, which we projected last July when we did the budget, up to about 36%. The next slide. So the methodology that I use for being able to project revenues and expenses employs a, a variety of methods. Um, some, some things we know are gonna be coming in on a certain schedule. Uh, our property taxes, as an example, we collect under a, pro a, a program called Teeter. And so basically they, they say, these are the amount of property taxes that have been assessed. And in December, they send us 55% uh, of that. In the next April, they send us 40% of that. And then they do a final payment. Uh, so I know with pretty good accuracy how much we're gonna receive in terms of, uh, of the property taxes once I see the revenues come in in December. Uh, other expenses that we've got, uh, like uh, insurance, uh, we pay those all right up front. So this this tends to uh, make it so that when you're projecting your revenues and uh, expenses, that you're able to uh, you know ac accurately figure out what's going to be happening by uh, June. Uh, 
So some people, some of these I do on an average. Some of them I do based on direct calculations. Some are based on what we received in prior periods and anticipate we're going to continue to receive. So, Michael, the ins where's the insurance line item you just mentioned? The insurance line is included in seven in seven fifteen, which is our non departmental expenses. It's Got included it. in that total. Thank you. Yeah. Next slide. So revenues this year uh, are going to are some revenues are going to be higher. Primarily, uh, the property and sales tax revenues. Our property taxes we're anticipating will be higher by about two hundred and fifty thousand, which is about four point seven percent. Sales taxes we're expecting that those are going to come in about two hundred and eighty thousand over what we initially budgeted. You will recall last year when we did the budget, we we had a pro, an initial projection for for sales tax, we decided we're gonna buffer that just in case there's a recession. So we cut that down by about 300,000 when we did our budget this last year. Well, the revenues came in about 280. So it, it, it went down from what the initial projection was, but we used a number that was lower. So this is gonna be 15% higher than what we originally budgeted. Most interesting is our interest. So we're gonna receive uh, a projected eighty thousand more than what we initially budgeted. This is in part because the because the uh, Fed rate, uh, Fed funds rate has gone up, and that's what our investments in in uh, LAFE, which is the the state fund for for municipalities and other agencies to invest in, it's going to go up by about three hundred and twenty five percent. So we're going to see about eighty thousand more on our investments this year, which is great news. Um, you know, contrary to some. Uh, questions. We don't invest in stocks, and even though that market was down, we weren't we weren't invested in that. So, um, our sales tax is projected uh, is tracked by a third party administrator, Avenue, which uh, specializes in this. And so, our projections here are actually based on on their projections of what we're going to get. We get quarterly reports from them, and this is the amount that they estimated as of the last report that we'll receive by uh, the uh, by June 30. Next slide. So some of our revenues are gonna be down this, this year. Um, you know, that is to say that we're gonna receive less than uh, what we originally projected. Uh, in our fines and licenses, we're uh, anticipating that that'll be about 70,000 less. Um, the business licenses portion of that I'm expecting might be down by about four or 5,000 based on the projections that I've seen that may reflect uh, uh, businesses that have turned over or that sort of thing. Uh, the other part of that is, is fines. Um, so fines are gonna be a lot less than what we had in, originally in this, uh, anticipated. And, uh, you know, the, those are those are just educated guesses of what we're going to get. You can't say in July that we're going to get this amount in in uh, you know um, different kinds of fines. So all we can go is by by average, and it may be the extension of COVID. Uh, or it's not uh, you know producing the kind of fines that that we had budgeted for. In any case, we're going to be down about 70,000 in, in uh, our fines and licenses section. We have uh, grants from agencies, which will be less than what we anticipated. When we did the budget last July, I, I uh, included revenues that we apparently had already received. So we had 40,000 that we we're planning on working on as far as environmental grants. And I came to find out that most of this is money that we've already received that we're actually now going through and spending. So uh, there is some some anticipation that maybe before June 30, we'll receive another 40,000, but I'm not including that revenue as far as this report goes. Um, all other revenue categories show a decrease of about 25,000 or 2%, but all in all will be about 575,000 over what we budgeted. Um, so uh, the next slide just is there to point out the fact that uh, because our revenues in the building fund have been uh, better, uh, have been coming in better than what we originally projected that we'll have another 100,000 available. So uh, that that's also part of the 575. So the next slide is, should say expenditures. Yes. 
Yes, that's great. Okay. So our general fund expenditures are projected to be under budget by about 265,000. When I gave this report last year, we were actually over. Uh, I expected that we were gonna be over budget. And so when we went into our budget this year, I, I anticipated that there was gonna be an inflationary effect on expenses. And uh, so even, even though we've got uh, higher dollar amounts that we've spent, we budgeted uh, for it uh, adequately. And so we're actually gonna have a savings this year of about 1.9% in the expenses that we've got in the uh, different departments. Uh, and most, most of the departments are, in, are expected to be under budget by June 30. Uh, I called out about four projects on the next slide, uh, or four departments that uh, are likely to be over budget. Um, surprisingly, our town attorney is not on this list. We budgeted the amount <laughs> at that it, through the December bill has come in a, a, right on. So I don't know whether you guys are going through the budget and saying we're not gonna bill these things or what, but I'm, I'm proud to say <laughs> the attorney budget is not one of the ones that's over this time. We do have uh, overage in the uh, Ross Fire, uh, Ross Valley Fire Service. This is likely because we had higher expenses for doing brush clearing and all that sort of thing. Um, there is going to be an offset sure. in the fact that we had higher uh, revenues from the wildfire uh, protection. Uh, our street maintenance is uh, is likely to go over budget. Uh, but that may be a good thing indicating that we've been doing some expenses. And so the, what we expected we were going to spend, we've actually been spending more from the uh, street maintenance fund. Our street lightning and lighting, lightning, street lighting and traffic signals is going to be a little bit higher than what we expected. Power costs are higher. Uh, we also had some work that we did on uh, loops uh you know in pavement loops uh had a lot of work that needed to be done to them this year so uh the fourth one is fairfax recreation we expect that that's going to be a little over budget we didn't have use of the pavilion this year so we didn't get a lot of uh revenues that would have gone to classes that are up at the pavilion uh but on the on the positive side we did get more in revenues in recreation programs. So there is an offset of about $10,000 to the 31,000 that I'm seeing that we might need to uh, boost the recreation project or uh, department by. So these, all of these overages in these accounts can be covered by interdepartment transfers because we do have a net savings in all of the expenditures. So I think what I'm, in, what I'm recommending here that we do is, 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 as we come closer to June, that the town manager can take some of these savings in other departments and move them to uh, cover overages that are likely to be in in most uh, in in the funds that here that I've identified. So, um, within uh, expenditures, I'm I'm projecting that our personnel costs are going to be uh, somewhat at budget. Uh, certain things uh, like the the uh, administrative analyst. Uh, position that we've got that uh, it is likely to cost around 140,000. We will have cost savings for from the fact that we no longer have a, a communications and marketing position, and also we are not uh, using a deputy uh, town clerk uh, assistant. So those cost, those personnel costs that were there are going to actually offset the 140 that we're expecting. Uh, that's an annual cost, but whenever they come on, that portion that they're going to be that's going to be spent for that will be will be covered. And Michael, just to quickly interrupt, when you mm -hmm. say one hundred forty thousand, that's not salary; that's including all the benefits. That's all, and, all the costs so of the that's position. fully loaded. Right. So I don't want somebody right. walking no, away. No, somebody's not getting one hundred forty. That's okay. that's so that, let's that's less than one hundred for the position. We talk inside baseball, but sometimes yeah. we have to talk so everybody gets uh, it. Thank you. That's important to to uh, clarify. So our our health costs uh, we ex we budgeted that we might be able to cover a six percent increase in January. The actual expense in healthcare costs is uh, six point five percent, but we do have also an offset that's in the same uh, line item for dental uh, costs, which uh, the cost did not go up this year. So there's uh, I think that's going to be a a wash for the most part. 
in in our capital projects, uh, we we budgeted that we were going to spend about five point eight million in our uh, project funds. Um, most years we are always under budget. Uh, they these are all expected to be under budget by June thirty. Uh, through January of this year, we've spent approximately one point uh, one six eight million on capital projects. But if I look at last year's budget report, we'd only spent 485,000 through January. So uh, we're seeing seeing more money go out onto uh, projects and that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, so just a reminder, our capital projects that aren't completed uh, by the end of this fiscal year are carried forward and rebudgeted in the following fiscal year. So. Um, and, My, and just to note, so now that we have Lauren on board, we think we can be much more full speed ahead on the capital projects. And so, um, and we'll hear more about that next, but I just, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, not everybody understands those terminologies. And I think that's where we're gonna be able to make more inroads on some of the infrastructure capital projects that have been happening on more slow, pace mm -hmm. so basically i'm just uh this the only thing we're looking for here is that you receive the report uh and uh, we're not asking for additional appropriations uh, just the authorization for the town manager to be able to move what's necessary from one department to another within the existing uh, total budget thank you um i just want to piggyback real quickly on what vice mayor kohler was sharing um and also just kind of clarify for the public and and just as we are on the subject of capital improvement projects and the program itself so the you know the money that we carry over from year to year michael is these are things like the bridge the big bridge projects that have been planned for years and the pavilion project and so some of these things will be realized over time as they move through different phases of the, the projects, but others like the pavilion project, which we're not moving forward with, that money won't be going to that anymore. And so um, that won't be, ex we won't expect to spend that money, but these are things that are big projects over multiple years. And that's kind of why we're always just spending a, a portion of that at any given time. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. We When we go through the budget again this year, Lauren, the engineers will go through and look at it, say, you know, what are there going to be any changes to what we've got, uh, you know, anticipated going forward, there will be new projects added, there'll be projects that are uh, deemed to not not be something we're going to continue with like the pavilion. And uh, so, you know, that that's, that's going to happen coming up with the budget process, which is our next step. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I see. Uh... Councilmember Hellman has a question. Yes, I do. Um, this is excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, just both the mayor and vice mayor have touched on this, but I always need a little bit of a refresher. And I know we're about to get into it with um, Lauren, but I can you confirm my understanding that um, expenses or costs um, budgeted related to pavement reside both in that line item 511 or fund 511 that you just had up as well as CIP. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. What we've got is uh, most mostly what we have in 511 is the personnel costs of people who are working on the road. So general fund pays for all expenses related to uh, personnel. So we have uh, three three uh, guys on the street uh, who, who split their time between the street and, and uh, parks and uh, just other expenses. So the street portion is 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 the cost of uh, personnel for the most part and patching and, and uh, other supplies that might be there. Got it. The, and the, that's our public works guys that you're referring to the three. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And then the CIP is the actual like everything else. And and if I if I may, um, so part of the distinction is that our excuse me, our staff does sort of those 
those immediate temporary items that we can do. Yep. So cold patch in a um, pothole, that kind of thing. It's not expected to last forever. And um, we don't tend to call that road repair. It's patch really. Um, and then that CIP is really more um, maintaining and repairing for the long term. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you. And thank you again for this. Yeah, any other questions from colleagues on the dais? No, just offering my thanks for uh, to Michael in particular for your always excellent explanations and for keeping track of this so well, but also just you, uh, you tend to budget conservatively so that as we've seen, uh, there's you can never be sure exactly what's gonna happen in a year in Fairfax but it's good that we don't have mid-year surprises. So thank you for keeping us in good shape. And I, I wanna thank everyone on town staff, um, Michael, um, and the good news is we thought we were gonna be dipping into reserves nearly 1.4 million. And now we're looking at about 550,000. So uh, thanks to everyone for doing your part there, um, probably just overworking people too much, but, um, but uh, and thank you for the presentation. It was really clear. And I think the PowerPoint really helped. I mean, some of the pages, I couldn't read the detail, but, but the, the big picture stuff was really helpful for me. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know we have to go out to public comment, but I also just wanna express my, deep appreciation for um, a really clear and and pretty like concise report in a lot of ways. I think it was like just the facts and, um, th you know, it's not always the, the case that budgets are exciting, but this is definitely some, some exciting news for the town to see that we're in a much better position um, than we budgeted for. So that's good. Thank you. Um, we'll take it now to open the public comment on this item. Thank you, Council Michael McIntosh. Um, every time I reached out to Michael, he's been extremely accountable, um, has always provided me the information, maybe not the choice and decisions I want, but always the information. Um, something, Chance, that you actually brought up that I would like Michael to also um, illuminate for the public. What funds and grants have been in the past booked for the pavilion that we no longer have and what funds do we have for the furtherance of some sort of restoration project for the pavilion? And for those funds that were earmarked and allocated in the past, where did they go? For the most part, the pavilion project was going to be funded by FEMA, where you do the expenses up front, you get reimbursed on the back end. As I recall, and you correct me if I'm if I've if I've missed the point on this one, when when we went to look at getting further FEMA money for this, it looked like the town was going to have to pony up a million dollars in order to get a million dollars worth of of uh, FEMA funds, something along that line. Uh, the only monies that we actually budgeted up front was one hundred and fifty thousand, which uh, which predated me that they'd put in to do this project. We spent well more than that uh, in, just in the preparation work, getting as far as we did in the FEMA project. So, as far as I as far as I can recall, those are the only grants that were really involved in the uh, uh, pavilion project. Will the pavilion? Do, I, well, we I, don't want to do it back think, and forth. Okay. Sorry. I think we also uh, the town manager did a presentation on this a few months ago, and that's when we decided to put it on hold for now. Mm -hmm. I did. That's right. right. And um, the projected cost that we were asking for additional monies from FEMA was uh, more than four million dollars. So um, unfortunately, we we couldn't recommend going forward. And, you know, that would be a huge investment for the town. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank and you. Just, yeah, of course. Thank you. Hi, Todd Greenberg, Fairfax resident. Um, I want to second what Michael said. Uh, our finance director has been responsive 
and impresses me and I'm glad he's on the job. Uh, I, I'd like it if possible for him to impress me a little bit more. <laughs> if if uh, he, he, he can go for an A plus. Um, I have, uh, I think, seven questions related to your presentation. Uh, and I want to add one thing before I forget it that Michael just brought up. I have made a request of town staff and council members to report to the public what grants have been applied for currently and on an ongoing basis so that the rest of the residents can help you out and be involved. We'd like to know going forward, please respond. Here's the questions directed to the finance director. One, in your report, um, you mentioned uh, in paragraph two, it's done on a cash basis. But as I understand it, the CAFR, the Consolidated Annual Financial Reports, are done on a gap basis. Can you reconcile at a subsequent date the difference between those, please? Uh, Michael, we're not supposed to be doing interactive. Why don't you just take the questions? Todd, I'd be happy to answer these things for you. If you want to put them into an email, I'll, be, I'll send you a, a response back on that. that that'd that be great. I'll just uh, enumerate them for the public and I'll follow up with an email. Number two, given that many lawyers in Marin County think that Fairfax is the most sued jurisdiction in the county, I'm wondering whether your budget has any amount for legal liability reserves? And if so, what that is and what other reserves there might be. Number three, what is the credit rating of the town? If there is a credit rating for the town, people would like to know. Number four, are there bond ratings? Would large legal settlements, since the town has been sued recently because it didn't complete its housing element on time, would that affect the town's cost of borrowing. Taxpayers here should know. Number five, where in this presentation is the $1.2 million that's been spent on outside consultants? Number six, under cash and investments, and I, I'm sure I'm just not understanding something, but I think the common person probably won't understand something here. On December 31st, 2022, it shows $8 million, 106,000. But by January 31st, there's only 4,191,000. Where did the $4 million go? And number six, my final last one is item number 7715, I think. Uh, Non-departmental is a million plus dollar item. What does that consist of? Thank you. Thanks for those comments. And I'll just throw it really quickly to staff about the, the credit rating question. I think that's a good question for the public to know. When it... The last time that we went out to do uh, a refinance of our, our bonds, uh, we had a very high rating. I, I think it was like A minus or, you know, it was, it was, it was up there. They really liked the fact that the town had uh methods or, or me, had, a, had a good tax base. We had uh, monies that were coming in to be, you know, as an example, when we did the PERS refinance, they they really liked the fact that there was a PERS, a, a pension uh, tax that was a guaranteed uh, amount that they could use towards uh, the payments of, of that. And so our rate was lower as a result of the fact that we had that. Great, thanks. Mark Bell, thanks. I'm going to check with my bond broker friends because the last I recall from the decades ago when I was in finances, uh, A minus a- wasn't that good of a rating. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Um, the, my two questions are uh, I'd like to see a figure for how much we spent on consultants in the past year, two years. And also, if everything is so good, then why are we dipping into the reserve five hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. 
Frank, Frank Ager met away. Um, one of our four street parks crew has been on paid administrative leave for 10 months. We're paying him to stay home rather than working. <clears throat> he was the street sweeper operator. We only have a crew of three workers now, which for streets and parks. It's probably one of the reasons we're so far behind on potholing and potholing and other issues. <clears throat> we're, we're contracting with a garbage company to bring a street sweeper to Fairfax. It's twelve hundred dollars a pop. If they come in twice a week with their private street sweeper, it's one hundred and four thousand dollars a year for street sweeping for Fairfax. Whereas we had a street sweeper and we had an operator. None of that comes out in these figures. I, I, I don't know where, the, where those figures show up. When you have an employee on paid administrative leave, for what reason? I have no idea right now. I, I understand that the courts threw out the charge. So, um, you know, the, I, I, it, this is really an issue that, that the town council will be dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to mention that the street sweeper was not compliant with California Air Resources Board regulations, and this came to the council a few months ago. So it came to the council a few months ago. You know what? Some of our some of our fire trucks aren't compliant either. You you, you can't get they can't force public Frank, agencies I work to get for the air just okay. Well, we don't have to have a back and forth about it, um, but. Uh, a more detailed, in-depth discussion does occur around these sorts of issues, personnel and how we're doing these things, uh, both at the budget workshop, but also when we're actually looking at the draft budget that staff will bring us. There's, you know, department by department, we can go through those things. So definitely encourage you to bring those questions back at that time and we can track it. Can you confirm when the budget workshop is? Is, is that in May? Usually, right? Y yes, I believe we have that tentatively scheduled for May 13th. I think it's the 19th. 19th? Yes. 19th. We'll, it's a Friday and we will publicize it in the newsletter, et cetera. And it'll be brought up again at future council meetings just to remind folks and it'll be on the website. So yes. do we want to see if anyone's on Zoom for this item, which is I, we're still on item nine. Um, yes, there's one raised hand and that is Delano Arthur. You're unmuted now. Hi, can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about what we are uh, spending on the town attorney. I don't have last year's budget in front of me, but I did look at it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm being told that I'm I'm using my my partner's computer, and I just realized that um, this is Philip Oliver. This is not Delano Arthur. Um, anyway, um, when I looked at the town uh, expenditure for the uh, attorney last year, uh, again, I don't have it in front of me. It seems like it was over more than 100% of what was budgeted. And I'm very concerned, as another uh, speaker uh, had mentioned, that uh, there's going to probably be a number of lawsuits brought against the town uh, surrounding uh, the rent control ordinances that you guys voted in in November. And I don't see any money put aside for that. I'm very concerned that um, my understanding is the town attorney is uh, paid through her law firm. And so the town is paying taxpayer money to a law firm that's in business to um, provide attorneys to, to our town. And it seems like it's in their interest to charge as many billable hours as they possibly can. I don't see how much they charge per billable hour anywhere in the budget. I haven't seen it in the previous budget. And I'm very concerned about what this could potentially cost the town. These are our tax dollars you guys are spending. I know you have a reserve. I respect that. That's great. A reserve is supposed to be used for things that we need that we don't an anticipate. And I think there's a big question about whether we need rent control and um, and I also feel like there is no 
anticipation for what we could be paying the town attorney's law firm. Uh, and I would urge you to uh, come back to the citizens with a more accurate uh, projection of what that expenditure could be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Kathy Flores, and you are unmuted now. Hi, this is Kathy Flores, Fairfax. Um, I'd like to just, agree, I don't agree, but reiterate what Frank had said. Uh, this has been on my mind, the fourth maintenance person who is the third, is the fourth one is stay, is home. We are paying for him to stay home. He's not able to work for un, for some unknown reason, but I'd like maybe you guys answer Frank on this or somebody answer Frank on this in an email or however you get back to people when they ask these questions, because that's a concern to me that we are paying someone a, a salary to stay home. Well, three other guys are trying to do the work and they can't get everything done. So I'm not sure what's going on there. And I would like, hopefully someone from the town council or whoever can answer Frank's question so that this could be known and not have to wait to May. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I see no more raised hands. Okay, we will um, take it back here. Um, just acknowledge that on um, with regard to the costs for legal services, um, they actually capture that. We capture it every month um, in the financial statements that we put out every month and put in the packet. Um, but it's in this packet as well under item three. So you can keep track of that stuff that way. Um, Barbara Kohler is uh, away from the dais here. But do we have any other comments or questions before we... We're done with public comments, sir, sorry. Sorry, we, we're done with public comment, but thank you. Um, Councilmember Hellman, any questions or can we get a motion on, oh, I guess we don't have to have a motion on anything. We just received the report, that's it, boom. No, no, no further comments from me. Okay, great, thank you. Um, seeing no further comments, thank you so much, Michael, for everything that you do. And we'll move on here to item number 10, Public Works Director Mbertis. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Cutrano and council members for having me tonight. I'm uh, very pleased to be up here. I know that this is something that is on a lot of the town of Fairfax's minds. So I'm, I'm very excited to uh, go into this discussion. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, I have two presentations for this evening. One is going to be from uh, our consultant from Pavement Engineering Incorporated, Joe Reary. Ryrie? Ryrie. Joe Ryrie. Uh, and he'll be giving his first report. The first thing, uh, what I'd like to discuss with the council is that we are here to go over the report, uh, the PCI report, the PTAP report that was presented to you last month for your review. Uh, as you know, it's quite long. There's a lot of information in it. What Joe is going to help us out with tonight is kind of giving us an abridged version of that report, going through that, highlighting some of the details of that report, because it is, as you can see, 120 pages. So uh, Joe will be doing that in a second. The next piece of what we're going to be discussing tonight is the approval of a, an amendment to um, Pavement Engineering Incorporates, uh, Incorporation, uh, Incorporated, their initial uh, contract to pr provide plans and specifications for a road improvement pro project for this fiscal year. We'll go into the details of those roads that have been proposed uh, and go into some of the reasoning why those have been selected. And of course, I know that there's gonna be questions from the council and also from the public. So initially, I just want to uh, let everyone know that um, uh, we receive this PTAP report generally every two years. It has a great deal of information on it. Uh, and it provides the town with what is called a pavement condition index. And that is generally an average of the condition of the streets within Fairfax. Uh, currently our PE, our PCI is 55. That's uh, the lowest in Marin County. 
Um, there is a lot of information about how those numbers are generated. You'll see within the report that there are certain segments uh, that are broken up into distances and they're given a number. And uh, those numbers are an average of that uh, um, stretch of road or street. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that with Joe, and then we can go into a little bit further detail when I start my presentation. Um, but, you know, in the interest of time, and I know that there's going to be lots of questions that will come up, uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce Joe Ryrie of Pavement Engineering Incorporated. And I believe he has a presentation for us tonight. And so he'll be doing that. And then upon completion of that, I'll start my own presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Um, as mentioned, I'm Joe Ryrie. I'm an engineer with Pavement Engineering Incorporated. Um, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, it's wonderful to be able to be here with you. Uh, Michelle, we're ready to get going. Could uh, one of you tell me the title? I have three PowerPoints for Lauren tonight. <laughs> uh, the report for Joe is going to be. I'll give you a choice. Is it the, um, let's see, it is pavement not the 20, PMP? It is not the 2023 roadway repair. It is not that one. It is the other one. Can I look over your shoulder, Michelle? Yes, would you? Okay. <laughs> it is the PMP presentation. Oh, PMP. Yeah. Yes, that one right there. All right. Yes. Okay, I understand that there's an that Michelle is going to be my clicker, and so I don't know if I like ding a bell or just say Michelle. There's a number of slides we're going to go through. I believe in a picture is worth a thousand words, and it will will really help convey the message this evening. Before I'll we start, I just want to ask Lauren one question. I believe the last time we got this, you mentioned that um, Joe and his company was paid through TAM funds. Uh, I, I believe I, I believe we didn't pay separately for this. Is that correct? The PTAP report is is from a grant through the Metropolitan. Um, Could you speak more into the mic? Sorry. Uh, really uh, so the the report itself, the the PTAP report comes out from a basically a state grant, and that uh, is provided to all cities. Um, Michael just left, and he could probably answer it a little bit better. Joe's company, um, PEI, was hired by my predecessors, Jonathan Goldman, uh, to assist the town in taking the information that is included in the PTAP report and helping the town to generate a five-year program plan for street improvements. Um, what we're asking tonight of PEI is some more specificity on developing plans and specs for the, pro for the project that we have identified for this year. Okay, and PEI was the company that worked with Larkspur on a lot of their roads, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, and I'm really sorry for interrupting. That's okay. Thank you. I, I'm I'm good with questions all the way through the presentation, or if you want to wait till the end, that's okay. I think I'll wait. Thank okay, you. okay. Um, so let's get rolling, Michelle. Yeah. Yep. All right, we have five goals that we're going to try and accomplish this evening. Uh the first two are going to be providing some background on pavement so that we're all on the same page as we're talking about it. Then we're going to dig into the assessment findings that were provided by uh, the, the report that was done by a company called NCE uh, that was contracted through the MTC and the grant project. Then we're going to go into the funding needs and the, the report specifies. And then We've, we're going to provide some different recommendations to, for the town to consider as they're trying to manage this important resource or important asset. So we're going to start off with Pavement 101 um, and let's get going. So what is a pavement? Well, there are two things that, that define what the pavement is. The pavement is, to, is intended to bridge over the material that it's riding all on. And so that's all of what's the underlying soil that's pushing up on the pavement. And it, it also is being, uh, has the 
the loading on top of the pavement. And so the greater the loading and the poorer the soil underneath, the thicker the pavement section needs to be. And so that varies depending on where you're located and what that what the loading conditions are. So let's keep rolling, Michelle. This is a pavement deterioration curve. When pavements deteriorate, they don't deteriorate in a linear fashion. They deteriorate in kind of this S-shaped pattern. And that's really important because as we go forward, you'll see us tying back to a lot of the information with this curve. And you'll see that pavements will look good for a while. So on the, on the vertical axis is our pavement condition. And pavements look good for a while, and then they fall off really quickly. And we've seen that as we've driven around. Sometimes we'll drive on a road and we'll say, when did this road get so bad? And, and so that's when you're on that downward part of the curve. And when you're on that downward part of the curve, we call that the at-risk pavement because it's really moving fast. And so you can kind of look right there and see that if we have a 55, like Lauren mentioned, you're really on that very steep part of the curve. When we talk about asphalt pavement, it's uh, un important to understand that it, it deteriorates two different ways. One is by the oxidizing effects of the sun and the water, and the other is, is based on the loading that the pavement receives, the fatigue that the pavement receives from the heavy vehicles. So let's look at each one of these. So, Michelle, um, when we look at the impact of the sun and the water, we have to remember that the pavement is held is is aggregate that's held together by a binder, and that binder is an oil, and and it holds all of that together. And as the the sun and the water um, hits that oil, it oxidizes it, and it and it causes it to become brittle. And then also, the, as the sun bakes on it, it loses some of its volatiles and actually shrinks. And that shrinking will cause the cracking. And, and so you see the cracks on the pavement here and then the water begins to get in there and it causes it to accelerate and to deteriorate um, quickly. So that's the environmental uh, part of deterioration. And let's look at the fatigue. So in order to be able to really understand this and the loading and uh, that affects pavement, you need to look at the heavy vehicles. And so we, many years ago, we looked at a Chevy S10 Blazer and we said, which was a small SUV. Uh, some of us might remember what those look like. And we tried to equate how many Chevy S10 Blazer units were part of, of different kind of vehicles. And so a two axle truck typically loaded is equal to 442 Chevy S10 Blazers. And it has the same equivalent effect as the weight wise um, when one of those trucks go by. You look at a fully loaded five axle truck and it's equal to 15,000 Chevy S10 Blazers. Um, I'll point out just above that is your garbage truck. It's equal to almost 10,000. When you go, when you look at pavement to design, you're not looking at the busyness of the road. You're looking at what the road is actually conveying and what it's carrying. So it's the heaviness of of the vehicles that really impact it. I pointed out the garbage truck because it's we've now decided that we're going to have not just one garbage truck running around every single week picking up our trash. We now have three garbage trucks, and I, there's some of, of the agencies we're working with that are talking about a fourth garbage truck running around. And when we designed these roads many, many years ago, we didn't design it for that many, um, that much loading. The way to think about it is, is when you design a pavement, it's like a bank account. You anticipate how much loading it's gonna have. And every time that vehicle drives over that pavement, there's a withdrawal. And when you your bank account gets to zero, that's when the pavement really starts to fail quickly. So let's uh, move on here. These are different types of, of distresses, just pictures of them. Um, 
the the first one on the left is is the fines wearing off the top of the of the pavement that can happen with water running over the top of it or just traffic uh, we call that weathering or raveling the second slide is transverse or longitudinal cracking remember i said that the pavement begins to shrink and so it shrinks at the weak places and you can see that the line right down the middle was the paving joint and then it's gonna uh, shrink transversely as well. That starts looking more like block cracking, which is our third slide. And those cracks usually begin to form and they're about 20 by 20 when you first start to see them. And then they break down to 10 by 10 and five by five and they keep getting smaller and smaller. The slide on the very end is alligator cracking. That is a fatigue type of a distress. The pavement has been have been run over and fatigued and and bent so many times that it just actually begins to crack all the tensile strength on the bottom or the tensile stress on the bottom has caused it to crack this is on the surface and i can tell you that as the pavement is bending it actually looks worse underneath um, if we could flip it over like a pancake you would see that and so the first three slides are all environmental distresses which means that you could build a pavement and it could never see a car and it would have those kind of different distresses on it. And the fourth one is, is whenever you see alligator cracking, that is a sign that the pavement is overloaded and it is at the end of its bank account and it's not handling any, things anymore. So let's keep rolling. Thank you, Michelle, you're doing great. Um, okay, so the pavement management system was updated with this report done by MTC. Um, a pavement management system is a budgeting tool. It's an inventory tool. It helps, keep, helps us to be able to keep track of our road system. And um, then it also provides guidance for what kind of projects should we be doing? What strategy should we be applying as we're looking at our road system? Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned there's different types of distresses. We are the distresses were all quantified on these segments, as Lauren mentioned, and those are, are reduced in a program and a pavement condition index is developed. So our next slide. The PCI or a pavement condition index is a scale from 100 being a perfectly brand new pavement built properly all the way down to zero, again, at the end of its bank account life. The pavement condition index has been around for a long time. It was first developed by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, as part of during World War II to assess runways. And we have just as an industry have worked with it and, and refined it to be able to, to measure our road system and be able to look at and compare with how we're doing and what success we're having with any kind of treatments. Um, we do rank it um, at the higher end is the good to excellent range. And down at the end is our poor to failed. Uh, at a 55, the town of Fairfax is fair to uh, right. Uh, we can expect getting into the poor range. So you're, you're um, hovering right about that, that spot. Next slide. These are some pictures of some roads that were in the, the um, uh, report. The, the slide didn't come out quite as nice as what you would hope, but there's more on the Sir Francis Drake uh, has weathering and raveling. And so it's a higher PCI up in the 84s. Uh, down on the um, bottom right is the Oak Park, and it has a PCI of 11. And if you look really closely, you can see a whole lot of alligator cracking going on on that road in the uphill lane. Can I ask one question? You so uh, Sir Francis Drake is an arterial. Yes. The only one we have. Um, I know that I had asked Lauren before beforehand, I know from Glen Drive to town lot limits, the PCI is 84, mm -hmm. but the rest of Sir Francis Drake uh, from Glen to Oak Manor right. and beyond is in the poor ratings. Mm -hmm. So I just, and 
a lot of us drive on that every day and watch that. And there was a lot of heavy equipment uh, going down that road uh, for construction of a residential development as well as a flood, flood detention basin. And I believe, but, you know, I, I don't want to dispute what you're saying because I love the presentation, but I don't think that's a fair representation of Sir Francis Drake. That is the one good area because the rest of it is all full of alligator cracking in huge holes. And I think if we don't even need to flip the pancake over because you can see it. You so I would have liked to have seen more of what I see on Sir Francis Drake. I don't disagree with what you're saying. This, the, the report is a little bit misleading in that you're only looking at one segment of Sir Francis Drake. And when you do the pavement management system, you, you break up the road into a number of different segments, usually based on the condition or by important uh, cross streets, so that when you're doing your projects, you can actually look at that segment and know what you're planning for. And so this just happens to be the best part of Sir Francis Drake, but it's a representation of a street or a pavement that would look in that in that better, good to excellent condition. Thank you. Okay. And and Joe, if I can just jump in on there, just um, uh, for the folks out there uh, who can take a look at the report, um, the the road segments are broken down um, as you mentioned into different streets or different segments. And for Sir Francis Drake, I just counted it now, there are, I think, um, at least 10 distinct segments listed for Sir Francis Drake from one end of the town to the other. And um, as you pointed out, you know, there are some really bad areas. They go from, you know, 36 up to 47, um, and then uh, up to, I think, 60, um, and so, so, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the width. So they vary anywhere from 88 all the way down to um, to the 30s. So you're correct. They, they do vary. Uh, this is a not necessarily a, a representative picture of Sir Francis Drake in its entirety, um, but just maybe one spot within those 10 zones. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And this reminds us why we have uh, pavement in the first place. Um, it's intended to be the funny part of the presentation. So um, this isn't a Fairfax Street. I don't know, um, someone at the office found this one. I like the picture a lot. Next slide. So let's, with that background, let's get into some pavement management principles. Principles that can be applied that are true, that we, we can, um, we can see success with if we understand how they're used properly. So let's dig into this. So the first thing is, is the principle of, of pavement preservation. And pavement preservation is just quite simply applying the right treatment to the right pavement at the right time using the right materials. And, and that's the principle that you wanna try and apply. Now that's words, I'm kind of a picture guy, so I put it into a uh, picture. So if we look at the next slide, we're gonna look at our deterioration curve. And so if we're gonna do the right treatment to the right pavement at the right time, that means that there's different treatments along the, the deterioration curve that we're going to be looking at. At when pavements are in better condition and up at the high end, they're just beginning to crack. So the treatment that you apply is crack sealing. We got to we got to seal the cracks. Got to keep the water out of those out of the getting into the underlying structure. And then as the pavement deteriorates and you get way down at the end, you're looking more at reconstruction. The principle of doing the right treatment at the right time is can really be emphasized on this, you wouldn't take a pavement that's in good condition and reconstruct it. You would be wasting all of your money. And conversely, you don't take a pavement that's in reconstruction mode and 
and put a bunch of crack seal on it, trying to hold it together. Again, you're wasting your money. So you try and do the right treatment at the right time as throughout its cycle. So let's take a look at some different types of, of treatments. First is crack sealing. I believe it's probably the single most cost-effective treatment that a, a an agency can use to help hold their pavements together. Um, you're just simply filling the cracks is what you're doing. The problem is, is as soon as you fill the cracks, everyone notices the cracks because you've got this great big black line down the road. But as you get those calls, you need to say, isn't it beautiful that we have those cracks filled and that we're maintaining our pavement at cost effectively? And, th and that's what you need to be able to say. Um, further down on the curve and the next type of a treatment that you're looking at is, is a slurry seal or a microsurfacing. It's putting a, a uh, coating over the top of the pavement. It's intended to help block against the, the ultraviolet effects of the, of the um, sun and water running on the, on the pavement. Um, it's like sunscreen for pavement is the easiest way that I can think of it. Our next slide is uh, showing a Cape Seal method. Uh, Cape Seal is is using um, putting down a heavy oil treatment over the over the pavement, and then putting chips over the top of it so that the cars are lifted up and not riding on that oiled surface, and then putting a slurry over the top of it. That initial oil can be just conventional oil. It can also be rubberized oil as well. And rubberized oil is is taking car tires and and uh, recycling them and and melting them into the oil itself. And it can be a very it's a great workhorse in terms of maintaining pavement. A, a rubberized Cape Seal. And next slide. We, uh, we Can get... I interrupt just one more question because you just sure. mentioned something I've been thinking about. So when you call the rubberized seal, is that rubberized asphalt? Because it's my understanding that that kind of a treatment is about a third of the cost. And I'm wondering if, when you refer to rubberized seal, is that the same thing? And I know that you need to do a lot at a time. Yeah, you do need to do a lot of the time. Um there's, it's a, it's a rubberized emulsion used in the Cape Seal. On overlays, you can also do rubberized asphalt. And that's where you actually take the ground up tires and you, you mix it in with the aggregate and it's actually part of the structure. And so in the first case with a seal, it's the tires are melted into the oil and with the rubberized overlay, or what we might, what we refer to in the industry as crumb rubber, uh, that that is mixed in as if it were were part of the aggregate structure, and then the oil is added and blended together. Um, as far as it being a third of the cost, uh, it would be wonderful if that was the case. Usually, rubberized asphalt is more expensive hmm. uh, because of the additional processing that has to go into it the okay. tires and the crumb rubber but good news um caltrans is now requiring that all of their pavements are be, are to be capped with a rubberized surface course uh rubber rubberized pavement uh, tends to stay black longer uh which is a nice uh visual effect but from an engineering point of view it provides more reflective cracking uh properties as well as it's been proven and studied that it's quieter, that the cars that drive on it, it's just quieter. So that's why they wanna cap the, all of their pavements with rubber. The great thing is, is that since now they're really pushing the rubberized product, that's making it way more available for the local agencies to be able to have access to that from the producers on a more regular basis. It used to be that if you had a rubberized project, you would wait a year for the rubber plant to show up in your area so that you could then do your rubber project. Okay, so it's, I'd always heard it was quite a bit cheaper, so that's wrong. Yes. But now that Caltrans is re requiring it, then it's gonna be more available and potentially cheaper? It's not gonna be cheaper. It's still gonna be a little bit expensive, uh, more expensive, but it's coming closer to what conventional asphalt is okay and and i've seen that over the especially the last about five years 
that those numbers are getting closer and closer together. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, one thing that you do need to be aware of, and this is just from a constructability point of view, rubberized asphalt is much harder for contractors to work with. It doesn't rake like the regular asphalt uh, breaks. Um, it, you just kind of shove it. And so it comes out really nicely in a paving machine. And if you're doing a long stretch of road that's straight and consistent, you'll get great rubberized pavement. If your road is kind of in and out and um, up and down, it's rubberized pavement is very difficult to work with. So that's just something that as a designer, you have to factor in. Is it true that in the past, um, municipalities have received like Cal Recycle grants and things like that to incorporate more? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, you know, California is great in that fact that we're looking for ways to recycle and, and trying to promote that. And so there is a recycle grant that is available, or a, we call it the rubberized grant. And it's pretty easy to be able to, to apply for and get. Um, it's, or be awarded to actually receive the money. There's a lot of paperwork that goes into it. You have to prove that your crumb rubber came from California and you have to mm. show all the certificates. That, and anyway, they're just doing their due diligence, but there is funding available and it is intended to be, to make up for that Delta between conventional versus rubberized pavement. Great. Thanks for that. Mm-hmm. Um, let's look at a few more treatments when, as we think about uh, doing the right treatment at the right time. Reconstruction just simply means you're taking out the existing pavement that's there and putting back new pavement. And then um, I wanted to show one more slide. Um, one thing that we have been working with um, is uh, recycling the existing pavement. And we use that by pulverizing the existing pavement into the underlying base and native subgrade, um, usually adding some kind of a, a enhancement like a cement or a line treatment, depending on what the soil conditions are, and re or, uh, creating a new base section, and then you put a new piece of asphalt on it. What is great about that is, is you're saving all kinds of off-haul costs and and tr so therefore your trucking goes down and so if you can recycle that pavement in place that's that's a really good thing and we're seeing that as our roads are being asked to carry more and more loading um, especially as we switch over to to electric vehicles we talked about different kind of vehicles and the weight of those electric vehicles are actually heavier than than standard vehicles you know an electric car versus a, a gas powered car, the electric car is heavier. So our roads are being asked to carry more weight and we're having to increase the structural section to be able to make up for that. And recycling is a great way of being able to do that. What's the cost effectiveness in terms of doing this approach? Is it is it usually a more cost effective approach. Oh, way more cost effective because you're saving on the trucking and you're saving on uh, all of the uh, dumping charges that would be associated with completely removing that material and then trucking in all the new material. Um, it's still an expensive reconstruction or or even just recycling. It's still an expensive option, and we'll be reviewing some of those costs as part of this. Uh, but it doing if you can do uh, that that full depth reclamation or that recycling approach, you're going to be dollars ahead. And are most of the contractors know how to do this? Because I mean, I see yes. lots of benefits in this. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not filling our landfills with this, which is we're running out of room. Right. We're um, limiting vehicle miles traveled. I mean, and just reusing what we have. I mean, it's, I think this is really in Heather Abrams' back pocket of the three R's, but I mean, it seems perfect. So mm -hmm. if we're going to do any reconstruction, clearly we want to do that. Absolutely. And it's one of the things that we look into if we're looking at a road that has a, that's very structurally deficient and we need to, to increase it, its ability to carry that loading this is one of the first things that we look at. And I'll add to, to Joe's comment and, and to your 
um, comments. It is a, a great way of doing it. And I've seen it in practice in, in other communities. The equipment that uh, is used is, is pretty large. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what it's basically doing is it's grinding, kind of um, um, putting it all back together again and then laying it. So you have a lot of uh, equipment there that uh, is of significant size. So, you know, this is a great opportunity in those areas where you have plenty of room, where you're not having to make really tight turns, um, you know, depending upon the substructure of the road that you're working on, you know, you've got this heavy piece of equipment as you're going along. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit more in, in the second presentation and in the future. Um, but, you know, each one of these approaches uh, takes a look at the existing conditions of the road that you're working with. And then, you know, what we're going to be doing with Joe uh, is to determine what is the best solution for each of these roads. And some of these will be perfect for doing this type of work and others because of their geometry or their location, you know, we might not have to, we might but, not be able to use But there's them. also the possibility of staging somewhere and doing the grinding at a different staging and then going back up the road, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the, it, it's just a matter of, you know, what is the most cost effective? And if there are uh, decisions that we want to make as a community to say, well, we want to do this because this is important. Um, we can certainly make those decisions as well. You know, looking at it at a cost basis and saying, hey, how are we going to actually achieve this? You know, that's something that we can put into the um, specifications and the plans and say, hey, you know, we have this project. Um, we are willing to, you know, work with a contractor to come up with the best solution about doing that and finding out what is the most cost effective. Um, so that's something that we can put into those plans and say, you know, what is um, your thoughts on doing this? Contractors want to do uh, a project for as much money as they can, but as quickly as they can and as easily as they can so that they can move on to the next project. So look, working with them to say what is the best approach to do this uh, is something that, you know, first we start off with PEI, but then we can open up those conversations with the contractors and reward them for helping the city come up with better solutions. Thanks. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, not all roads are perfect for this. Underground utilities are can be a problem, and I've seen that stop the being able to use this type of an approach if the if the there are too many utilities or they are too shallow. Uh, then, then it's a problem. Um, but there's, and it would be way fun to be able to talk about the science behind being able to make sure that you select the right treatment. And, and there's a whole process to be able to do that, to know that here are all our options. Here's the cost associated with that option and, and run through a life cycle cost analysis. And, and we do that with every design. Let's keep going on our, our presentation here. So um, I, I have gray hair and a few wrinkles. And so uh, I've been doing this a while. Um, and all during that time, I've only come up with three different ways to be able to manage a pavement system like the town of Fairfax's pavement. Um, and this is when you don't have enough money. What strategy should you try to apply? And what should you do? So let's review each, review each one of these different strategies. The first being is a best first type of an approach. Remember our deterioration curve. Um, the upper part is all the, your good pavements. And so the cost to be able to treat those pavements is very little. It's only a few pennies per square foot compared to really expensive pavements at the very bottom. So you could say, you know what? My strategy is to apply all of my money, my limited money, and keep my good streets in good condition and ignore all the rest. The next approach is a worse first type of a system where you take a look at all of your PCIs and you line them up from the best to the worst and you just start working on the bottom of that list and you just keep working on that list. Um, the problem is, is neither one of those are sustainable over time. If you take a best first approach, then your pavements are going to be in two groups. You're going to have a whole bunch of good streets and you're going to have a whole bunch of bad streets and nothing in the middle. If you take a worse first type of an approach, that just means that you're going to be, all your pavements are going to be in bad condition because when you're doing worse first, you're spending the most amount of money and you're not able to get 
as many streets touched as you can. So you end up with, with your, uh, with just everything looking bad. Uh, so how do you deal with that? What do you do? What strategy do you apply? And the one that, that um, we use is I call it critical point management. And the best way to understand that is the graphically. So let's go to our next slide, Michelle. Um, remember our deterioration curve and remember the principle of doing the right treatment at the right time. And so what you're doing is, is you're recognizing that in a pavement's life, there's a point where, where that treatment is going to no longer be as effective and it's going to drop down to needing the next kind of a treatment. And so that's what those uh, horizontal lines, the dashed lines are supposed to re represent on this, this graph. The red circle is the critical point. That's you're trying to capture those pavements at the end of that treatment before it falls into needing the next treatment down below. And so a good pavement management system following the, the critical point strategy is taking treatments or pavements that are in each one of those red circle areas. And that's what you look at on, on an annual basis or maybe on an every other year basis, you're looking at pulling pavements from those areas. And that's why your pavement management program is really helpful because it identifies where those, where those streets are and gives you the candidates that you can look at and, and select out of. So let's look at the dollars associated with these. I told you that we would look at that. So you can see when pavements are up at the upper end of their best condition, 90 to 71, you can see that they're anywhere from 80 to a dollar uh, per square foot to do those treatments. Um, when you're down in the reconstruction mode, you're looking at 24 to $31 per square foot to be able to treat those pavements. And that's, that, that's the... Uh, in place recycling costs. Full reconstruction would probably be twice to three times that number. It can be very expensive. And you can see that there's different costs all the way down. So what you wanna try and do is if you've got a pavement that only needs light maintenance now, the ideal thing to do is to pay that little bit of money. If you've got pavements that need some kind of a heavier maintenance, you wanna capture those pavements when they're only costing you 250 to four dollars per square foot before it falls into needing seven to eight dollars per square foot. And so that's the principle of of critical point management. Okay, our next slide. Um, let's get into the actual facts about the town of Fairfax. Um, you have 27.6 center line miles. If you were to line up your street system, end to end to end, all of those segments, that means that you would be driving from Fairfax out towards San Rafael, hit the 101 and all the way up to Petaluma. That's how much street system you have. Um, it's over 3 million square feet of pavement. Your system-wide average is 55. That means you have some that are higher, some that are lower, but you're at 55. Uh, your replacement value for just the streets, the pavement only, doesn't include curb, gutter, sidewalk, signals. It, it's just the pavement is $48 million. That's the size of your asset that you're trying to maintain. Next slide. Um, you mentioned um, arterials. Um, those are your most used streets. It's uh, it's just fair. Uh, sorry, Sir Francis Drake is is your um, one arterial as a whole. It's fifty seven. Um, your collector system is at a fifty four, and your residentials are at a fifty three. Typically, usually, you'll see that the arterials uh, or agencies choose to keep their arterials and their collectors in better condition than your residentials. Again, we're talking about when you have limited dollars and what decisions and what priorities do you put on it, you're gonna put your money into the most used streets. 
is what you try and do. And so typically, usually you'll see your arterials better, your residentials in worse condition. What's fascinating about the town of Fairfax is 57 to 53, that's not a huge difference. All of your streets are just in that condition. Um, so your 54 is pretty representative for, for what the town is. Our next slide, let's talk money. Um, the report pointed out and they ran uh, scenarios, uh, five-year scenarios. So starting at a 55, they were trying to project out um, what would happen with different funding levels. Uh, the um, the top line is looking at uh, what would it take, how much funding would it take if we wanted to uh, increase our PCI by five points. So say the council said, that's our goal, that's what we want, Lauren, make that happen. We want to increase five points over the next five years. Well, it would require, if you look down at scenario number three, it would require $7.2 million uh, to be expended over the next five years or about $1.4 million per year. Um, if you spent nothing, on your system, just use the money other places. Um, that's our first scenario, that's the red line. Uh, you can expect your system to fall from a 55 down to a 44 in the next five years. So you would lose 11 points. Um, at your current rate of expenditure uh, for your system, which is about a half a million dollars per year, um, you can expect that you're still gonna deteriorate. Uh, you're gonna go from a 55 and we're projecting, or the report is projecting that you're gonna be at a 51. So our next slide, please. This is your deferred maintenance costs and what you can anticipate. And we use just the uh, example of current budget. So this is your half a million dollars per year. Right now you have about a, $12.5 million backlog of work that needs to happen. Uh, and that's where your 55 is. Um, then by 51 uh, in 2027, you are sorry, in 2027, you'll be at a 51 and you'll have about $19 million in deferred maintenance that will be building up. So it's kind of this is the depressing part. This is usually when the floor opens up and I drop down poof, and because no one likes hearing what I have to say, but I get to be the bad guy. Okay, next slide. Um, so let's talk about some different kind of recommendations. What do we do in this kind of a situation? Well, to be honest, you wanna keep your pavement management system updated. You are blessed to be part of the MTC program. They give you a grant. They know that it's really important that you're tracking this. So it's really no money out of your pocket to be able to have this report every couple of years. There's a small little bit that you contribute, but they pay the bulk of this report. So you want to keep your system updated and make sure that you're tracking that. Um, you want to develop a multi-year pavement expenditure plan. Um, that's one of the things now that the report is finished, we're going to be digging into that and coming up with what kind of strategy we want to apply for the town of Fairfax and where we think the best place to use that half a million dollars per year and on what road systems we should or what roads we need to be able to focus on. There's going to be a number of factors that you're going to be looking at in terms of what kind of uh, utility work uh, or what kind of work the utilities are going to be planning because you don't want to do a brand new road and then have them cut and come and cut it all up afterwards. And so there's going to be some planning and that's going to happen. And that's one of the reasons why you want a multi-year expenditure plan so that you can say, PG&E, this is where we're going. And if you've got infrastructure out there you need to get your stuff taken care of before we come through and do these projects. And so it helps everybody get on the same page. Plus it's gonna help um, 
you be able to know what's what kind of um, what to be looking for in the future in terms of other types of projects with your CIP uh, funding. Um, when you have limited um, money, it is our recommendation that you use it on your most critical assets. Um, those are going to be your most used streets. Where possible, you want to try and leverage your limited dollars with grant funding. Unfortunately, you have one road uh, that you're really going to apply that to. Uh, but the good thing is it's used by everybody in Marin County. I, I And so you can make really great arguments to TAM and say, listen, we need to partner together and you need to help contribute to helping, helping us um, improve and, and maintain uh, Sir Francis Drake. Then also the last- by visitors. I mean, everybody going- Sure. West, uh, yeah. uh, to West Marin mm -hmm. are going through Sir Francis Drake. It's kind of the only way to get there, isn't it? Well, there's there are other ways, but this is a straight shot, right? So maybe a toll booth. I just yeah, anyway, just ideas that really gets us into considering a, you know additional funding sources, and I'll share with you that I have seen um, you are not alone in in not only the condition of your pavement. Uh, Fifty five is not a great place to be, um, but. I, I can tell you, you're not alone. Uh, the California average is just uh, right above that in the 60s. And so a lot of agencies are struggling with this and they're looking for ways to, to improve that. Now we voted as in California to have our SB1 funding, but it's not enough. It really is a drop in the bucket when you compare it against the needs of the pavement. Now, that's not a nice thing to say because we all feel it at the pump and you're like, man, this is expensive. And uh, But it, it's helping, but it's not the solution. Um, so some agencies are considering refuge impact fees and have implemented that with their uh, refuge companies. Uh, utility impact fees, sales tax measures um, are a popular way of being able to uh, work on, on getting additional funding for pavements. Um, sales tax measures that are then leveraged into bond measures, similar to what this, the city of Larkspur did, uh, can be very effective in giving a major infusion into your system. With you being at a 55, you're like a great big ocean liner with a little teeny rudder. It's you've got to get, you're not going to have a whole lot of effect. It's going to take a lot before you can turn the ship around. Um, and then parcel taxes are another way that that we have seen people be able to try and generate uh, money. I, I say people, agencies. And so these are our recommendations. And the last slide is just open to questions, although you've asked some, but I'm open to any additional before Lauren jumps in. Yeah, Joe, if I may, um, um, council members, um, if, if it's okay with you, we can jump into um, my presentation. It may cover some of the questions you might have. Uh, we can go through this. And then if there are questions for either Joe or myself, then we, we can bring him back up to the dais. Um, that way, if I am going to be touching up on any of the questions you might have, we can address them and then come back and 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 ask questions of, of both of us, if that's okay. So if you could clarify. So there was this presentation and then your presentation and then that is it or is there a third slide? That is it. After okay, my this, presentation will be done. And this okay. one will focus on the specific, the amendment? Uh, the... The amendment is is um, we we're not going to discuss that in particular. That is um, out there. The cost for designing the plans and specifications for the projects that I'm going to propose in my right. presentation okay. um, um, is the uh, the fee for PEI's work to develop those plans and specs, and we'll go through that in the presentation. Um, Before we do that, we have to. It's ten o'clock, so we have to. Yeah. We, so I notice I see Eric Stromberg sitting in the audience. Hello, Eric. And I know he's staying for item 11. I'm hoping that 
uh, and I know Lauren and Eric will probably be doing that together. Um, I would like to say we should waive the 10 o'clock rule and make that motion, but I'm just wondering if Eric's able to stay. He's nodding his head, great. So I would make a motion that we, since we've already continued two of the items, do we think we can get to item 13 as well? Yep. Okay, I guess Sean can tough, toughen up. Okay, so I'm gonna make a motion that we continue on and pass this item and go to 11 and 13 after this. I'll second that. Okay, motion second. Caller Ackerman, could I have a roll call vote? Council member Ackerman? Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler? Yes. Council member Blash? Yes. Council member Hellman? Yes. And Mayor Catrano? Yes. All eyes passes. All eyes. Great. Okay. And I, I do agree that um, it makes sense to go on to the second presentation to make sure we can not re be redundant. Um, so please continue, Lauren. Great. Thank you very much, Mayor Catrano. Um, Michelle, if I but you can... need to speak directly Sorry. into the mic, it's far away from you. It's a little hard for people to hear. Uh, Michelle, if you can please add the uh, second presentation. And the that, street rehab. That will be the 2022, Three? 2023 roadway rehab project. Coming. Okay, if you can go to the next slide, please. So a number of these details have already gone over by uh, Joe. Um, as he pointed out, we have the 26.7 miles. The one point I wanna make on this page is that uh, when the PTAP report looks at pavement, it is looking at the surface of the, the pavement and the type of pavement. It does not necessarily uh, address other issues that might exist, um, such as roads cut into the side of a hillside that are slowly moving down the hillside and some other types of, of issues. Um, it does take a look at what the pavement is and, and calls out for um, what that would be for the restoration. And that's gonna be important as we go further on and start talking about some of the other elements that go into um, costing out these projects. If you could go to the next slide, please. As we discussed, one of the goals of working with PEI is to develop the five-year program and also to initial uh, to do to generate the program for this project that we're talking about for this fiscal year. Uh, so we will continue to work with Joe on that. We will come back to the council with uh, uh, with that program and be able to go over that and talk about you know, why those streets were selected and what the costs are going to be for that, depending on if the council is able to change its budgets or modify those budgets, increasing that, those, the numbers of streets will, you know, obviously change from year to year. Uh, we will um, bring that forward. And then also as we work with our other utilities, PG&E, MMWD, Ross Valley, you know, we'll be adjusting projects so that as Joe pointed out, we're not trying to step over work that's already been put into place. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the three streets that uh, are being proposed for this fiscal year are Scenic Avenue from Azalea to Manor, which has currently a PCI of 30. Porteous from Bolinas to Wood Lane, which has a PCI between 11 and, and 30. And Klaus from Sir Francis Drake to Burdett, which has a PCI of 43. Uh, the reasons that these um, streets were selected is uh, for a number of different things. We, we have a pretty good understanding of their existing condition. We know that they're not being affected by other subsidence issues like being on a hillside. We also have observed that there may not be um, uh, lots of storm drainage work that might need to happen at the same time. We've also reached out to the other utilities, MMWD, Ross Valley, and PG&E, and they do not conflict with any proposed work from any of those agencies. Uh, and we'll go into some of the other reasons uh, for them, but um, we selected these three because they uh, uh, impact a great number of residents within the community. It's spread out among the town so that it's not just simply uh, assisting one location, but 
trying to, to spread that uh, um, work around to benefit the greatest number of people that we can. Uh, as we go into the particular streets, we'll go into some specific details. So the next slide will be the picture. These are gonna be some um, photographs of scenic. Uh, this is uh, scenic taken from just above Azalea. You can see some of the conditions that Joe discussed, uh, which um, are significant degradation, the alligatoring, the cracks. Uh, if you go to the next page, please. Uh, again, you'll see this is a really great example of what occurs when you have um, garbage trucks and large vehicles and parking typically on one side of the street. You have a crown in the middle of the street. The garbage trucks and the large trucks have to uh, drive along the one side. Since they're tilted slightly because of the crown of the road, they're placing a great deal of stress upon those edges. And you can see the impacts of this uh, very clearly here. So one of the, the I listed uh, some benefits of refurbishing scenic. Uh, it is a very important road. Lots of people use it to go into and out of the hills. Um, this is a place where uh, a lot of people are coming and walking and driving to get to Sir Francis Drake. Uh, there is a portion of it that is part of the safe pathways to school for bicycles. Uh, and as I pointed out, it is generally flat compared to some of the other streets that we have in Fairfax. And we know that the issues that are taking place here are not the result of land subsidence or other issues. Um, so we can address that. Additionally, uh, early on, I, I did meet with contractors about the potential of just doing this street as a special project. So we do have numbers for the uh, reconstruction of this to do a two grind overlay, to do additional dig outs where it's necessary, and also to do the restriping and, and marking. So we're pretty confident about the number that we have allocated for scenic. Now, the benefit of that is as you go to the uh, next slide, please, we go to Porteus. Now, Porteus is very similar to Scenic in the type of damage that you'll see. Um, it's got the same type of geometry. So in looking at both Scenic and Porteus, we have a pretty confident level of what the cost is going to be based upon what the PTAP report says and what we've already seen from contractors. So the good news is that we're, we're looking at streets that are very similar. We might not find the types of surprises or other very expensive issues that might be causing the damage in the first place. If you could, next slide, please. Again, um, placed a couple of uh, notes as to why we think that this is a good street to do. There's the park at the very end of the street um, as you continue on down that area. Lots of residents use this to get access to Bolinas. Uh, and then also, this is actually a picture of an area where if you're familiar with that neighborhood, there's been a significant amount of water that's coming off of Wood Lane, and it's actually causing a lot of damage. So our uh, project here is to include this area and try to improve that drainage so that we're not seeing the impacts of all that water that are going um, onto this particular spot. And Again, the, Fa the Fairfax Center and Selma Children's Center is at the end, not just the park. Thank you. Thank you. So there is that benefit as well. Um, again, same issues. It's relatively flat. There's not a lot of underground storm drainage system that we would want to address before we redid, did a repaving project. And we have run that through the other utility companies um, and they do not have any projects. The next slide. Now this is Klaus. And so this is a little bit different. We're going to see some different conditions than we have seen on Scenic. But again, you know, it is on the other side of Sir Francis Drake. We're trying to um, spread this work around to benefit as many people as we possibly can. There is also a park that is adjacent to Klaus. Uh, there's also Mercy Housing, which is a little further up the hill. And so there may be you know, more visitors there. There may be more pedestrians. Um, and we'll see some other reasons for it. But you'll see, again, you know, on the left, you have the evidence of the uh, cracking, some of the alligatoring. And as you look at the upper right-hand picture, you'll see that there have been a significant number of uh, patches, probably due to, you know, water line replacements, gas line replacements, sewer lateral replacements. Anywhere where you see that discrepancy between the colors of the pavement, that's where you're going to start to see um, further degradation and those cr cracks are going to get larger and you're going to see um, that accelerate in its problems. Uh, if you can to the next one. Now, one of the issues about doing repaving is depending upon the element that you're using to um, 
uh, fix the road, whether it's a crack seal or it's a slurry seal, or you're doing a reconstruction, certain uh, treatments will tr trigger things like accessibility requirements. So anything, uh, if you're doing a crack seal or if you're doing a slurry seal, it does not trigger ADA. If you're doing a um, uh, chip seal or a micro seal, or if you're doing a reconstruction, it does trigger things like ADA. Now, uh, we've taken that into consideration in looking at these projects. If you take a look at Klaus, you'll notice that there are a number of areas where we have sidewalks, but we don't have them as compliant ADA sidewalks. And so as part of this project, we're going to identify those intersections that uh, should receive improvements in these corners for those um, types of, of areas. And so we drove this street together. We identified a number of those. That will be a benefit to the neighborhood yeah. uh, for people who are you know, taking their children in strollers down to the park or pedestrians that may be coming can, from Mercy can Housing. I, can I also, yeah, I was going to also note that if people don't know what Mercy Housing is, that's Bennett House. And um, it's senior housing, so I think this um, the ADA compliance will be particularly important for that neighborhood. So thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Again, just um, continuing to show pictures of the area, and you can see here that the sidewalk we have um, the rolled gutters, and that you know we don't have adequate uh, ramps. If somebody is coming, as as you pointed out, actually, if you take a look at that picture on the right, uh, where you see the red curb. That is on the same side of the street as Mercy Housing. And so um, when that was constructed, there is no curb ramp there. And so as somebody would come down that sidewalk, they would um, come to a spot where there's not an adequate curb ramp. There's probably a larger discussion to have, but you can also notice that there are a number of vehicles that are parked on the sidewalk. That's kind of a common occurrence in Fairfax. Um, that's just something to kind of keep in mind that when we're taking a look at streets that they are narrow, people need to find ways to park. And so we sometimes do have those conflicts. Uh, next slide, please. And again, here are some other reasons as to why we selected Klaus. It's condition is at approximately 45, which is a little bit higher than the ones on Scenic and Porteous. Um, but you know, it is a, a, a street where we see a lot of benefits. We see people from that neighborhood being able to use that street to come down to Sir Francis Drake. So next slide, please. And, and again, if anyone would like to have a copy of this presentation, you know, they're more than welcome to email me and I'll make sure that I can send them a can copy. Can we of post them. both of the presentations on the website? Absolutely. I, I think Absolutely. they're both really valuable. Yep. So the, this next page you know, shows uh, kind of a, a, a pricing exercise that I did when we received that PTAP report. And I identified a number of streets that I felt were important to the community, uh, such as Willow, uh, the Sir Francis Drake section between Oak Tree Lane and Glen. Uh, I believe we have a uh, park road in here as well. And you can see on the far right what those costs came out to. And then to do all the projects that I identified was over $2 million. And that was just for the pavement, not including any of the sidewalk, curb cuts, ADA, um, striping, marking, anything like that. But you can, uh, when you take a look at this number, you'll be able to see what the magnitude of these costs are. For example, Sir Francis Drake from Oak Tree Lane to Glen was $710,000 for doing the repaving of that based upon its condition of that section. In order to uh, really do that project, there's significantly other things that you would have to take into consideration, like utilities, storm drainage, and also um, taking a look at what's actually holding up Sir Francis Drake. As the community knows, a section of Sir Francis Drake collapsed a couple of years ago, and so there was a significant repair work just to support the road and then repave the road. Um, there are other areas that are probably like that. We're going to be doing uh, some investigation of that length to make sure that uh, the support of Sir Francis Drake exists because we don't want to pave something and then have it fall into the creek at some later point. But when you take a look at this, you'll also be able to see just kind of an idea of what the costs are. Another example is Willow. We took a look at Willow going up to Maple. That came in at approximately $423,000, if I can read correctly. Um, so you can see that these numbers start to uh, get up there quite a bit. Lauren, so, can I ask a quick question? Of course. The, the 13 segments that you've identified here are these um, segments that you've vetted in the context of 
um, the other storm drain considerations and the other utility considerations, or are those things that would have to get factored in to consider any of these things that are here? So initially, the reason I chose these streets is because they're um, commonly known. Everyone knows where they are. They know where these segments are. Um, you know, for somebody who lives in one part of the town that might not be familiar exactly with how scenic wraps around up on the other side of the hill, uh, this these were you know, important streets for neighborhoods to make it down to Sir Francis Drake or beyond Sir Francis Drake. So I selected these just because I knew everyone could understand what they are. Uh, so they do not, you know, have any numbers. They don't have anything included in them for any of the ex the um, secondary work, which would be accessibility, storm drainage, you know, utilities. Um, they were simply items that I picked out of the PTAP report, which has, you know, a huge list of, of street segments. And I said, let's take a look at these so we can see what the magnitude of what our work is just on these important segments. Great, thank you. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So um, we've, staff has identified the, the streets and, uh, that we would like to do for this year and, and given some reasons as to why we do that. We feel confident that they meet a lot of the goals of what we're trying to do, at least in the first year of our street improvement program. Uh, there are, of course, many other streets and people who live on them who would like to see their streets repaired. Um, the, the next step is to you know get some work done in this fiscal year. We're already in March. We want to be able to do that, spend some money, improve you know, the quality of our streets um, as quickly as we can. Working with PEI, what we want to do then is develop that program and start placing those streets, uh, uh, other streets into that program and start seeing how we can increase our PCI rating. Our goal is to get it up to 60. Um, that may be difficult to do under the current budget uh, um, situation. We'll have to have that conversation, but that's what we're going to do with PEI is generate that, that program. Now, when we go out to bid, what we are required to do based upon the size of this anticipated program is you know, go out for a public bid process. And that requires uh, formal, bid, um, formal bid packages, which include plans and specifications, uh, and a 30-day bid period. We need to do that in order to give the community and the marketplace you know, the, the adequate information that they uh, need to give us accurate bids. So the um, proposal that you have as part of this staff report from PEI is to develop those plans and specifications for the project. That will involve uh, Joe and his colleagues to come out and actually do uh, physical site inspections of the roads that we have proposed. It will include deflection testing, uh, potholing. It will include um, probably some level of surveying. And so that uh, process will then generate uh, for us what is the best approach to fixing these streets. We will find that in certain areas, we may have to do additional dig outs to, to address the compaction issues. In other areas, we may find that the, the um, subsurface is in good quality. It's just the asphalt that's poor. So we might be able to do a different application there, like a slurry seal or something a little bit different rather than doing a full you know, two inch dig out. So that's the next step is to approve the contract with PEI and immediately begin that work of, of inspecting those roads and developing those plans and specs. Following that, um, we will come back to the town council with the results of the bid process once we go out to the community. And you know, at this time, the PTAP report says that the cost of doing the three proposed streets is approximately $330,000. As I pointed out, we already know that we have some accessibility requirements. Um, we will find that we'll have to do some additional dig outs in certain areas in order to improve that subsurface base. Um, so that price will go from 330. And I put into the staff report that it could go as high as 600,000. And that's pretty conservative because I don't want to um, come in and um, be significantly under, you know, we, we expect that there will be more costs as we go forward. But <clears throat> as I pointed out, with regard to Scenic and with Porteous, you know, the types of things that surprise us, things that are underground, things that um, we're not expecting to see, uh, don't exist as much as they might say on 
uh, Bolinas Road as you're going to the uh, um, um, uh, town limits or going up along Laurel and Pine and some of those areas where we're on a very steep slope. So while the number will go up higher than $330,000, we're not expecting to see it um, go up so high that we're surprised by things that we didn't anticipate. We have a very good idea that what we can see, we can estimate. So at that time, when we go out to bid, we'll get those numbers, we'll come back to the council. It's likely that we'll structure that contract into making them three separate projects with a final total at the bottom, so that if the numbers come through and we can afford to do two of them or the town decides to do only two of them, we'll do two. We don't have to do the third. Uh, but ideally, we would get numbers that would be sufficient and within our budget to do all three projects. Assuming everything goes great uh, with uh, the investigation that we're doing with PEI and we go out to bid, say, in May or June, we should be able to get numbers back and do construction in July, August, and September. You want to do asphalt work before it gets too cold, obviously. So um, we anticipate that we'd be able to get this construction in um, in the um, summer and fall of 2023. Uh, so... Just before we leave, there's a couple of other things that I wanted to um, go to the next slide. And these are just other projects that the town is working on. So not only um, are we focusing on this, but there are other street improvement projects that we're trying to do. You know, one of them is to take advantage of the crack ceiling that Joe talked about and do that on a section of Broadway between Bolinas and Pacheco. And additionally, what we're uh, looking at is doing uh, the curb painting, we're going to refresh the, the pavement markings. And that's just something that we're, we're doing. It's relatively inexpensive, I think, in the $10,000 range. But we want to take a look at that and be able to show the community what that looks like. And so they'll get an idea of you know, how things can look if we're using those types of uh, applications. We have a section of Raqqa Drive, which we also want to do some crack sealing on. Um, we're continuing to um, take a look at other areas on Sir Francis Drake. I had an opportunity to go out with Mayor Cutrano a couple of weeks ago, and we took a look at five areas on Sir Francis Drake from Pacheco to um, um, uh, Pastori and took a look at five areas that are currently kind of failing within that area. You can start to see that the cracks are getting greater and greater. Did meet with a contractor out there, and they have provided us with a proposal for doing these five specific digouts. I'm in the process of obtaining uh, additional bids for that, but that five digouts of you know some few thousand square feet is approximately forty thousand to fifty thousand dollars at this time. So that's just one other thing that we're working on. Additionally, we do have a uh, planned 145 Canyon, which is uh, an, a section of that road where we have a retaining wall that has failed. Uh, it is in the current uh, budget to repair that retaining wall. And as part of that will, will be to resurface that one section of Canyon Road. And then also I'm in communication with San Anselmo. They're trying to do a slurry seal on a section of center as it comes towards uh, Fairfax. And so we're looking at the possibility of sharing that contractor and then continuing a portion of that slurry seal into Fairfax. Uh, we're in the very early stages of that. And then just also as an update, we have completed the scenic road stabilization project, uh, um, which was you know, basically a failing retaining wall that had the risk of damaging the roadway above it. And also um, we completed Reedon and Manzanita with the new retaining wall over there. And we'll be coming back to the council with a notice of completion on that. So just to give you an idea of some of the other projects that are happening in addition to the streets. So that concludes my project. I hope I didn't take up too much of your time. Um, but uh, Joe and I are available for any questions and further discussion. Excellent. Thank you for the comprehensive presentations, gentlemen. Uh, any questions from colleagues before we head out to the public? Um, sure. So, um, you know, you noted that that one segment of scenic is part of safe routes to school or a safe pathway to school. Um, is it possible or are you getting any grant funding from um, that type of program to help fix that? I haven't explored that portion yet. Um, right now, we're taking a look at the budget that we have currently. Um, we can certainly look at that and try to see if we can get some money back. Okay, great. Because I rode that with some people from the Bicycle Coalition the other day, and it is really rough. And um, they were super excited when they saw that this was in the report. So I'm hoping there's something there. 
Um, and then another thing that I just wanted to ask because of what some people in the public ask um, is, you know, when you survey these roads, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, surely somebody didn't really see my street. They didn't really look at it because it's in such bad shape. If they saw my street, they would fix it. Um, you know, is when you do a survey of these streets to determine the pavement condition, you know, what is somebody actually doing to determine that condition? Joe, you may have more experience on what they do. Um, I believe, in my understanding, it is a combination of actually going out there and um, physically reviewing the streets. You're absolutely correct. You know, these segments, if you take a look at some of these in the report, you know, are sometimes anywhere from between, you know, 500 to 1500, you know, um, linear feet long. And so when you're looking at a number that might have a 75, uh, certainly there are going to be areas on there that might be a 50 and there might be certain sections that might be an 80. So they are average. It's not, uh, um, uh, you know, a precise science, as you saw on some of the pictures here that we showed on Scenic and Porteous, you know, some of those areas are in really poor shape and um, certainly are closer to the, the lower numbers than they are the higher numbers. But Joe, if you can talk a little bit more about the process that uh, contractors use to develop this report. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, we work off of sample areas. is, And so you take a street and usually you're assessing about 10% of the area. So if you've got a, a street that's 25,000 square feet, you take a, a 2,500 square foot sample that's representative of the road and you actually measure all of the different types of distresses whether it be alligator cracking or block cracking or rutting or weathering and raveling and that you quantify that and that gets entered into the street saver program and then it calculates a PCI from that. And, but the, the, the folks who develop the PTAP through MTC, through their contractors, they're also sending out consultants and, and individuals into the communities to measure these streets as well as part of that process. Yeah, right. there, there's lots of quality control that they do. And there's there's third party people that come in and check to be able to make sure that the numbers are representative. Okay, so someone's actually going out and looking at those. Um, then the other question that I got from somebody is if they're seeing significant problems that they think are dangerous, do they report that on the little maintenance um, form that we have on the town website or you know, people saying I've got these horrible potholes or a tree that's falling and ripping a hole in the street. Like, where do I report that? Yeah, so we the the town's website does have a report a problem uh, um, piece to it. Um, that is helpful, and and that will come to us. We it's it's very simple. It basically creates an email that goes to a couple of individuals. Um, people are uh, absolutely welcome to send me an email directly and bring that information up. We do have a, an on kind of call um, engineering firm called Miller Pacific. They uh, help us design uh, for some of the, the road stabilization projects that we've been recently working on. So if we find uh, a situation in which we need to bring them on board, they can come down and actually do a physical inspection on our behalf, which they have done on numerous occasions since I've even been here. Uh, and then based upon their recommendations, we can, you know, move that further up, um, do some crack sealing like we're doing, say, on Raqqa, um, or, you know, uh, start, you know, envisioning that it may become a different type of project. So uh, reaching out to me directly is is perfectly fine by my email address and also by using the town's report a problem. Great. Thank you. And I had one final question, which is, um, this seemed like it was a very um, comprehensive discussion tonight, and yet I'm noticing in our resolution that it, on page one that it says, you know, it's just pending a larger discussion of PCI. Uh, so when are we going to have a larger discussion of PCI? Yeah, so what, <laughs> what we're looking at right now is um, we, we have the three projects that we've identified that we'd like to do. And so that's part of your agenda uh, for this evening. And then we still have an... Uh, uh, an open contract with PEI. And so the next phase of our work together is to start generating that five-year program. Once we start fleshing that out and start seeing what that actually means in terms of costs, you know, we're going to come back to the council and say, here's your five-year program, and this is what we came up with. And these are the reasons why we chose these in these particular years. We'll give you that information. And then it's up to the council and the community to say, we want more, or that's great, or that's too much. And so, you know, it, as part of the budget process, we're going to try to gather as much information so that we can come back to the council and the community and say, you know, in order to get these roads up to the 60 PCI, 
um, which you know may be too little. Maybe we want to go higher than that. Maybe we don't. We want to stay where we're at. It's um, it's all a base, you know, based upon how much are we willing to spend to 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 do what we want to do. Um, so we'll be continuing to work on that. Right now, I want to put him on to focus on getting these three projects moving forward so we can get them done. Uh, but we'll come back with additional information and say, you know, here's our five year program. As we made a couple of points to go out, we want to make sure that when we put these programs down, we're going through MMWD, Ross Valley. Um, I know for a fact that I think somebody mentioned that Ross Valley has some work that they want to do for adding some new um, um, facilities. We want to make sure that we put this out in front of them. You know, so we're going to create a plan, put it to those other agencies, and then they may say, hey, well, we're going to do this road on this particular year. So then that causes us to shift that over or causes them to shift their projects forward. So um, that's going to be a process and it's going to be a matter of just kind of plugging in streets and roads and see what that comes out with and what PCI we get at what cost and try to work that out as best we can and then come back to the council and say, here's what we have. So I have... Um, first of all, one comment. Um, I went back and forth with Lauren on some questions, so I want to thank you for those beforehand, so I don't need to repeat those. Um, I think you guys did a great job. Um, I would like to suggest, um, you know, I was going to ask when you're coming to us with the five-year plan, and, you know, we've been doing this for about an hour and a half tonight, um, usually, and we haven't done this for a long time, I think I'm the only one sitting on this council where we did it before, is I think it would be better if if you guys would be ready to do that at the budget workshop. Um, I don't think, you know, and or a special meeting of the council, because I think it's a little hard for people to sit for this long. But um, I, I think great work. And let's put those both on the website, because I think that they're both really useful. I just want to note one thing. In your report, you mentioned something about 40,000 for sidewalks in the budget. That is actually for the sidewalk repair grant program. So we don't want to take that. And I think council member Hellman also mentioned, we need to think about at some point in the future, putting that in the newsletter and advertising it again. But uh, thank you very much. Don't have any questions, just a comment, think about, if you're ready for the budget workshop to give us the five-year plan, but if not, I think we should consider a special meeting. Sure. And, and to that in the PTAP report, there is actually a kind of a, um, uh, a projected five-year plan that they did create. And so, you know, we can take a look at that and, and see whether or not that makes sense. Th these programs, these street improvement programs have both an objective and a subjective piece to them. You know, the objective piece is here's what the PCI is and here's what it costs based upon the report. The subjective is, you know, what is the benefit of the, to the community? Do we know that there are certain buildings or certain um, uses and certain Can transportation? Can I just interrupt programs? you and mention, mm -hmm. here's, I think the reason we have PEI is to not take what's just out of the PTAP report. So I think if you all are not ready by then, let's think about another time, because I think we want more, not straight PTAP, we want more of this objective. And I think Hamid was the one who got PEI on board because he worked in Larkspur as public works director. Hamid Shamsapur when he was here. Hey, Jonathan started the process and then Hamid finished it. And excellent. So great. Great. And just one thing to think about. I don't know. I know you won't be ready for this, but we do need to think about Sir Francis Drake as an arterial and, and where we can get grants and maybe not for the five-year plan, but pretty soon. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, um, comment. I mean, really Sir Francis Drake for all the reasons that have been mentioned before and for all the reasons that everyone knows, you know, is a um, project that is is a perfect one for you know an agency like TAM to help us out with. Um, 
lots of other uh, reasons to have, you know, money from different agencies come. Uh, and, and same with Bolinas as you go up the hill, the, those streets are important, not just to the residents of Fairfax, but probably even more importantly to some people outside of the town of Fairfax. So those are great projects that we uh, would look to, to get outside funding, especially since they're going to be so expensive, especially Bolinas. So uh, part of the process will be to, you know, start taking a look at those and developing the um, uh, the grant applications, which does require a certain level of design uh, um, for those applications. But absolutely, those two streets um, should get funding and not be solely uh, upon the backs of the town of Fairfax. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think we need to go out to the public um, now. And if we have any final comments after that, we can take them. But some people have been waiting patiently. Um, and thank you for waiting patiently. So we're going to open up public comment on this item, item 10. We assume it's been patiently. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, Bruce and Lynn McDermott, uh, Fairfax residents on Ridge Road. And first, we would like to thank Lauren for your attention to these problems and to your attention on scenic. Um, I'm not sure whether how many of you were here back in 2017, but we had helped organize a, a petition, 120 uh, neighbors scenic to, to get two areas of scenic repaved. One was this initial flat area and the other was the first upslope from the scenic terrace pillars up to Bay Street. That was 2017. In 2018, that part was done. And a couple times a day, I give thanks. It's so beautiful, so different than, uh, than what it was. It was just an awesome job. Now it's been five years and uh, until the focus has been on the flat part of scenic. And uh, we're relieved to hear it just because it's, um, as our engineer and you have pointed out, it's dangerous, ugly. It's an entrance to so much of our town and used by so many residents that anything that you can do to keep the focus on scenic, we and the other <clears throat> Humble taxpayers would be really appreciative. Uh, boss, did I? Oh, bikers. And oh, and then of course the bikers and the hikers. That's that's we bike a little bit, but uh, our biker friends, it's really dangerous. And if you've had any neck or back injuries, not saying we're old, but even riding on it is a little a little a little tricky, much less on the car. Is that okay, boss? That's good. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next speaker. Frank Edgar met away. Uh, great presentation this evening. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission rated Fairfax as having the worst paving of Marin's 11 cities and towns. Fairfax residents have known this for years. We didn't have to see the MTC report that came out recently. So the question is, how did our roads get so bad? To save money, the town council made former town manager, Garrett Torrey, the head of the public works department. The Fairfax council was penny wise and pound foolish for years. <clears throat> Our downtown Bolinas Road from Broadway to Park is highly visible and is an absolute mess. Bolinas Road is in the federal secondary roadway system. And I don't think we've had a grant for Bolinas Road since 1966. There may be federal funds to take care of Bolinas Road and you should investigate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi again. Todd Greenberg, Fairfax resident. I want to draw your attention to the new mayor of San Jose who got elected on a back to basics platform. He's trying to take care of public safety and public infrastructure. And that's what residents here would like to see you do rather than throwing money on 
outside consultants that aren't delivering. I'd like to thank Joe for a very nice report earlier. And I have five questions. Um, one, again, I've asked, I don't have answers. I'd like to see regular monthly reports on what grants have been applied for so that the public can help you if your work level is too great. Maybe we know about grants that you don't know about. If we're not informed, we can't help you. Please help us to help you. Two, Lauren, can you tell me you're responsive, but when I enter something in the public works as a ticket number, I get a ticket number back, but I never hear back from anybody. Can we get a monthly listing at the regular town council meetings of what's been reported so that the public knows what's been reported and then they know that you're aware of it? That would be great. Uh, two, you've talked about what the need is. Joe's talked about what the costs are. How are we gonna finance this? We don't have the reserves. I think we need to do a lot of work on how we're gonna get the money to get our roads in shape, especially with people's concerns about what happens in an emergency and how to get out of town. For downtown, this is an emergency type thing. There have been four emergency gas leak repairs along Blaness Road. I'd like to know what is happening. Other people would like to know what's happening. They reported smelling gas in years gone by. There was just a repair in front of Gestalt House. And I know it's downtown, it's a big project. I, I've communicated with Lauren. He's done a great job communicating with me. I know there's lots of partner agencies involved. There's RVSD, there's pg e there's AT&T, but it's a big coordinated project. And it is a 1935 gas main that pg e has employees have told me is whip circled as needing replacement. When is this going to become a town priority or are we going to be another San Bruno? And five, I'd like to point out, it's nice that there's a sidewalk grant um, available, but there's inflation. It's gone up dramatically. It's inadequate for people. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mark Bell, I think I've, I've never said this, but there was, those were great presentations. So um, just to piggyback on some of the points that Todd raised, we're giving away the rental fee of the parklets, you know, 30 cents a square foot when commercial is what three three twenty five a square foot? You think they'd be paying at least like a third or half of that? Two hundred eighty square feet, I believe it is, for two parking spots. But we're charging five hundred a year, and of course, no renovations have occurred that I know that I've seen. Uh, luckily, we don't have a marijuana dispensary in town. I guess we just don't need the money, right? So listening to Joe, I would say, yeah, here's a consultant who knows what he's doing and should be paid. But we got consultants, as far as I know, or employees that do. Now we have uh, somebody we're paying $60,000 a year to to rewrite the dictionary so that Wokes will like it who's not qualified to do that, has no degree in English. We don't need that person. I think what we're looking at is we need to figure out where we can downsize so that when we do need to upsize on something, the funds are there. And you don't seem to have any desire to do that. We're gonna hire the Berkeley Rental Board for tens of thousands. And then also what we're looking at, as Frank mentioned, it wasn't like 
What was the what was the rating two years ago? What was the rating four years ago? What was the rating six years ago? There's no infrastructure or, or bare bones infrastructure going on. What happened was that Measure K that was supposed to be dealing with roads. What happened to that? Just some questions. Thank you. Do we have anyone on Zoom? Okay, excellent. Yes, Mayor. Um, the first person is Patrice, followed by Lori Kramer. And Patrice, you're unmuted now. You may have to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Hi. I appreciate that we are trying to fix every single inch of road in Fairfax. But what I don't appreciate is the inefficient use of funds and the lack of asking uh, the population what they need. I am speaking funny right now because I tripped on my sidewalk and chipped my tooth. And so it's loose right now while I wait to go to the dentist. But if you just walk out of the women's center and make a right, you'll notice that the sidewalks here are horrendous. And we're talking about pavement and asphalt when we should be talking about also concrete and the needs of the community. And I would just ask that the town council pay more attention to the people in town uh, than to the politics. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Lori Kramer. You're unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lori Kramer and I've lived at 19 Taylor Drive for 30, or I'm sorry, 20 years. Um, my home is at the base of Fairfax Heights, which is between Roca Drive and Geary Avenue near the Bennett House. Uh, there are three main roads that deliver runoff from the hill above my house. The runoff from Upper Taylor Drive is evacuated with a storm drain at the entrance to the Bennett House. There are no storm drains where Geary Avenue meets Taylor Drive or where Roca Drive meets Taylor Drive. All of the runoff from these two roads coming off the hill joins together in front of my house and then continues down Sir Francis Drake. This floods the entire street um, in front of my house, has been undermined by uh, the, the roadbed has been undermined and the road surface has flattened out. Um, so rather than the runoff flowing in the gutters, it flows down the entire street. This has eroded the surface, which is now in it's a series of very large potholes where runoff pools and the annual patching becomes loose gravel with every storm. Since the street does not have regular street sweeping, the pooling and de debris lingers for months, every year. Every year I'm tasked with setting out 50 sandbags to keep the runoff from breaching the curb and flooding my basement and home. The street must be repaved with the proper crown and proper drainage. I should not bear the risk of property damage for the lack of proper drainage or proper paving. I have paid $1,000 per month in property tax for 20 years for a total of $240,000. I would like to see my tax dollars go towards uh, resolving drainage issues on my street and repaving my street in the short term to, to reduce the ongoing threats to property damage. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further hands. Okay, we will close public comment on this. Um, take it back to council here. Um, I think on, on the first part of this, um, it was just receive and discuss the report. And I think we accomplished that. And I, I would concur with Vice Mayor Kohler's recommendation, if possible, to um, you know bring something back to us before the budget 
workshop that would be excellent, not only because we have funds that we could dedicate like we have in the last couple of years, increasing funds, but we also have those ARPA dollars, those American Rescue Plan dollars that we need to spend. And in, in, I think we have to have that programmed by 2024 or something. But anyhow, um, would really be helpful for us at the budget workshop to have that some, some recommendations. So thank you. Um, I think on the other thing, we do have uh, an action before us tonight. Um, would someone be willing to make the motion? I'll do it. Great. So we can actually get through this. I'd like to make a motion to authorize the town manager to execute an amendment in the amount of 66720 to the contract with Pavement Engineering Inc. PEI to develop bid documents, including plan plans and specifications for proposed roadway improvements, the three that you proposed in fiscal year 2022-2023. Second. Thank you. Motion Kohler, second Blash. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Ackerman? Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler? Yes. Council Member Blash? Yes and yay. Council Member Hellman? Yeah, I wanted to offer a comment. Just thank you so much, Lauren and I believe it's Neil who presented. I've been Joe. Joe, sorry. Um, been exchanging with Hamid and Lauren and many, many residents in the Manor Hill area about scenic for, for a few years now. So I'm really delighted with this um detailed report analysis and um recommendation. So thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. And Mayor Cutrano. Yes. That's thank, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Joe, very much. We look forward to working with y'all more to bring that PCI up as quickly as we can. So thank you. Okay. Um, with that, me, Mayor. Yes. I'm not going to make it to the last item and um, I'm just very, too ill to make it any further. Yeah. Uh, completely understood. And thank you for hanging on as long as you have, but please um, rest up and take care of yourself. Thanks. Okay. Um, and it is 11 o'clock. Oh, it is my, oh, we have a half hour before we have to worry about the rule. Okay, great. On we go to uh, item 11, which is Lauren again. Thank you, Mayor Cutrano. We'll make this one really quick. Um, the The purpose of coming here to, tonight is just for a couple of things regarding Perry Park and the Fairfax Creek. Um, we're gonna give a very brief uh, um, uh, presentation from Eric Stromberg of Restoration Design Group. We're gonna talk a little bit about the creek and, and, and um, what we've kind of talked about. And we just wanna make sure that we come before the council and the community, let people know what we're considering before we move too far and then have somebody come back and say, you know, what, what were you thinking? So first, we're just going to have a, a we're going to talk a little bit about the park and, and we're going to have a presentation um, about, you know, adding a fence uh, along the, the edges of the creek. And then we're going to talk about a couple of other concepts that we have for that area, including a, a new trash um, debris rack and, and maybe some other improvements to the to shoreline. So we'll get into that um, uh, and, and go into that. And I really want to uh, say thank you to Eric Stromberg, who's here with us tonight. Um, we may have some stuff for you to talk about. I'll jump through this report and then uh, Eric can talk a little bit more about the details of what we're considering. But what we are trying to do is present to the council and the community some of the concepts that we have, make sure that we understand what it is that the folks would like to see here. And if everyone is okay with it on the council, we'll continue on to the next steps. So Michelle, if you can uh, bring up the Perry Park and Fairfax Creek Fence Protection and Concept. I just want to mention that Fairfax is, um, Eric is one of our Fairfax residents. So um, he's he's a real asset to our town. Yeah, that's uh, sorry, I didn't have my microphone close to me. I met Eric uh, as a result of um, the project over at 145 Canyon uh, that RDG is working on obtaining our um, fish and wildlife permits. And as we were talking, you know, the some other concepts and ideas about Fairfax Creek that I brought up um, 
you know, we had that discussion and then he had some ideas too. So it, it has been a really nice relationship to create. So I've been very excited about that. And uh, I want to, again, thank him for coming out late and, and, and talking with us. Uh, so uh, what we have here is, a, if we go to the first slide, please. We have kind of an aerial view of Perry Park and uh, the Fairfax Creek, and uh, we'll go on to the next slide in just a second. But the intention right now is just to kind of talk about a uh, protection fence. And this fence is meant to be, you know, a split rail fence. I have some examples of what it'll look like. But the idea behind the fence is to create kind of a protective buffer zone for the creek. You know, concerns have been brought up by the community about um, um, the creek, you know, being damaged by human use or by pollution or pollutants. And so the idea that we have here behind this fence is to create a, a visual barrier, if you will, that will inform the public of, hey, this is a creek. Maybe you don't want to go all the way into it if you don't have to, but we don't want to make it so restrictive that people can't enjoy the benefits of that creek because there are probably many people in this community who played in that creek as children and who have children today um, who play in that creek. So I brought my laser pointer to show um, what we're considering. And we're thinking about, you know, you can see here, here's the playground here in this lower corner. Um, the corporation yard is over here. The idea behind the split rail fence is that we would follow in general the contour of the slope on the um, Sir Francis Drake side of the creek. You know, as any many of you know, it's much higher than the elevation of the creek itself. So the idea would be, you know, designing a fence that somehow follows along this length here. And there's a couple of benefits for that. Um, it's very steep in a couple of locations. And if you're not paying attention, you could potentially fall down about 20 or 30 feet. There's some erosion that we're going to show some pictures of as well. The other um, side of the fence is over on the playground side. We would, you know, tie it into the existing playground fencing, run it along again, you know, the the edge of the creek, and this would create a buffer zone for the the creek itself. And within these zones here, you know, we're anticipating being able to do some, you know, new vegetation, um, uh, encouraging growth, um, protecting this area for habitat. You know, right here is a bench. We'd be adding some interpretive signage along that fence line that would be not only educating the community about why the fence is there, but, you know, some of the benefits of having the creek. We haven't come up with that language, but the idea would be to alert people of like why it's important to stay on this side of the fence rather than go in there. But at the same time, you know, leaving some gaps in there so that people can go down there, um, that animals can make it. Uh, if you go to the next picture of uh, slide, please. The idea is to put a split rail fence. So it's certainly not a security fence. There's no barbed wire. It's not six feet tall, a chain link. You know, it's not gonna keep out anything. This bunny is definitely gonna be able to get through it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll leave some gaps open for it. So if uh, other animals wanna get through that or even people who wanna get in there and, and enjoy the creek responsible, they can do so. Uh, if you could go to the next one. So just to give you a kind of an idea of what's going on with the creek, and we'll go back to that other drawing in just a second, but um, during the storms, we received a significant amount of erosion here. You can see this is a picture that was taken uh, soon after I started, which is about six months ago. And you can see this area here of, of, of soil. And if you zoom in, you'll see that there's the remains of an old terrace fence and uh, there's some tree stuff here. This is after the storm that we just recently had. And this, this area of log and, and, and trunk was up here. And so it's actively being degraded. And we'll go back and Eric can talk a little bit about that. But I just wanted to make sure that you saw this picture that erosion can sometimes happen very quickly. It's not something that just happens very slowly. Um, if you can go to the next one, please. So, we're going to show you this picture now. Everyone is familiar with this area. This is underneath Town Hall right here. We do have a trash capture kind of device here. There are some steel posts that are here that capture, capture this debris, and it comes rushing down, and it gets stuck here. And staff has to go in after storms and try to figure out how to get down this slope to get that material. It's very hard and very difficult to get that. Um, and so, if Michelle, if you can go back to the drawing, which is the aerial, Another one back, another one back. 
So, you know, the area that I showed you of that erosion is kind of right in this area, I believe. And um, there's some another spots that are over here that are eroding as well. And I touched on the trash capture area. You know, having the debris that comes down the creek every storm and actually making it to the town hall um, is is not ideal because that's where we've had flooding in the structure before. And so what uh, Eric and I have talked about is creating a little trash capture area here, further upstream on the creek, still within the town property and putting something along here where we can grab some of that material before it comes down and strikes the building. Um, and this area has a little bit further of a, you know, better slope area. So we can actually drive you know, our excavator and get close to here a little bit better than we can currently. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and, and let Eric kind of talk on that. But the ideas that we're looking at for tonight is, you know, approval to continue kind of researching the layout of this fence. Um, and then for us to continue having discussions about, you know, potential trash capture area here and doing some remediation of these slopes. Any work in the creek certainly is going to require permits from Fish and Wildlife, um, but there are, are also lots of grant funding for this type of local hazard mitigation. Um, so um, I will now give to Eric and and let him take it from here. And hopefully uh, um, I didn't say anything wrong. No, that was good. Uh, thank you. And actually, I haven't really pre uh, prepared a presentation as much. I know it's going to be a long evening, but I'm here kind of as a resource to answer questions. Uh, I do think most of you guys know me, but just in case you don't, I am a Fairfax resident, landscape architect, principal restoration design group. This is the type of project that I focus on as my career. So it's really fun to kind of do it in my backyard where my kids and, and I have played in this area and I pay attention to it. So um, it was great when Lauren kind of came on, as he mentioned, was working in 145 Canyon, uh, working to get that permitted and some of the planting done for that project. And then we just start talking about other ideas and this immediately came up. I also happen to be on the San Jacinto Flood Committee, so very much involved with Ross Valley flooding, paying attention to uh, the politics and the processes that are involved with this community flooding. Uh, and I also live in the flood zone, so um, I kind of hit it from all angles. So I think we covered the gist of the project here. There's a lot to be, this is kind of a first iteration of just what could be. Uh, I think it's a good time to kind of get it out in front of the community of, of what some opportunities are. Um, I can do a much bigger, more exciting presentation later of the details and opportunities, but I think what we're looking at essentially is, is what Lauren mentioned, which is we have an asset. It's a, one of the best parts of, of Fairfax and per, certainly Perry Park is this creek. We want to enhance it. Um, there's some logistics and utility issues of the trash rack. What we have now is not working. It's dangerous. It, that's where flooding our town starts with the trash rack we saw, right? just right here, Town Hall. Um, anything we can do to improve that bottleneck is gonna really help all of Fairfax. Um, and so the idea, which one, one element Lauren did mention here is that adding a trash rack in a creek is hard to permit. There's impacts here. You're, you're putting infrastructure in a creek, which the regulatory agencies would prefer you not to do. There's a lot of opportunity here because our creek is not in the best condition. There's a lot we can do to enhance it. So um, the thought was, Let's combine that with actually creating floodplains. So the two, there's kind of two point bars, if you will, that are vegetated, that one there. And if you go down that one there, if you walk down there, you'll see they're about six feet high above the channel right now. So they're basically perched, they're historic floodplains. The creek is incised. They don't flood very much during this winter at all. They didn't flood. The, the point bar that all the kids play on that flooded, but everything else is really high. So we're not getting flood storage at that elevation. And the plants that are growing there are not riparian plants because they're just perched up high. So there's an opportunity to actually, and we do this all the time for our projects, our urban restoration projects, which I work on, is to lower that floodplain uh, and then plant it with riparian vegetation. So we're actually creating better habitat. There's water quality benefits. There's just bird avian benefits. Um, it behaves like a creek, There's, again, for water quality, not only with the creek itself, but water that's draining from the um, even the streets, it's the school street, there's an opportunity which isn't expressed here that we can even take some of that stormwater and incorporate it. Um, and then the other thing we're doing is by lowering that floodplain, when we do get a storm, we're actually storing a, a little bit of stormwater. Um, it's not going to solve our flooding problems, but the, it's nothing, there's no one project that's going to solve flooding, it's going to be a lot of these small little interventions. 
Uh, so there's a little bit of incremental benefit we can do. I haven't modeled that yet. We're not at that stage. This is just kind of coming up with ideas. It may not even be expressed in a model at all, maybe for like the, so right now we're flooding. Oh, are we going to interrupt? Or do you have a question? No. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Collier. I thought you were going to say something. So, uh, so uh, one thing I was going to mention is right now, the town um, floods around the five to 10 year event. So it floods frequently. The detention basin is just added that improves things to be closer to about the 10 year recurrence interval. On average, we should flood and it's still all statistics. These little interventions we can do can actually increase that a little bit more. So it's let we're a little bit less likely to flood. So if we were to do this in a lot of locations, we'll see benefit. Um, so I think that's probably good enough for now. If you have questions, Lauren, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Yeah, again, as I mentioned, you know, we want to make sure that we bring these types of projects, you know, to the community and to the council so that they can, you know, see um, what we're trying to do to build resiliency within this community. And, you know, part of uh, my role as the public works director is to work with local hazard mitigation um, and is to identify projects that, you know, will help this community be more resilient. Our town hall, fire station, police station, um, the community center, uh, the corporation yard are all within the flood zone. And so, you know, things like identifying you know, opportunities here and also trying to just improve, as you pointed out, the assets of the community is why we come up here. Um, and we just wanted to make sure that we're you know, moving in the right direction. Uh, and in particular, with, you know, right now we're at a point where we can move forward with the fencing. It doesn't require a lot of permitting, um, but we want to make sure that that's something that the community understands that we're trying to take an eye um, keep an eye on and, and try to improve the community. So that's why we're here. And thank you very much, Eric. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, any questions? Okay. Well, okay. Can I ask a quick one? Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a discussion about um, sort of renovating that park and planting new redwood trees and whatnot. And um, I think there were reasons why that couldn't happen then, but does this have any tie in with that idea? Uh, yeah, it certainly does. Um, I think Lauren has mentioned that, you know, it's all tied together, the, the park, the creek and the redwoods, um, the play area. So uh, it does make sense to look at things kind of holistically. And even when I'm just focusing on the creek, I'm kind of thinking about the opportunities. Um, and we've we've certainly been talking about the redwoods and what could be entertained there. Part of the with the repairing area, there's an opportunity with that lower floodplain I mentioned to actually plant redwoods in there. And that's a better elevation for redwoods when they are right now. Um, so there's, uh, there's lots of ideas we can kind of discuss. And, and to that, you know, in, in the conversations that we've had, we've also involved, uh, um, uh, Ray Moritz. And so he's aware that we're trying to figure this out. And he has some ideas about trying to capture stormwater to um, use that in a passive way to water those redwoods and to capture that that runs down Park Street and goes into a storm drain and then goes into the the creek, but try to, you know, see what we can do to capture water and bring it into the park. Um, I've brought it up to uh, folks at Mixstop, which is Marin County Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program. If there are ways that we can take stormwater and bring it into the park and um, use the park or use other kind of means to um, treat that water by basically having it, you know, filter through the soil or percolate through the soil and capture that rather than having it go directly into the storm drain, that's also a benefit to our stormwater permits. So there's a lot of pieces here. There's a lot of, you know, uh, folks um, that would be involved in it. This is certainly not something that we're going to get done in the next six months. You know, this is something that as we start moving forward, we're going to start, you know, engaging different agencies, trying to find the benefits of, of you know, um, you know, will Mixstop have money available for us on this? Will there be other agencies that would be able to help us out with this? You know, because it is close to a creek, we likely have to engage with, you know, agencies, certainly like Fish and Wildlife, but possibly even the Federated Indians at Great and Rancheria. So lots of pieces, but you know, before we get too far and then come back and have you be surprised at what we're doing, that's why we're here. Great. So I understand we're mostly doing the split rail fence, but um, I'm just excited that this will be a future conversation because that initial discussion um, sparks so much excitement amongst people in the community and, you know, people from all kinds of different angles were like super excited about it. And it is the centerpiece of our town. 
um, in so many ways in terms of recreation and enjoyment, but also the fact that we can um, protect it and make it sort of a centerpiece of restoration and also like good water management and what have you is, is really wonderful. So very excited about it. And we'll have more conversations in the future, I'm sure. Thank you. And I think what um, in the reason we didn't plant those redwood trees at the time was because that was the middle of the drought. So your idea of it trying, yours and Lauren's ideas about trying to incorporate that all together to hopefully that would water the trees more than having to do a lot of watering sounds really wonderful. And I'm glad you're involved, Eric, and you got Ray involved and Lauren. Good mix. Um, one quick question. Uh, so in addition to the sort of split rail fencing, um, the, the plantings or uh, any of that work that's being done um, or, or mentioning the height changing heights for some of those banks right there, is that sort of contouring or those are those plantings, do they, will they trigger permitting for U.S. Fish and Wildlife or things like that? Yeah, and I don't want to conflate kind of this, the split rail fence, which is just a smaller thing that I think is really what we're mainly talking about today, but we're also kind of excited about something more Big than vision. split rail, which is something later. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is a bigger project that requires permits. There's a lot of grant funding out there. Almost all of my projects are grant funded. Um, and this, I just, this is very much a fundable project, which is nice because we can get a trash capture device to be funded through this process because it is a net benefit. There's no doubt about it. Once everyone sees the whole package, they'll like it. Um, but that's a bigger project. That'll take time. We have to go after grants. We have to do a lot of designing and engineering. All that permitting agencies want to have all the answers. So mm -hmm. it Got it. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. And this is extremely exciting. Um, we'll open up public comment on this item. Uh, Brett Gager here. <clears throat> As a former chair of the Fairfax Park and Recreation Commission a long time ago, uh, I, I do continue to keep an eye on, on our parks and our own. Fencing is the least of the problems with Perry Park, and your staff tonight showed you what's going on. Up until tonight, no one has even addressed the huge creek erosion problems that have been going on for over a year there. Pavilion Hill is falling into the creek. Trees that held the bank, the root system are all showing. The bank has been undercut. It has created a dangerous condition for park users and for those urban campers adjacent to the slide. There's also a liability issue for Fairfax. Technically, Fairfax is a landlord of those urban campers. Should a massive slide occur in the next storm and one of them be injured, we will be liable. A Gabion type structure, not concrete, is needed to hold those banks up. That should actually take precedent of the fencing. I think we've got to stabilize the banks first. We'll also have to address for Fairfax Creek, the fisheries too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, Todd Greenberg once again. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's so nice to have somebody local involved that cares about the place. And it's evident that both you and Lauren have uh, put in some good thought to this, but I wanna make it a little bit more clear in the ecosystem that is going on. There's a lot of consideration and some good planning going on, but as Frank touched on, there's a big elephant in this room and it's not being addressed. And it's the precipitating cause of that erosion. The flora is being trampled on and skidded down 
and the creek is being polluted and this town council has done nothing to find other housing for those people. We, by non-action, are costing this town incredible amounts of money. This needs to get taken care of. It's been complained by many people. I know it's a very sensitive issue and my heart goes out to anyone having any difficulties. But this town needs to find temporary housing for those people so that the creek is not eroded because now you're looking at spending town funds that you wouldn't have had to spend otherwise. And you're looking at restricting use of the area that benefits everybody for one special group. This should not be happening. Please think about the whole ecosystem here. Think about what the precipitating cause is and find a solution that takes into account everything. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Bell, Dominga, Fairfax. Um, the homeless encampment, I thought they were gonna have a chemical toilet like six months ago. What happened to that? You know, I mean, there are some simple things that can be done, I understand it you know, having to deal with the bureaucracy of like being in a shelter and feeling restricted or being restricted, uh, you know, isn't what somebody wants to go through. Well, if that's the case and you're going to let them stay where they are, a chemical toilet, an outdoor room, like an outdoor tent room, those don't cost too much rent a dumpster so that the, you know, belongings or whatever they've attracted that got wrecked in the rains can be tossed into them. That's the area that needs to be cleaned up. If, if nothing else, if you can't find some other way to, um, you know, get the people who were there to move, then at least provide, th that's a minimum that the town can provide and it's not gonna cost a lot of money because, you know, people are fed up with drop human waste all over the place on the ground going into the water. People won't take their dogs up there. People won't walk over there. So you don't really need, you don't need to have a fence because nobody's going there because they don't want to, they don't want to get ill. Who wants to get, who wants to take their dog for a walk and end up with hepatitis? You know, supposedly the town council was going to deal with this months ago, and for the reports that I get, it's not happening. How much does a chemical toilet cost to put up there? Can't be that much. Rent a dumpster. How much does that cost? Buy a buy a tent, like a you know, like a twelve by twelve tent. How much does that cost? At least do something. Otherwise, you know that you know the project sounds okay, though I think the fence is not really that good of an idea. It's not going to really do anything. But dealing with the erosion and stuff is fine. But let's look at the real problem, as Todd said. Thank you. Are there any folks on Zoom, Michelle? Yes. Um, Deborah Benson is first, followed by Patrice, followed by Mallory. Deborah, you're unmuted now. Um, hi, Deborah Benson. I live here in Fairfax. Um, the the debris rack idea sounds good. Ditch the fence. Um, the fence seems to be a solution to the problem of the uh, the unhoused people polluting the creek and the the residents uh, protesting that. And this seems like a, a further restriction on the residents rather than on the unhoused people. Uh, 
you know, I have memories of my kid down at that creek. It's a natural, a natural area. It's lovely to be able to walk down to the water and look at the water and surround it by a fence is, I think, a travesty. Uh, there was an article in the paper today about Sausalito and uh, they're talking about their underground Willow Creek and bringing it up to daylight and how important that was to the town and the people and the environmental experience for the kids and the whole community. And here we're talking about kind of downlighting our creek and, and taking it away from its natural, its natural state. Um, I was I was uh, a member, I am a member of the tree committee, and sometime last fall, I believe it was the uh fire people, uh, it's right after Heather started, I think, um, went around the pavilion. I asked for Ray Moritz to be involved in this, in this walk to clear underbrush and some trees. So I was present, Ray was present. We uh, got to the tree, the bay tree, where most of the furniture is, where the, the uh, unhoused resident, residents are staying. And um, Ray said that that tree was a liability. Oh, first of all, they were asked to move their belongings for this walk around, and they did not. And Ray said that that tree was a hazard and a liability to the town, and most of the spurs or the spars needed to come out. Uh, that still hasn't happened. So I'm not sure what we are doing as a town. We seem to be. Uh, uh, giving more credence to these these unhoused residents than to our own residents and um something needs to be done i don't know maybe find another place to offer them and uh, as mark said maybe some tents i mean that's what sausalito did uh, find an, another place maybe by the corporation yard on the concrete it, it's a really nice place to camp i'm sure right above our creek but it's it's causing our residents a loss of assets. And I don't know what's gonna happen with the summer camps. I wouldn't want my kids to be gone there near the pavilion. Anyway, I know I'm out of time. So thank you. And um, that's all. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Patrice followed by Mallory. Patrice, you're unmuted now. Hi there. Uh... I live on Merwin Avenue. We flood every heavy rainstorm. I'm very glad that Eric Stromberg is involved in this because I know how passionate he is and he's in a floodplain. I'm in a floodplain. Um, I just don't understand what a fence is gonna do. Uh, it, it, it doesn't prevent flooding. It doesn't prevent uh, the feces going into the water from the unhoused. W what are we trying to do? Like, I think that we should be looking at, again, the citizens of Fairfax and not just the politics or the optics of um, putting up a fence. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Mallory, and you're unmuted now. I think. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes? OK. Yes. Um, first, I just want to, it feels like a complete breath of fresh air to have people from Fairfax coming in to uh, be, I don't know if you're consultants or what, but I'm so happy you guys are here and that you're local. It, it just, I, I can exhale a little bit at this meeting. I, I don't understand what takes precedence here. Is it, maybe somebody just a quick yes or no, is it illegal for people to sleep at night in the park? And is it illegal for people to litter? Can anybody answer that question? Are you allowed to? Hello? 
chance. We're not however. doing an interactive session. You just need to provide your comments. Please. All right. Well, well, I I think it's illegal for people to sleep at night in the park, and I think it's I'm pretty sure it's pretty illegal to uh, people to litter, and the homeless people are doing both of these things, and I you know I. I, I agree with what Frank said. I agree with what Tom said and pretty much everybody else. Um, I don't, un it's a beautiful little fence, but I don't understand what the, what it's gonna do. Kids can go through it, crap can go through it. The homeless people can go through it if they wanna go do their thing in the, in the creek. And, it, and I like, I mean, it's not a bad looking fence, but it's gonna do nothing. And I don't wanna see a metal fence either. Because that would just be horrible, um, and I and so I don't know actually what we're putting the fence up for. I don't think it's going to keep the the land from going landing into the into the creek either. So um, you know, so I I don't know how it how would this help, and um, how is this a solution to anything? And the problem aside from the Reaganomics is that we have people who are, um, you know, homeless and some are not mentally capable, and they sh and and making life much harder for people here who are paying taxes or even not paying taxes but are enjoying the the park. So let's address how we can legally do that. We have a lawyer; maybe she could figure it out, but. Um, what what takes precedence? Is it precedence to um, to to have people litter and sleep in the park at night, or um, to allow them to do that? So I would like that to be figured out, and then we can decide whether we want a fence or not. Because that's that's putting a band aid over something that we have to address. That's way bigger than what needs a band aid. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Um, there are no further raised hands. Okay, we'll close public comment on this item and um, take it back to council here. I believe this was just um, sort of for us to hear this presentation and give direction to staff and just receive this information. So um, I guess the question is, is there anything further, Lauren, that you need from the council this evening? Uh, I think that the... the um, what we would like to get from the council in some manner with, you know, out it being too formal is um, this sounds good. We like what you're doing, you know, continue return back to us when you have more information. Um, you know, as a, just an aside, I do want to talk a little bit about you know how, what the fence and kind of its purpose and, and kind of, you know, I understand that, you know, the, this, the fence is not a, a significant barrier to entry. Um, what I look at it as is similar to you know, what we did in Sausalito at Dunphy Park, where we installed a fence along the estuary there, and it was intended to, you know, create that visual buffer for folks so that, you know, the birds and the other animals that use that area, you know, felt like they were protected and people, you know, could enjoy um, seeing that from the side of the fence. You know, my, my father lives up in Mendocino and along the headlands, you'll see these types of fences a lot. And they're there not only to create, you know, protective zones um, from the edge of the shoreline, but also to, you know, tell people this is a, a an area that we're trying to to restore habitat. And lots of people respect those fences, even though they might be a single post with a piece of rope in between them. They do create a barrier. It's not meant to be you know, uh, something that keeps people out, certainly can't do that. Um, but it is just to say, hey, you know, this would be better for you to stay on this side. If you go through there, that's okay. But the more we can reduce impact on those locations, the better um, the, the creek and the habitat will thrive. Um, but we certainly don't want to remove the enjoyment of the creek for the community. We're simply trying to, you know, create these areas in which, you know, people can enjoy. We can put signage up that explains why it's important. There are health reasons for the creek as well. When it's flowing, you know, there's it's it's fresher water. If it starts to get low flow, you know, pollutants will collect over time. And so, you know, there's lots of opportunities for for using this to um, inform the community. Um, without trying to make it obtrusive and remove such a 
you know, beautiful asset for the folks. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. I just, uh, for folks that are wondering, you know, I think it's, there's quite a bit of literature, both academic and great literature about the the benefits of such visual cues. I mean, even, you know, when you're hiking on a trail and there's a clear trail, of course you can walk wherever you want, but so many of us just stay on the trail, right? Visual cues are quite powerful and this fence is no different. I think I could speak probably for most people on the council in saying that we want to reduce overall pollution into our creeks. And the other thing is we want to create the opportunity for nature to rebound and to have all of these myriad benefits that Eric so eloquently touched on as far as flood mitigation, getting the funding to actually move this trash collection further up to protect our town assets closer to the fire department, um, police department, and town hall. So I think there, there are a lot of benefits, and this is just the first step in figuring out how we cordon off this particular area for vegetated habitat, for wildlife habitat, for erosion control, for making sure people understand with that visual cue what Mixstop told us in August, which is a lot of people think, oh, nature, there's a creek, you can go in it, you can have recreational contact. And unfortunately, the reality is in the vast majority of our, our water bodies in suburban, semi-urban areas, even rural areas with agriculture, it's not really good for, for uh, recreational contact or for, for human contact for a long duration of time. Um, it's not good for pets or kids either. So I think we, we're not trying to, um, you know, encourage that sort of behavior throughout the water bodies. And, and we do want to get people out of the creeks to the best of our ability. And this, this fence is just one step in that direction. So thanks for bringing this forward, Lauren um, and Eric. Thank you so much for sort of all these contributions, but also the bigger vision that you were laying out there for a moment. It's exciting to move in that direction for the park out here. Um, any other comments from colleagues? I just say what you just said is exactly the point and this is what we talked about i guess back months ago and i think the visual cue and how it fits with our park and we don't want to encourage people to be scrambling down those banks which will cause more erosion so i i like it i'm glad eric's involved i'm glad lauren you have followed up on this with eric and with ray so i think it's going to be a really nice addition to our park and like the mayor says, it's the visual cue, cue. And as you said, to remind people that you shouldn't be really playing in that creek. Doesn't matter. It's it's an urban creek, and it's got pollutants and all, which is what mixed up covered for us. So I think it's good to go. Yeah, I I agree, and I think the educational. Um, component of it will be really important because I know a lot of people move to Fairfax because they want to commune with nature and they love that they're, you know, there's a, we've got a redwood grove in the middle of the town. It's wonderful and everything. Um, but I think sometimes people don't know that, um, especially for riparian areas, human contact is really devastating. And so if there's a way we can enjoy it, but also protect it and restore it, um, that would be really good. And I think just ha having a lot of educational material that explains to people, since we're getting these questions tonight, like, why would we have this fence here? Um, that that's really what it's about. Like, you know, it's to, the best way to live in harmony with nature is to give it a little bit of breathing room. Um, so I'm all for it. And I also just want to mention that we have had contamination in the creek for a long time. Um, I think I've lived here for like 12 years now, and we've got like E. coli in the summer long before we had, you know, urban campers or what have you. Um, because there's lots of other things going on with the creek besides those folks. Excellent. Yeah. And I'm, I'm absolutely excited about it, all in favor of it. I think it's, it's a great concept. Um, and I think with the, the fence concept, it's, you clearly said that there would be gaps in the fence. It's not like someone would have to climb over the fence in order to get into it. It would it would be possible to explore. It's just, it's basically, as, as Mayor Catrano said, a, a visual cue. That's kind of what it is. And I think it would be really beautiful. Thanks, it's, it's a very nice design. Split rail fences are, are very pretty. So um, yeah, if you can, I don't know whether you would need to, to at least design some of the other work before you put some of the fencing in, 
places where you're going to lower the banks it, it in the future, possibly. Uh, but in any case, that's that's on the design end, and we don't need to discuss it now. But I love the concept. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, Eric, um, for your contributions as well. We are um, past 1130, um, and our agenda here says any matter not started by 1130 um, will need to be continued or to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend this rule. So can I get a motion to suspend this I'll, rule? I'll make a motion to suspend the 1130 rule. Do the second? Okay, I'll second it. Thank you. Motion Kohler, second Blash. Can we get a roll call? Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yes. Council Member Blash. Yes. Mayor Cutrano. Yes. And that's for eyes and Council Member Hellman is absent. Great. Motion passes. Motion passes. Four oh. Thank you very much. And on to item 13, last but not least, Mr. Yura. Good evening. Good evening, Council, and thank you for agreeing to uh, continue with this item. Um, and we also amazingly have uh, Dana Armanino from the County Sustainability staff that's somehow still awake as well. So um, I will promise to try to power through this quickly um, and then leave some time for, for some questions. All right, the uh, main topic of my presentation tonight will focus on the proposed foodware ordinance that if adopted would repeal and replace the town's existing foodware ordinance. On October 2nd, 2019, uh, the town council adopted ordinance 838 to require food vendors in the town to provide compostable and or reusable foodware for both dine-in and takeout. The ordinance imposed similar requirements on town purchases and town sponsored events. Around the same time, the county began its foodware ordinance development process, but that was soon halted due to the impacts of the pandemic. Their development work resumed in May 2021 and continued over the course of a year, which included extensive community outreach and a grant program that I'll discuss later. The county's ordinance was adopted in May of last year and enforcement begins November 10th of this year. I'm going to go through these these next two slides quickly because I think you're all aware of, of why a foodware ordinance like this is important, especially with the town's existing foodware ordinance. Um, but some statistics, more recent statistics, is that just in Marin County, consumption of single-use waste is estimated to have skyrocketed 250 to 300 percent during the pandemic as um, many stores switched back to single-use plastics. And we've all probably heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch about twice the size of Texas where these plastics we use break down to microplastics and can harm marine life through ingestion of these plastics or from the harmful pollutants that leach out of plastics when they break down. Um, more recent studies have also found microplastics in the bloodstream of 80% of people tested and may lodge in Oregon. So it's literally in our, our bloodstreams now. So there's a health risk. Uh, to the continual accumulation of plastics in our environment, besides just the impacts to um, to animal life and and marine life, uh, um, one important consideration consideration of of the proposed uh, foodware ordinance um, is that it would level the playing field for food vendors across the county by adopting the same requirements, ensuring consistent enforcement, and minimizing confusion for consumers and food service providers. Um, adoption of this proposed ordinance um, would also assist the town and local businesses in complying with recently adopted state leg legislation focused on waste reduction. There's been quite a few that have been adopted in recent years, including AB 1200, 1201, 1276, and 827 that all have to do with uh, waste reduction efforts. Um, and I wanted clarify that the town's existing foodware ordinance is also in compliance with those state regulations, um, but the, the county's ordinance uh, would, would um, con continue that um, compliance. 
Um, so, so, you know, there's there's a lot to gain from um, a food war ordinance like this, and I just want to um, point out a couple measures in the, the town's adopted climate action plan that specifically reference this. So, um, in the climate action plan, um, it it calls for requiring use of reusable containers, packaging, and foodware in lieu of single use uh, plastic materials and recyclable materials by 2025 educating and enforcing um, the single use foodware reduction ordinance. Again, that's the town's existing ordinance across commercial institutions with the goal of elimination of single use plastic by 2023 um, and enforcing state laws requiring waste elimination activities by commercial establishments. Um, so the proposed ordinance supports the town's zero waste and environmental goals by reducing use of single use plastic foodware in the town. Also numerous case studies have uh, conducted by Rethink Disposables and other organizations have shown switching from disposables to reusables can save businesses money. The examples on this slide just show the types of foodware and food, foodware accessories that would be subject to the ordinance. Um, as defined in the ordinance, foodware uh, means all containers, bowls, plates, food trays, cups, lids, et cetera, um, that are used for prepared foods. And this includes for takeout foods um, and then foodware accessories means uh, items uh, provide alongside prepared food, um, including but not limited to forks, spoons, knives, chopsticks, napkins, et cetera. So these are the, the key features of the ordinance. Um, it would apply to all uh, food vendors um, except public or private school cafeterias. Um, food vendor is defined as a restaurant, bar, grocery store, deli, bakery, food service establishment, food truck, uh, farmer's market, um, and, and so on as defined in the ordinance that sells prepared, prepared food to be consumed on and or off the uh, premises located or operating within the town. Um, the specific requirements include takeout disposal foodware must be natural fiber compostable, um, so no bioplastics. Um, or compostable plastics. Uh, takeout foodware must be certified by the Biodegradable Products Institute or BPI. Um, aluminum is allowed. Reusable foodware and utensils must be used if a customer is dining in at a restaurant and natural fiber compostable accessories can be provided upon request. Continuing on with the key features of the ordinance, um, takeout foodware accessories must be natural fiber compostable and available only upon request or at a self-service uh, takeout station. Food vendors shall provide uh, plastic straws only on request to accommodate any person's medical needs. All food vendors shall charge uh, customers 25 cents at the point of sale for every non-reusable cup provided. Income from, the, uh, from this charge would be retained by the food vendor. Uh, and there are exemptions available for CalFresh and the California Special Supplemental Food Program for women, infants, and children, or WIC customers. All food vendors who provide solid waste containers for customer use must provide separate receptacles for solid waste, recyclables, and organics. Receptacles must have uh, graphic-rich signage. This is a requirement of state laws AB 827 and SB 1383 and would enable customers and employees to properly sort waste. So a little bit about the all the stakeholder engagement that the county conducted. Um, it was quite an extensive outreach, including development of a technical assistance and grant program, creation of a website with draft ordinance materials and resources, distribution of community and business surveys, and hosting a variety of meetings and workshops. Um, and this is all summarized um, in the attachment to the staff report. These materials and means were available to all businesses and residents in the county, including the town. Outreach materials, including the surveys, were provided in both Spanish and English, and solicited business types included restaurants, bars, convenience, convenience markets, and, and other um, types of businesses. Based on the survey results, food vendors didn't think, did not think it would be difficult to switch to reusables for dine-in, and over 50% of businesses supported the disposable cup charge. 91% of residents surveyed in the county also supported requiring food vendors to use foodware that is either reusable or compostable, and 79% supported the disposable cup charge. 
while there can be life cycle cost savings from switching to reusable foodware materials and research has shown that fiber-based disposable foodware um, items are cost competitive with plastic options, there can still be initial cost research and transition to compliant materials. And this could have an impact on smaller food, food vendors. So in 2021, Marin County uh, offered a free technical assistance and grant program open to all businesses in the in the county, both incorporated and unincorporated areas to assist with the transition. The current county project has existing funding available to develop outreach materials and tools to assist food vendors with the transition. And limited county funding is also available to provide a grant program, which could focus on small businesses that may need additional assistance with the transition. And Plastic Free Marin um, also has $600 grants available to assist businesses in this transition. This slide just shows some examples of the types of outreach materials the county has created and are re readily available on their foodware ordinance webpage that has lots of great information. The proposed foodware ordinance would take a proactive approach via the county's environmental health division by educating all retail food facility owners regu regularly of the requirements of the proposed ordinance and taking enforcement action only as necessary. This has the potential to result in greater overall levels of compliance, to allow for fair competition among food vendors and to have the benefit of staying power because there would be regular education and outreach on an annual basis. The Environmental Health Services Division is in a unique position to provide this proactive outreach during already scheduled visits to businesses as a part of its food program. If adopted, staff would still plan to conduct outreach to affected businesses through the development of a foodware webpage on the town website and distributing information about the ordinance and how to comply in the town newsletters, flyers, and mailers. In preparation for this ordinance being considered by the council, staff did email and hand deliver letters to all Fairfax food vendors, informing them about this proposed ordinance discussion and, inf and inform residents and businesses about this discussion in the town newsletter. Enforcement of the proposed food war ordinance would begin, as I mentioned, November 10, 2023. Um, this gives, would give businesses time to switch sourcing of supplies and deplete existing stock. Enforcement will include written notice of non-compliance and a reasonable opportunity to correct prior to issuance of any penalty. EHS may grant a waiver for undue hardship to a food vendor that receives the citation penalty for non-compliance. Should foodware or foodware accessories made of compliant compostable natural fiber not be commercially available, as determined by the EHS director, the county may approve a temporary exemption of specific non-reusable foodware or accessory items until they are made commercially available on behalf of the town. The county will maintain a list updated annually with foodware and food, foodware accessories deemed not available commercially. This list is already available on the county's foodware webpage. The one-time um, enforcement fee for the town would be waived if the ordinance is adopted by May 10th of this year. So last slide here, um, as mentioned in the staff report, staff has conducted a thorough comparison of the town's existing foodware ordinance and the county's foodware ordinance. In staff's judgment, the differences between both ordinances are for the most part minor, with most of the differences being in how terms are defined. However, one provision in the town's ordinance that isn't in the county ordinance is a pro prohibition on the sale of polystyrene foam coolers and ice chests. Uh, to address this and ensure this provision is maintained, staff recommends moving section 8.72.080A of the current town code regarding the prohibition on the sale of polystyrene foam coolers and ice chests within the town to section 8.16.030C with other regulations for polystyrene packaging, which is the purpose of the first ordinance that was attached to staff report for introduction. Um, the second recommendation is to introduce the reusable foodware ordinance to replace the town's existing foodware ordinance under chapter 8.72 in its entirety. And the last recommendation is to authorize the town manager to execute the agreement between the county and town regarding enforcement of the foodware ordinance. And one quick note about this agreement, um, this sub was subsequent conversations with the county council, they did agree to allow the following language in the agreement between the town and county in regards to indemnification, uh, which 
states as follows, the county shall indemnify, hold harmless, release, and defend town, its officers, agents, and employees from any and all liability, actions, claims, damages, costs, or expenses, including attorney's fees and the costs and expenses of suit, which may be asserted by any complaint arising in any respect out of county's negligent or intentional acts or omissions arising under or related to this agreement. Basically, a reciprocal indemnification clause would be added to section seven of the agreement that the town manager and attorney would sign if authorized by the council. That concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Sean. And one quick question before all the other questions spring up. So just understanding the overarching theme or the, the point of this. So our 2019 ordinance, this is basically um, taking that as a model, the county took it and they said, we like this, we wanna do this and make this uniform. And we will actually do the enforcement of your ordinance, which the town given our structure wasn't set up to really do the enforcement of this ordinance. And they said, we would charge a fee um, to, to do that enforcement. However, if you agree to opt into this by a date certain, we'll actually waive that fee and we'll just do the enforcement for you. That, that's basically the overarching theme of this, right? With a, a couple little tweaks, obviously, to the polystyrene stuff, and we have to move that around. But that's is that generally that's, right? Yes, that's exactly correct. And in addition to enforcement, as I mentioned, they also would do annual outreach and education. And they have a, uh, they've already set up kind of a technical assistance program. They can provide assistance to businesses that um, are, are needing that additional assistance to make this transition. Um, from my conversations with talking to some of the, the businesses, especially when I met with them in person, some of the managers, a lot of them are already using reusables or compostables. Um, and so it would really be more for those business, businesses that maybe aren't and, and like smaller businesses that might need that additional assistance. So they can also provide um, that as, as part of this. And, and the assistance is both just to clarify the the like buyer's guide that they update annually with the types of products that meet what, what the needs of the ordinance are in addition to um, like financial assistance potentially and just have, having a, a point of contact with folks at the county, right? I mean, there, there are a handful of different things that make up that technical assistance, right? Right, yeah. So it's it's everything from the outreach materials that they provide and the signage. So, you know, businesses don't have to spend extra costs on that, on developing anything that would all be um, provided to uh, more like hands-on, like, helping them, um, you know, find compliant materials through that guide. And there's other resources that the county has developed, um, including um, costs, uh, considerations, um, you know, for going, switching to compostables, reusables. Um, so there's already a lot of great information on the county's webpage. And then there is um, the potential to provide, I think, some um, financial assistance. And I, I also mentioned Plastic Free Marin um, has some some money available to provide to help uh, businesses with with that um, transition. So it's kind of that full gamut that would be part of the technical assistance. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yeah. Um, so our ordinance has been in effect since way back in 2019. So this is new. Um, did we have, I don't remember, you know, that was a while ago and I know you weren't, were you here at the time? No, you were not here at the time, but um, there was a date, we extended the date for people to come into compliance with that, but that was a long time ago, correct? That was sometime in 2020? Yeah, I believe so, um, as far as the compliance date, and then of course, pandemic happened. Right, I the think pandemic it, yeah. happened, but but in fact, the compliance state was back in 2020. Yes, and, so that and it was, was never officially paused. It, right. Yeah. And you've done quite a bit of outreach yourself. Correct. Thank and my understanding that. is that there's a lot of outreach done for the original town's ordinance um, and putting that together. Right. Thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for getting that reciprocal indemnification that I asked for. That's great. Thank you. Uh, great work. And I think... 
um, it's nice to see that the county's jumping on our bandwagon. Any other questions, comments? Um, yeah, just a quick two questions. Well, a couple of questions. Um, when we're talking about biofiber, natural fiber, um, so when you're talking about cutlery, what are you talking about, like bamboo or wood and not any of that bioplastic that's supposedly compostable but isn't in our facilities, right? So it's going to be like wooden types of uh, utensils. Yes, that that's correct. Um, you know, there there you probably seen a lot of these bioplastic or compostable plastic materials, and some municipalities with with and their haulers are able to process those, but not here in Marin County, um, or at least not with Marin Sanitary and WM Earth Care, where all these the these organics are going to. They don't have the ability to process those uh, bi bioplastic materials. So. It, for com compostables, it would, like I said, it would have to be certified by BPI and pretty much you're talking about like sugar cane and bamboo and, and paper products um, that would be compliant. And the cups are not going to be those, those uh, you know, how people have like a proprietary cup, say for coffee sometimes, and then it's plastic lined, although the rest of it might be compostable. That how does yeah, that impact it? Those also aren't truly compostable. So anything right. with with any kind of plastic lining or PLA um, is isn't um, accepted by um, WM Earth Care. So it has to be truly compostable, hundred um, percent. These kind of organic materials. Right. And um, let's see why why exempt cafeterias. I was assuming. I think that. Uh, someone was working with school cafeterias here to get them to uh, look at more, you know, uh, earth friendly uh, ways of doing things. But why were cafeterias? I thought that was in our ordinance, but maybe not in. It, 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 is, it, it is in the town's um, current foodware ordinance um, and in the county uh, decided to to not include that as as part of the definition for food vendor based on how the the state these state waste regulations oh, okay. that they also have exempted public and private schools but i did do some research just to confirm that there isn't actually any private schools within the town and so there's it's, it's kind of a moot point because no schools would be subject to this ordinance okay and then the final question i have just as a matter of processing you know, somebody in the public raised the issue about the uh, introduce wave first reading and read by title only. Um, can somebody explain why that is, what that, what that means? Because I know somebody was upset yeah. about that. So I just want to I make sure that- Mr. Greenberg was actually, I was going to talk to him afterwards. Um, we're waiving the full reading of the ordinance. You're, you have to read every line of it into the record. So waive full reading and read by title only. That's it. There still gets- two readings and 30 days before it's effective. Any ordinance has to. So what wave, wave re first reading means wave the full first reading. And when it says read by title only, that means that you're taking care of that by reading by just the title. So you don't have to read how 20 some odd pages or however long the ordinance is. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Councilman? Um, well, yeah, since we all seem to be commenting, I'll just say that I am really proud of Fairfax and uh, proud of the county for doing this. And uh, it was an enormous amount of outreach that was done in Fairfax to get this going in the first place. And it looks like there was equally good outreach on the county's level at a higher scale. And the the results of both of those outreaches were that the vast majority of people really supported it. Um, it will get easier with time. There's a transition that you know is going to be work for for the vendors for the for the uh, uh, the restaurants and so forth. But uh, people get used to things. So, for example, the reusable bags, the shopping bags. Uh, that used to be just like a weird thing to, we did it, but we were weird to use a reusable bag. And it fairly quickly, somehow it just became a really common thing to where talking with most of the stores uh, here in Fairfax, they said that just everybody is doing it now. And then the pandemic came 
and we weren't allowed to do it. They wouldn't allow us to bring a bag into the store. Some of us cheated and did it anyway, but, you know, we weren't allowed to do that. And I was worried as to whether that was going to break that, that, you know, everybody having gotten used to it, but it seems to be coming back pretty well. So it's just an example of how these things, and, and really it's pretty confusing. It's annoyingly confusing. We get confused in our family, and I know a lot of other people are confused about these, the bioplastics Everything says it's recyclable. Everything says it's earth friendly. Everything says it's green and cool. <laughs> and half of them aren't. And so this is really annoying. You know, we're sitting there looking at something, trying to figure out whether it's got a coating on the inside so we can know whether to put it into the compost or whether we have to put it into the trash. And we just would re- prefer not to even have these things that that are the wrong kind. And I can't imagine how many people don't even bother to look at that. And uh, and it's one other point is that these green compostable plastics are actually marine sanitary thinks that they're the worst, really. They're worse than a plastic bag because when they go into the food waste bin, the green bin, and those things break down pretty quickly and fall, get into small pieces, but they're still not organic and they'll never break down into actual compost. So you can't get them out of there. They're really a problem. So just this will get rid of a lot of that stuff. And I think that's just absolutely outstanding. So if I may, I just want to mention one of the state regulations, AB 1201, is actually trying to require that products label compostable um, actually break down into organic compost. So, um, and, and um, it it basically wouldn't allow compostable plastics or PLA to be identified as compostable as it doesn't meet those requirements. So hopefully some of the state regulations will address the Mm -hmm. confusion around what's really compostable. Yeah. Yeah. We're making good progress. So it's, it's, kind of interesting that you've come on as our climate action coordinator and a lot of what you've ended up working on is AB 1383 and now this, but it's it's all related and good work. So Councilmember Ackerman, one one second. Uh, I Michelle? see that um, Dana Armanino from the county has her hand raised and I wondered if yeah. could I uh, please her? Please do. Yeah. And so appreciative that she's up with us at this time in the morning. Okay. Hello, council members. Yes, this is uh, the latest I've been up in a long time. So <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I, di- I did want to attend and say thank you all for leading the way and uh, basically doing our homework for us for our ordinance. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I did want to just, I know we're really late, but I wanted to clarify just a couple of things from the questions that came up. Uh, one, uh, on that bioplastics and the lining thing, it, it's not necessarily that WM Earth Care can't process them. It's that we're making a choice because we are so proud of our organic ranchers and vineyards and farms that we create organic soil. And so we want to really continue to close that loop. And those products cannot go into a uh, certified organic compost pile that then gets applied to our food pro- uh, products. So, um, you know, that's, that is the, the reason WM Earth Care doesn't use, uh, accept bioplastics and why we did that in our ordinance as well. Um, I also uh, have the same confusion with where things go. And I really hope that this ordinance helps dispel that. But the the big thing that we are focused on with our ordinance and with uh, environmental health services uh, participating in it is that it's going to be very education forward when the food inspectors are visiting these businesses twice a year during their normal inspections, they'll be able to provide the information, the education material, and really help them with that transition. So we're really focused not so much on the enforcement part of it, but on that education and really helping our businesses make that transition. Um, Regarding the schools, 
It, it is because the state has exempted them and we wanted to be uh, in alignment with them. But one thing to be aware of is we're still going to try and educate them as much so that they can voluntarily do it. And if they outsource any of their food facilities where food is brought in from a food facility operator, that operator would, you know, would fall under this ordinance. So there'll be some overlap, I think. Um, and then speaking of the cups, um, right now, uh, uh, Sean did mention that we do have an exempt product list. If a product is not, a compliant product is not available, um, that is uh, reviewed annually and updated if something does become available and come off that list, uh, we will give a lot of leeway and education time again to help businesses transition and fold that new product in. For right now, both hot and cold cups, because they have those liners, they are not accepted at WMR Care. So we have exempted them and we're really going to try and educate businesses that they can still use them, but they do need to go in the trash and hopefully there'll be good labeling so that people will know. And we will be really encouraging reusables and people bringing in their own cups so that, that again, reusable is best. So I think that covers all the kind of questions I heard come up. But again, thank you guys for all that you've done. Thank you, Dana, for being with us. Can I ask you two quick questions really quick too? I'm sure Sean could take them, but um, similar, since you touched on the exemptions for the cups, um, which was, we did have exemptions with that similar language. If there's not like a product in the marketplace that meets the need, you can exempt certain things. Um, the other things that have been carried over that are going to remain consistent from the 2019 ordinance, there's the 25 cent cup charge that's going to be in the countywide one as well. Mm -hmm. And then another question as far as ex exemptions, it's not something I've heard immediately in Fairfax, but something I hear around the county um, for um, dine-in service and reusables and the dishwashing or taking care of all of that. Um, if the square footage or if the facility is uh, unable to do that, or if there's some hardship, there are some hardship clauses or exemptions related to such things at this time. Is that right? There, there is that hardship clause. I, I don't want to put out there that, you know, we're going to just give all these blanket exemptions. It's really going to be a hardship exemption if the food facility that has dine in just physically does not have the space to add uh, dishwashing so that they're health, healthy and safety and in compliance with state law, then that might be something we would consider. Again, this isn't, uh, and then we also have grants that if they do have the space, we can, uh, you know, the grants can hopefully help them make that switch and add that equipment. Uh, so yeah, we're we're not out to punish businesses. We're we're out to try and help them, educate them, transition them, and work with them. Awesome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we should open it up for public comment on this item. Good evening, Todd Greenberg, one more time. Uh, thank you uh, for coming in from the county, Dana and Sean. Uh, but uh, I wanna say three words. Keep it local, Fairfax, Fairfax Town Council. How is it that when I've surveyed the local businesses, and that's five of them, the owners that I've spoken to, that they're not in favor of charging people 25 cents. So this presentation that Sean gave earlier doesn't seem accurate for Fairfax. Fairfax people are having a hard time getting by economically and you're doing other things to try to help them. Supposedly it's a big concern about rent. Our mayor here has complained about it being difficult to pay rent. I don't understand how you can support 25 cents more per cup of coffee. I don't understand, and other people in Fairfax don't understand how you can penalize people and create more big government and greater costs rather than incentivizing them. What Dana talked about is incentives to help businesses. This should be coming from a positive 
viewpoint, not from a cost increasing bureaucracy, big government increasing viewpoint. If there's incentives, I think every business in Fairfax would be for it, but making people pay what is 25 cents on a $2.50 cup, that's 10% more per cup of coffee. Now cups of coffee that are fancy coffee are $5 now or will be after this, according to one letter that I wrote and read in the outside packet there. Uh, one of the coffee shops here in town is very against this. I would ask you before you approve this to go back and look for a positive incentive-based way to achieve the same ends and to find out whether or not your local businesses really support it. I would ask you to go to the Chamber of Commerce. I would ask you to speak with Joanne Webster in San Rafael and with David Smadbeck here in Fairfax. And if you haven't done it, you haven't done your homework. I would ask you to find out from each vendor here, and it's easy, you could walk downtown, you could do it in a day. If it hasn't been done, this shouldn't be passed. And I'm speaking on behalf of businesses that want to do the right thing. This is just the wrong way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Sean, just to clarify, the 25 cent cup charge, that's not a charge that's incurred by businesses. That's a, a, a motivator so that people bring this when they want their cup of coffee or their cup of tea. And it's something that the businesses get to actually keep for each of those cups. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's really no different. Councilor Ackerman mentioned with the 10 cent or as at the grocery store, it's the same kind of incentive behavior, you know, change that's that's needed to incentivize people to bring a reusable, you know, bring a reusable cup rather than, and, it, and if you don't want to, then you, you pay the charge. It's like you pay uh, 10 cents, you know, for to, to get a bag at the grocery store if you don't want to bring a reusable bag. It's really yeah, not they, any different than that. And, and the business would keep that, um, the 25 cents in, in, um, incurred by that. Right. Customer. If if a coffee shop had, let's say, one fifth of their customers that uh, that wanted a one that didn't bring their own cup, then it would, since they're keeping the 25 cents from that, it's only going to increase the cup of the, the the cost of the cup of coffee would be less because they would make. 20 cents on every one of those people that that doesn't bring their cup in and that would subsidize the coffee for the people who did. So it actually ends up that as we get closer and closer to where everybody just learns to bring their own cups in and that becomes normal, which, you know, it can be, then that cost goes away. So it's something that be, that's why it's key that the, the restaurant gets to keep the 25 cents and it just eventually will fold into the cup of coffee and it would be the rare customer that pays the 25 cents. And that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm not inclined to, to back away from this at this point, especially given all the work that's been done on it. And the fact that the, the county's hope is that all the communities will, will adopt it. Um, and but anyway, we may not have finished public. Yeah. I was just going to say we'll, um, thanks for clarifying that and for, for adding a little bit of context as well, Councilmember Ackerman, and we'll we can continue with public comment. I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, yes, we do have some public comment on Zoom. The first speaker is Janess Reynolds, followed by Su Susan Hopp. Janess, you're unmuted now. Good morning, everybody. I'm really tired, so I hope I'm coherent. <laughs> but um, anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to Fairfax for all that you have done and are possibly, you know, moving forward with and really um, uh, just want to acknowledge all that you you have done and, and, and the community and, and some of the businesses in the community like Good Earth, you know, doing the reusable uh, pilot system that they've just, um, onboarded. So 
Anyway, thank you for that. But I and I just wanted to clear up one thing um, that Sean said. Plastic Free Marin is has grant money. The grant money is actually the county's grant money that uh, Dana was talking about. And Susan Hopp and I, the co-chair of Plastic Free Marin, are uh, helping with technical assistance to the county to distribute those grant funds and work with businesses to help them. Um, meet the requirements of the ordinance. So um, anyway, thanks everybody. And um, if there's any questions that we can help you with, we're we're here to help. Thank you very much, Janice. And the next speaker is Susan Hopp. You are unmuted now. Yes, um, good morning, council. And uh, I also wanted to echo Janice and just say thank you for uh, leading the way and being one of the early adopters of this reusable food ordinance. You know, I think the, you know, one of the key purposes here is just really raising the consciousness around, you know, somehow this concept we've gotten so used to, which is, you know, use once and quote, throw away, which is, you know, at best to landfill or showing up in our waterways and on our beaches as pollution. And um, it's not sustainable. We really need to break this cycle of the take, make, waste model. And the, the, this ordinance is just really um, a critical step in this shift to reusables and really to make this a standard across Marin County. And, you know, the good news is that this will drive innovation to healthier packaging, uh, to more convenient reuse systems. It gives the customer a better, healthier experience. And, and the really good news is that it is proven to save businesses money. So again, thank you so much um, onward and to a waste-free future. Thank you, Susan. We have one more speaker, and that is Joe McGarry. And Joe, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, good morning, Council. Thanks for being here, and um, thank you for this ordinance. And and I just want to say wholeheartedly that uh, um, myself and and speaking on behalf of Good Earth Natural Foods, we're um, a hundred percent behind this and supportive and really appreciative as, as we've been since the, the original ordinance in, in 2019. And I, I'd like to also call out the contributions of the, the previous two callers, um, Janice and Susan, and, and all that they've done um, to, to push this forward. Um, and I just want to call attention to like the, 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 the name of the ordinance and, and it being reusable and know that there's a lot um, of, of great work that's being done on improving within the ordinance of improving um, the options um, for single use that, that really we want to, this to just be a, a, a step towards the ultimate vision of, of reusable. And, and I can say at Good Earth, our, um, you know, our program of reusable takeout um, the glass jars, and it's it's doubled in, in the last year. Um, that it's something that customers are willing to do in all different ways, putting deposits down, um, the useful cup program. Um, so I, I really like to like put out the vision of the entire town um, having a shared container and a shared cup, and then maybe even suggest that that maybe the town needs to put a little skin in the game to uh, to help support with that, you know, washing and return infrastructure. And um, we at Good Earth would love to work um, with everyone to to reach that ultimate vision and and frankly do away with with the single use and 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 have everything be in reusable containers, whether you're dining in or taking out. But thanks for all the work, and and we're we're ready to work with you more. Thank you, Joe. Um, yes, Mayor, Susan Hopp has raised her hand again. Um, yeah, if she has a, 
Okay. She might have yeah. a correct. Oh, no, she's not. She's okay. gone. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, Oops. no more comments from Zoom? No more comments. Okay. We'll bring it back to council here. Um, are there any further like questions or anything like that? Um, no? Okay. Do we need three, three. motions? Three separate motions. Yep. Okay. And I, if you don't mind, I would really like to make the motions on these. And I also just, before we close on that, I want to um, first thank um, Janice, who, who just spoke. And uh, she actually drafted the original ordinance that um, a group of activists, uh, Plastic Free Marin folks, um, took to San Anselmo, which then was modified and taken to Fairfax, which which really kind of created this snowball effect in the county. Um, but also wanted to thank um, the co-founder of Plastic Free Marin, Barbara Bogard, who who started this this process off um, with me and some other folks back in 2017, uh, which is a long time ago it feels, but the pandemic kind of collapses time. Um, and I also wanted to thank Renee Goddard and Dana um, at the county. And Den uh, Supervisor Dennis Rodoni and his aide Rhonda for for their leadership at the county and bringing this this forward. Um, this morning, I was at the 75th anniversary party for Marine Sanitary Service, and uh, Joe Garbarino uh, made a big pitch at the end of his talk about how you know we really need to move to this future where everything is reusable and biodegradable, and we need to to do that as quickly as possible. And um, I think this this ordinance helps us along the way there uh, to realize that that vision where we don't have that take make waste um, philosophy that Susan Hop had mentioned. And um, thanks to her as well for leading up technical assistance on this. And we hope to see Janice and Susan in Fairfax with our food vendors. Um, so, with with all that said, if there's nothing more to be said here, I would love to. Um, Make, start making motions uh, and make a motion to introduce wave first reading and read by title only ordin ordinance uh, 2023 AA adding section 8.16.030 C regarding the prohibition on polystyrene, EPS, foam coolers, and ice chests to the town code, which is attachment one. How about we each second one of them? <laughs> I'll second that. Okay. And can we get a roll call vote on that? Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yes. Council Member Blash. Yes. Mayor Catrano. Yes. And Mayor Hellman is absent. That's four votes, one absent. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. And the second, uh, I'd like to make a motion to introduce waive first reading and read by title only ordinance 2023XX requiring all food facility vendors to use reusable foodware for dine-in operations and compliant compostable foodware for takeout services. Second. Okay, we have a motion a second. Roll call. Council member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yes. Council member Blash. Yes. Mayor Catrano. Yes. And council member Hellman is absent for eyes. One absent motion passes. Thank you. And last but not least, um, I would like to make a motion to authorize the town manager to execute the agreement between County of Marin and town of Fairfax regarding enforcement of the foodware ordinance. Can I just make a friendly amendment that we also include With that language, the yeah. language for the reciprocal county indemnification? Yes, I accept that friendly and amendment. And I would second that motion. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Kohler. Yes. Council Member Blash. Yes. Mayor Catrano. Yes. And Council Member Hellman is absent. Four ayes, one absent. Motion passes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all for that. And thank you, Sean, for hanging out with us this late and to Dana and all the folks that are online. And that brings us to um, council reports and comments. Anyone have anything? If not, I think there might be some closing remarks um, under the town manager's report real quick. 
Yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, um, I'll try to be brief, but um, just two items that are important. Um, a little housing element update. Um, we have, um, working with our new consultants, we have um, completed drafts of the housing needs, constraints, and fair housing sections of the housing element and um, the consultants and our staff has been working um, hard to um, really ground truth the sites that were identified as possible um, housing development. We met with HCD to discuss some of the um, potential challenges with um, our sites being in um, either high fire areas or um, liquefaction zones, which you know are throughout the town and particularly in the downtown um, areas and um, developed then some additional analysis and outreach that needed to be done in order to make those kind of pass through the um, HCD process process um, and and that's now looking much better. Um, we met with um, individual property owners and also did focus groups with property owners to learn more about what their um, interests and plans were so that we really went through and talked with those property owners and made sure those were possible. Um, so the next steps are uh, really to finalize the suitability analysis and the programs in the action plan to complete the draft of the housing element. And then we'll, we're anticipating that that draft will be delivered to staff in mid-March and then to the um, subcommittee um, before uh sorry, and to the subcommittee, and then um, public review draft is anticipated to be released um, by the end of March. And so then that would put us um, with a study session for the town council. Um, and then after that is complete, the housing element would then be um, you know, revised if there were any revisions to be made. And then that would go to Sacramento to the HCD for their 90 day review. And um, that would also then give us time to um, update the EIR analysis and um, really customize the odds, the objective design development, um, development standards um, that we had planned, but that's later in the process. So I just want to make sure you were kind of aware of that and we'll have more detailed um, description, even though that felt like a lot of detail at this hour, <laughs> um, uh, as we progress in the next couple of weeks. And then the second item is um, the um, the proposed workshop that um, we talked about for um, just cause eviction um, ordinance. Um, as I mentioned earlier tonight or yesterday, um, we, I am looking for a um, uh, neutral facilitator who can help us with that. And then we have drafted um, a survey that um, may be sent out with the March um, town newsletter. So that would be, you know, not a scientific survey, not a um, not a, a vote, but a way for us to get more information from um, uh, residents, anyone within um, Fairfax on what topics are most important to look at for potential amendments. Um, so we really wanna focus um, any meetings or workshops that we would have on really productive time. Um, and I guess I'll add one uh, third thing, which is that yesterday, the first was my um, anniversary, my Fairfax anniversary. So thank you for allowing me to serve. It's been a pleasure. And so when you talked about the workshop, it seems like March 25th is probably not going to be the date. We're probably going to have to move it up. Right. So we had targeted March 25th, but being as I'm still looking for a facilitator, it, it may slide, you know, a week okay. or two. Yeah. Thank you. And and to clarify on the survey front, this, so the, a survey would come out presumably in the next newsletter or something thereabouts that's really seeking to get feedback, community feedback or input on elements that will inform the 
community workshop, right? Like what what to focus on, what are the the touch points that should we should spend our time on for a community workshop. Exactly. So that it's really productive time and we know, you know, people are going to invest their their effort there and um, really work together. Great. Thank you for those. Can I just add one thing? I mean, it sounded like there was a little misconception. We plan this workshop to be a roll up your sleeves. It's not going to be any of us doing the talking heads about the survey would say certain areas people are interested in changing, certain areas they think are fine. And and so you highlighted the key areas of the just cause. And we did commit to a just cause workshop. It was not to include the rent stabilization. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much. And congratulations that you made it past your one-year anniversary right here with us. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And um, on that note, uh, we will adjourn. I... Oh, there's one more item. Oh, future agenda items. Okay. Good, good point. Anything? Okay. We have plenty of agenda items. Yeah. Um, okay. On that note, I'd like to adjourn. Uh, I don't have the name here, but I, I do know that um, Bob Pratzel, who's a sort of Marin County hero. He worked with my mentor and, and coworker, Huey Johnson, to save the Marin headlands. Uh, he was the attorney that fought that battle. He he just passed away. Um, and he actually joined our joined us here in this room for our Fairfax Open Space Committee screening of Rebels with a Cause, which he's in that movie. And he was on the panel here uh, several years ago, I guess, before the pandemic. But um, a huge, a huge loss and an environmental titan uh, on whose shoulders we stand. So thank you.